Chapter 41 of David Copperfield. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Graham Daly. David Copperfield by Charles Dickens. Chapter 41 Dora's Aunts. At last, an answer came from the two old ladies. They presented their compliments to Mr. Copperfield, and informed him that they had given his letter the best consideration, with a view to the happiness of both parties, which I thought rather an alarming expression, not only because of the use they had made of it in relation to the family difference before mentioned, but because I had, and have all my life, observed that conventional phrases are a sort of fireworks, easily let off, and liable to take a great variety of shapes and colors not at all suggested by their original form. The Mrs. Spenlow added that they begged to forbear expressing, through the medium of correspondence, an opinion on the subject of Mr. Copperfield's communication, but that if Mr. Copperfield would do them the favor to call, upon a certain day, accompanied if he thought proper by a confidential friend, they would be happy to hold some conversation on the subject. To this favor, Mr. Copperfield immediately replied, with his respectable compliments, that he would have the honor of waiting on the Mrs. Spenlow at the time appointed, accompanied in accordance with their kind permission by his friend, Mr. Thomas Traddles, of the Inner Temple. Having dispatched which missive, Mr. Copperfield fell into a condition of strong nervous agitation, and so remained until the day arrived. It was a great augmentation of my uneasiness to be bereaved at this eventful crisis of the inestimable services of Miss Mills. But Mr. Mills, who was always doing something or other to annoy me, or I felt as if he were, which was the same thing, had brought his conduct to a climax by taking it into his head that he would go to India. Why should he go to India except to harass me? To be sure, he had nothing to do with any other part of the world, and he had a good deal to do with that part, being entirely in the India trade whatever that was, I had floating dreams myself concerning golden shawls and elephant's teeth, having been at Calcutta in his youth, and designing now to go out there again in the capacity of resident partner. But this was nothing to me. However, it was so much to him that for India he was bound, and Julia with him, and Julia went into the country to take leave of her relations, and the house was put into a perfect suit of bills, announcing that it was to be let or sold, and that the furniture, mangle and all, was to be taken at evaluation. So, here was another earthquake of which I became the sport, before I had recovered from the shock of its predecessor. I was in several minds how to dress myself on the important day, being divided between my desire to appear to advantage, and my apprehensions of putting on anything that might impair my severely practical character in the eyes of the Mrs. Spenlow. I endeavored to hit a happy medium between these two extremes. My aunt improved the result, and Mr. Dick threw one of his shoes after Traddles and me, for luck, as we went downstairs. Excellent fellow, as I knew Traddles to be, and warmly attached to him as I was, I could not help wishing, on that delicate occasion, that he had never contracted the habit of brushing his hair so very upright. It gave him a surprised look, not to say hearth broomy kind of expression, which, my apprehensions whispered, might be fatal to us. I took the liberty of mentioning it to Traddles, as we were walking to Putney, and saying that if he would smooth it down a little, "'My dear Copperfield,' said Traddles, lifting off his hat, and rubbing his hair all kinds of ways, "'nothing would give me greater pleasure, but it won't.' "'Won't it be smoothed down?' said I. "'No,' said Traddles. "'Nothing will induce it. If I was to carry a half hundred weight upon it all the way to Putney, it would be up again the moment the weight was taken off. You have no idea what obstinate hair mine is, Copperfield. I am quite a fretful porcupine.' I was a little disappointed, I must confess, but thoroughly charmed by his good nature, too. I told him how I esteemed his good nature, and said that his hair must have taken all the obstinacy out of his character, for he had none. Oh, returned Traddles, laughing, I assure you, it's quite an old story, my unfortunate hair. My uncle's wife couldn't bear it. She said it exasperated her. It stood very much in my way, too, when I first fell in love with Sophie. Very much. Did she object to it? She didn't, rejoined Traddles. But her elder sister, the one that's the beauty, quite made game of it, I understand. In fact, all the sisters laugh at it. Agreeable, said I. Yes, returned Traddles with a perfect innocence. It's a joke for us. They pretend that Sophie has a lock of it in her desk, and is obliged to shut it in a class book to keep it down. 
we laugh about it. By the by, my dear Traddles, said I, your experience may suggest something to me. When you became engaged to the young lady whom you have just mentioned, did you make a regular proposal to her family? Was there anything like what we're going through today, for instance? I added nervously. Why, replied Traddles, on whose attentive face a thoughtful shade had stolen, it was a rather painful transaction, Copperfield, in my case. You see, Sophie being of so much use in the family, none of them could endure the thought of her ever being married. Indeed, they had quite settled among themselves that she never was to be married, and they called her the old maid. Accordingly, when I mentioned it with the greatest precaution to Mrs. Crewler, the mamma, said I, the mamma, said Traddles, Reverend Horace Crewler, when I mentioned it with every possible precaution to Mrs. Crewler, the effect upon her was such that she gave a scream and became insensible. I couldn't approach the subject again for months. You did it last, said I. Well, the Reverend Horace did, said Traddles. He is an excellent man, most exemplary in every way, and he pointed out to her that she ought, as a Christian, to reconcile herself to the sacrifice, especially as it was so uncertain, and to bear no uncharitable feeling toward me. As to myself, Copperfield, I give you my word, I felt a perfect bird of prey towards the family. The sisters took your part, I hope, Traddles. Well, I can't say they did, he returned. When we had comparatively reconciled Mrs. Crewley to it, we had to break it to Sarah. You recall my mentioning Sarah as the one that has something the matter with her spine? Perfectly. She clenched both her hands, said Traddles, looking at me in dismay. Shut her eyes, turned lead colour, became perfectly stiff, and took nothing for two days but toast and water, administered with a teaspoon. What a very unpleasant girl, Traddles, I remarked. Oh, I beg your pardon, Copperfield, said Traddles. She is a very charming girl, but she has a great deal of feeling. In fact, they all have. Sophie told me afterwards that the self-reproach she underwent while she was in attendance upon Sarah no words could describe. I knew it must have been severed by my own feelings, Copperfield, which were like a criminal's. After Sarah was restored, we still had to break it to the other eight, and it produced various effects upon them of a most pathetic nature. And the two little ones, whom Sophie educates, have only just left off detesting me. At any rate, they are all reconciled to it now, I hope, I said. Yes, I should say they were, on the whole, resigned to it, said Traddles doubtfully. The fact is, we avoid mentioning the subject, and my unsettled prospects and indifferent circumstances are a great consolation to them. There will be a deplorable scene whenever we are married. It will be much more like a funeral than a wedding, and they'll all hate me for taking her away. His honest face, as he looked at me with a serio-comic shake of his head, impresses me more in the remembrance than it did in reality, for I was, by this time, in a state of such excessive trepidation and wandering of mind as to be quite unable to fix my attention on anything. On our approaching the house where the Mrs. Spenlow lived, I was at such a discount in respect of my personal looks and presence of mind that Traddles proposed a gentle stimulant in the form of a glass of ale. This having been administered at a neighbouring public house, he conducted me, with tottering steps, to the Mrs. Spenlow's door. I had a vague sensation of being, as it were, on view when the maid opened it, and of wavering somehow across a hole with a weather glass in it into a quiet little drawing room on the ground floor commanding a neat garden also of sitting down here on a sofa and seeing traddle's hair start up now his hat was removed like one of those obtrusive little figures made of springs that fly out of fictitious snuff-boxes when the lid is taken off also of hearing an old-fashioned clock ticking away on the chimney-piece and trying to make it keep time to the jerking of my heart which it wouldn't also of looking round the room for any sign of Dora, and seeing none. Also of thinking that Jip once barked in the distance, and was instantly choked by somebody. Ultimately, I found myself backing Traddles into the fireplace, and bowing in great confusion to two dry little elderly ladies, dressed in black, and each looking wonderfully like a preparation in chip or tan of the late Mr. Spendo. Pray, said one of the two little ladies, be seated. When I had done tumbling over Traddles, and had sat upon something which was not a cat, my first seat was, I so far recovered my sight as to perceive that Mr. Spenlow had evidently been the youngest of the family, that there was a disparity of six or eight years between the two sisters, and that the younger appeared to be the manager of the conference, inasmuch as she had my letter in the hand, so familiar as it looked to me, and yet so odd, and was referring to it through an eyeglass. They were dressed alike, but this sister wore her dress with a more youthful air than the other, and perhaps 
had a trifle more frill, or tucker, or brooch, or bracelet, or some little thing of that kind, which made her look more lively. They were both upright in their carriage, formal, precise, composed, and quiet. The sister, who had not my letter, had rugs crossed upon her breast, and resting on each other, like an idol. "'Mr. Copperfield, I believe,' said the sister, who had got my letter, addressing herself to Traddles. This was a frightful beginning. Traddles had to indicate that I was Mr. Copperfield, and I had to lay claim to myself, and they had to divest themselves of a preconceived opinion that Traddles was Mr. Copperfield, and altogether we were in a nice condition. To improve it, we all distinctly heard Jip give two short barks, and receive another choke. "'Mr. Copperfield,' said the sister with the letter. I did something, bowed, I suppose, and was all attention when the other st sister struck in. "'My sister Lavinia,' she said, "'being conversant with matters of this nature, will state what we consider most calculated to promote the happiness of both parties.' I discovered afterwards that Miss Lavinia was an authority in affairs of the heart, by reason of there having anciently existed a certain Mr. Pidgeot, who played short whist, and was supposed to have been enamoured of her. My private opinion is that this was entirely a gratuitous assumption, and that Pidger was altogether innocent of any such sentiments, to which he had never given any sort of expression that I could ever hear of. Both Miss Lavinia and Miss Clarissa had a superstition, however, that he would have declared his passion, if he had not been cut short in his youth, at about sixty, by over-drinking his constitution and overdoing an attempt to set it right again by swilling bath-water. They had a lurking suspicion, even, that he died of secret love, though I must say there was a picture of him in the house with a damask nose, which concealment did not appear to have ever preyed upon. "'We will not,' said Miss Lavinia, "'enter on the past history of this matter. Our poor brother Francis's death has cancelled that.' "'We had not,' said Miss Clarissa, "'been in the habit of frequent association with our brother Francis.' but there was no decided division or disunion between us. Francis took his road, we took ours. We considered it conducive to the happiness of all parties that it should be so, and it was so. Each of the sisters had leaned a little forward to speak, shook her head after speaking, and become upright again when silent. Miss Clarissa never moved her arms. She sometimes played tunes upon them with her fingers, minuets and marches, I should think, but never moved them. "'Our niece's position, or supposed position, is much changed by our brother Francis's death,' said Miss Lavinia, "'and therefore we consider our brother's opinions as regarded his position as being changed too. "'We have no reason to doubt, Mr. Copperfield, that you are a young gentleman possessed of good qualities and honourable character, "'or that you have an affection, or are fully persuaded that you have an affection, for our niece.' "'I replied, as I usually did whenever I had a chance, that nobody had ever loved anybody else as I loved Dora. Traddles came to my assistance with a confirmatory murmur. Miss Lavinia was going to make some rejoinder, when Miss Clarissa, who appeared to be incessantly beset by a desire to refer to her brother Francis, struck in again. "'If Dora's mamma, she said, when she married our brother Francis, had at once said that there was not room for the family at the dinner-table, it would have been better for the happiness of all parties.' "'Sister Clarissa,' said Miss Lavinia, "'perhaps we needn't mind that now.' "'Sister Lavinia,' said Miss Clarissa, "'it belongs to the subject. "'With your branch of the subject, "'on which alone you are competent to speak, "'I should not think of interfering. "'On this branch of the subject I have a voice and an opinion. "'It would have been better for the happiness of all parties "'if Dora's mamma, when she married our brother Francis, "'had mentioned plainly what her intentions were.' We should then have known what we had to expect. We should have said, Pray do not invite us at any time, and all possibility of misunderstanding would have been avoided. When Miss Clarissa had shaken her head, Miss Lavinia resumed, again referring to my letter through her eyeglass. They both had little bright round twinkling eyes, by the way, which were like birds' eyes. They were not unlike birds altogether, having a sharp, brisk, sudden manner, and a little short, spruce way of adjusting themselves like canaries. Miss Lavinia, as I have said, resumed. You ask permission of my sister Clarissa, and of myself, Mr. Copperfield, to visit here, as the accepted suitor of our niece. If our brother Francis, said Miss Clarissa, breaking out again, if I may call anything so calm a breaking out, 
wished to surround himself with an atmosphere of Doctor's Commons, and of Doctor's Commons only, what right or desire had we to object? None, I am sure. But why not say so? Let our brother Francis and his wife have their society. Let my sister Lavinia and myself have our society. We can find it for ourselves, I hope. As this appeared to be addressed to Traddles and me, both Traddles and I made some sort of reply. Traddles was inaudible. I think I observed myself that it was highly creditable to all concerned. I don't in the least know what I meant. Sister Lavinia, said Miss Clarissa, having now relieved her mind, you can go on, my dear. Miss Lavinia proceeded. Mr. Copperfield, my sister Clarissa and I have been very careful indeed in considering this letter, and we have not considered it without finally showing it to our niece and discussing it with our niece. We have no doubt that you think you like her very much. Think, ma'am, I rapturously began, oh, but Miss Clarissa giving me a look, just like a sharp canary, as requesting that I would not interrupt the oracle, I begged pardon. Affection, said Miss Lavinia, glancing at her sister for corroboration, which she gave in the form of little nod to every cause. Mature affection, homage, devotion, does not easily express itself. Its voice is low. It is modest and retiring. It lies in ambush, waits and waits. Such is the mature fruit. Sometimes a life glides away and finds it still ripening in the shade. Of course, I did not understand then that this was an allusion to her supposed experience of the stricken pigeon. But I saw, from the gravity with which Miss Clarissa nodded her head, that great weight was attached to these words. Light, for I call them, in comparison with such sentiments, the light inclinations of very young people, pursued Miss Lavinia, are dust compared to rocks. It is owing to the difficulty of knowing whether they are likely to endure, or have any real foundation, that my sister Clarissa and myself have been very undecided how to act, Mr. Copperfield and Mr. Traddles, said my friend, finding himself looked at. I beg pardon. Of the inner temple, I believe, said Miss Clarissa, again glancing at my letter. Traddles said, Exactly so, and became pretty red in the face. Now, Although I had not received any express encouragement as yet, I fancied that I saw in the two little sisters, and particularly in Miss Lavinia, an intensified enjoyment of this new and fruitful subject of domestic interest, a settling down to make the most of it, a disposition to pet it, in which there was a good bright ray of hope. I thought, I perceived that Miss Lavinia would have uncommon satisfaction in superintending two young lovers, like Dora and me, and that Miss Clarissa would have hardly less satisfaction in seeing her superintend us, and in chiming in with her own particular department of the subject whenever that impulse was strong upon her. This gave me courage to protest most vehemently that I loved Dora better than I could tell, or anyone believe, that all of my friends knew how I loved her, that my aunt Agnes, Traddles, every one who knew me, knew how I loved her, and how earnest my love had made me. For the truth of this I appealed to Traddles and Traddles, firing up as if he were plunging into a parliamentary debate, really did come out nobly, confirming me in a good round terms, and in a plain, sensible, practical manner, that evidently made a favourable impression. I speak, if I may presume to say so, as one who has some little experience of such things, said Traddles, being myself engaged to a young lady, one of ten, down in Devonshire, and seeing no probability, at present, of our engagement coming to a termination. "'You may be able to confirm what I have said, Mr. Traddles,' observed Miss Lavinia, evidently taking a new interest of him, "'of the affection that is modest and retiring, that waits and waits.' "'Entirely, ma'am,' said Traddles. Miss Clarissa looked at Miss Lavinia, and shook her head gravely. Miss Lavinia looked consciously at Miss Clarissa, and heaved a little sigh. "'Sister Lavinia,' said Miss Clarissa, "'take my smelling bottle.' Miss Lavinia revived herself with a few whiffs of aromatic vinegar, Traddles and I looking on with great solicitude the while, and then went on to say, rather faintly, "'My sister and myself have been in great doubt, Mr. Traddles, what course we ought to take in reference to the likings, or imaginary likings, of such very young people as your friend Mr. Copperfield and her niece.' "'Our brother Francis's child,' remarked Miss Clarissa, "'if our brother Francis's wife had found it convenient in her lifetime, though she had an unquestionable right to act as she thought best, to invite the family to a dinner-table, we might have known our brother Francis's child better at the present moment, Sister Venia, proceed. 
Miss Lavinia turned to my letter, so as to bring the superscription towards herself, and referred, through her eyeglass, to some orderly-looking notes she had made in that part of it. "'It seems to us,' said she, "'prudent, Mr. Traddles, to bring these feelings to the test of our own observation. At present we know nothing of them, and are not in a situation to judge how much reality there may be in them. Therefore we are inclined, so far, to accede to Mr. Copperfield's proposal as to admit his visit here. "'I shall never, dear ladies,' I exclaimed, relieved of an immense load of apprehension, "'forget your kindness. But,' pursued Miss Lavinia, "'but we would prefer to regard those visits, Mr. Traddles, as made at present to us. We must guard ourselves from recognizing any positive engagement between Mr. Copperfield and our niece until we have had an opportunity—' "'Until you have had an opportunity, Sister Lavinia,' said Miss Clarissa. "'Be it so,' assented Miss Lavinia with a sigh, "'until I have had an opportunity of observing him.' "'Copperfield,' said Traddles, turning to me, "'you feel, I am sure, that nothing could be more reasonable or considerate.' "'Nothing!' cried I. "'I am deeply sensible of it.' "'In this position of affairs,' said Miss Lavinia, again referring to her notes, "'and admitting his visits on this understanding only, "'we must require from Mr. Copperfield a distinct assurance on his word of honour "'that no communication of any kind shall take place between him and our niece without our knowledge, "'that no project whatever shall be entertained with regard to our niece "'without being first submitted to us to you, Sister Lavinia.' Miss Clarissa interposed. "'Be it so, Clarissa,' assented Miss Lavinia resignedly, "'to me, and receiving our concurrence. "'We must make this a most express and serious stipulation, "'not to be broken on any account. "'We wished Mr. Copperfield to be accompanied by some confidential friend today, "'with an inclination of her heads toward Traddles, who bowed, "'in order that there might be no doubt or misconception on this subject.' If Mr. Copperfield, or if you, Mr. Traddles, feel the least scruple in giving this promise, I beg you to take time to consider it. I exclaimed, in a state of high ecstatic fervour, that not a moment's consideration could be necessary. I bound myself by the required promise, in a most impassioned manner, called upon Traddles to witness it, and announced myself as the most atrocious of characters, if I ever swerved from it in the least degree. "'Stay,' said Miss Lavinia, holding up her hand. We resolved, before we had the pleasure of receiving you two gentlemen, to leave you alone for a quarter of an hour to consider this point. You will allow us to retire. It was in vain for me to say no consideration was necessary. They persisted in withdrawing for the specified time. Accordingly, these little birds hopped out with great dignity, leaving me to receive the congratulations of Traddles, and to feel as if I were translated to regions of exquisite happiness. Exactly at the expiration of the quarter of an hour, they reappeared with no less dignity than they had disappeared. They had gone rustling away as if their little dresses were made of autumn leaves, and they came rustling back in like manner. I then bound myself once more to the prescribed conditions. Sister Clarissa, said Miss Lavinia, the rest is with you. Miss Clarissa, unfolding her arms for the first time, took the notes and glanced at them. We shall be happy, said Miss Clarissa, to see Mr. Copperfield to dinner every Sunday, if it should suit his convenience. Our hour is three. I bowed. In the course of the week, said Miss Clarissa, we shall be happy to see Mr. Copperfield to tea. Our hour is half past six. I bowed again. Twice in the week, said Miss Clarissa, but as a rule, not oftener. I bowed again. Miss Trotwood, said Miss Clarissa, mentioned in Mr. Copperfield's letter, will perhaps call upon us. When visiting is better for the happiness of all parties, we are glad to receive visits and return them. When it is better for the happiness of all parties that no visiting should take place, as is the case of our brother Francis and his establishment, that is quite different. I intimated that my aunt would be proud and delighted to make their acquaintance, though I must say I was not quite sure of their getting on very satisfactorily together. The conditions being now closed, I expressed my acknowledgments in the warmest manner, and, taking the hand, first of Miss Clarissa, then of Miss Lavinia, pressed it, in each case, to my lips. Miss Lavinia then arose, and, begging Mr. Traddles to excuse us for a moment, requested me to follow her. I obeyed, all in tremble, and was conducted to another room. There, 
I found my blessed darling stopping her ears behind the door, with her dear little face against the wall, and Jip in the plate warmer with his head tied up in the towel. Oh, how beautiful she was in her black frock, and how she sobbed and cried at first, and wouldn't come out from behind the door. How fond we were of one another, when she did come out at last, and what a state of bliss I was in, when we took Jip out of the plate warmer, and restored him to the light, sneezing very much, and were all three reunited. My dearest Dora, now indeed, my own forever! Oh, don't, pleaded Dora. Please! Are you not my own forever, Dora? Oh, yes, of course I am, cried Dora. But I am so frightened. Frightened, my own? Oh, yes, I don't like him, said Dora. Why don't he go? Who, my life? Your friend, said Dora. It isn't any business of his. What a stupid he must be. My love! There was, never was anything so coaxing as her childish ways. He is the best creature. Oh, but we don't want any best creatures, pouted Dora. My dear, I argued, you will soon know him well, and like him of all things. And here's my aunt coming soon, and you'll like her of all things, too, when you know her. No, please don't bring her, said Dora, giving me a horrified little kiss and folding her hands. Don't. I know she's a naughty, mischief-making old thing. Don't let her come here, Dodie which was a corruption of David. Remonstrance was of no use, then, so I laughed, and admired, and was very much in love, and very happy, and she showed me Jip's new trick of standing on his hind legs in a corner, which he did for about the space of a flash of lightning, and then fell down, and I don't know how long I should have stayed there, oblivious of Traddles, if Miss Lavinia had not come in to take me away. Miss Lavinia was very fond of Dora. She told me Dora was exactly like what she had been herself at her age. She must have altered a good deal. And she treated Dora just as if she had been a toy. I wanted to persuade Dora to come and see Traddles, but on my proposing it she ran off to her room, and locked herself in, so I went to Traddles without her, and walked away with him on air. "'Nothing could be more satisfactory,' said Traddles. "'And they are very agreeable old ladies, I am sure. I shouldn't be at all surprised if you were to be married years before me, Copperfield.' "'Does your Sophie play any instrument, Traddles?' I inquired in the pride of my heart. She knows enough of the piano to teach it to her little sisters, said Traddles. Does she sing at all? I asked. Why, she sings ballads, sometimes, to freshen up the others a little when they're out of spirits, said Traddles. Nothing scientific. She doesn't sing to the guitar, said I. Oh, dear, no, said Traddles. Paint at all? Not at all, said Traddles. I promised Traddles that he should hear Dora sing and see some of her flower painting. He said he should like it very much, and we went home arm in arm in a great humour and delight. I encouraged him to talk about Sophie on the way, which he did with a loving reliance on her that I very much admired. I compared her, in my mind, with Dora, with considerable inward satisfaction, but I candidly admitted to myself that she seemed to be an excellent kind of girl for Traddles, too. Of course, my aunt was immediately made acquainted with the successful issue of the conference, and with all that had been said and done in the course of it. She was happy to see me so happy, and promised to call on Dora's aunt without loss of time. But she took such a long walk up and down our rooms that night, while I was writing to Agnes, that I began to think she meant what to walk till morning. My letter to Agnes was a fervent and grateful one, narrating all the good effects that had returned from my following her advice. She wrote, by return of post, to me. Her letter was hopeful, earnest, and cheerful. She was always cheerful from that time. I had my hands more full than ever. My daily journeys to Highgate considered, Putney was a long way off, and I naturally wanted to go there as often as I could. The proposed tea-drinkings being quite impractical, I compounded with Miss Lavinia for permission to visit every Saturday afternoon without detriment to my privileged Sundays. So the close of every week was a delicious time for me, and I got through the rest of the week by looking forward to it. I was wonderfully relieved to find that my aunt and Dora's aunts rubbed on, all things considered, much more smoothly than I could have expected. My aunt made her promised visit within a few days of the conference, and within a few more days, Dora's aunts called upon her in due state and form. Similar but more friendly exchanges took place afterwards, usually at intervals of three or four weeks. I know that my aunt distressed Dora's aunts very much by utterly setting at naught the dig dignity of fly conveyance, and walking out to Putney at extraordinary times, as shortly after breakfast or just before tea. Likewise, by wearing her bonnet in any manner that happened to be comfortable to her head, without at all deferring to the prejudices of civilization on that subject. 
but Dora's aunt soon agreed to regard my aunt as an eccentric and somewhat masculine lady, with a strong understanding, and although my aunt occasionally ruffled the feathers of Dora's aunt by expressing heretical opinions on various points of ceremony, she loved me too well not to sacrifice some of her little peculiarities to the general harmony. The only member of our small society who positively refused to adapt himself to circumstances was Jip. He never saw my aunt without immediately displaying every tooth in his head, retiring under a chair, and growling incessantly, with now and then a doleful howl, as if she really were too much for his feelings. All kinds of treatment were tried with him, coaxing, scolding, slapping, bringing him to Buckingham Street, where he instantly dashed at two cats, to the terror of all beholders. But he never could prevail upon himself to bear my aunt's society. He would sometimes think he had got the better of his objection, and be amiable for a few minutes, then would put up his snub nose, and howl to that extent that there was nothing for it but to blind him and put him in the plate warmer. At length, Dora regularly muffled him in his towel, and shut him up there whenever my aunt was reported at the door. One thing troubled me much, after we had fallen into this quiet train. It was that Dora seemed, by one consent, to be regarded like a pretty toy or plaything. My aunt, with whom she gradually became familiar, always called her Little Blossom, and the pleasure of Miss Lavinia's life was to wait upon her, curl her hair, make ornaments for her, and treat her like a pet child. What Miss Lavinia did, her sister did, as a matter of course. It was very odd to me, but they all seemed to treat Dora, in her degree, much as Dora treated Jip in his. I made up my mind to speak to Dora about this, and one day, when we were out walking, for we were licensed by Miss Lavinia, after a while, to go out walking by ourselves, I said to her that I wished she could get them to behave towards her differently. "'Because, you know, my darling,' I remonstrated, "'you're not a child.' "'There,' said Dora, "'now you're going to be cross.' "'Cross, my love.' "'I'm sure they're very kind to me,' said Dora, "'and I am very happy.' "'Well, but, dearest life,' said I, "'you might be very happy, and yet be treated rationally.' Dora gave me a reproachful look, the prettiest look, and then began to sob, saying if I didn't like her, why had I ever wanted so much to be engaged to her, and why didn't I go away now if I couldn't bear her? What could I do but kiss away her tears, and tell her how I doted upon her after that? I am sure I am very affectionate, said Dora. You oughtn't to be cruel to me, Jody. Cruel, my precious love, as if I would or could be cruel to you for the world! Then don't find fault with me, said Dora, making a rosebud of her mouth, and I'll be good. I was charmed by her presently asking me, of her own accord, to give her that cookery book I had once spoken of, and to show her how to keep accounts as I had once promised I would. I brought the volume with me on my next visit. I got it prettily bound first, to make it look less dry and more inviting. And as we strolled about the common, I showed her an old housekeeping book of my aunt's, and gave her a set of tablets, and a pretty little pencil case and box of leads to practice housekeeping with. But the cookery book made Dora's head ache and the figures made her cry. They wouldn't end up, she said. So she rubbed them out, and drew little nosegays and likenesses of me and Jip all over the tablets. And I playfully tried verbal instruction in domestic matters, as we walked about on a Saturday afternoon. Sometimes, for example, when we passed a butcher's shop, I would say, Now suppose, my pet, that we were married, and you were going to buy a shoulder of mutton for dinner. Would you know how to buy it? My pretty little Dora's face would fall, and she would make her mouth into a bud again, as if she would very much prefer to shut mine with a kiss. "'Would you know how to buy it, my darling?' I would repeat, perhaps, if I were very inflexible. Dora would think a little, and then reply, perhaps with great triumph, "'Why, the butcher would know how to sell it, and what need I know? Oh, you silly boy!' So, when I once asked Dora, with an eye to the cookery book, what she should do if we were married, and I were to say I should like a nice Irish stew, she replied that she would tell the servant to make it and then clapped her hands together across my arm, and left in such a charming manner that she was more delightful than ever. Consequently, the principal use to which the cookery book was devoted was being put down in the corridor for Jip to stand upon. But Dora was so pleased when she had trained him to stand upon it without offering to come off, and at the same time hold the pencil case in his mouth, that I was very glad I had bought it. And we fell back on the guitar case, and the flower painting, and the songs about never leaving off dancing. ta -ra la and were as happy as the week was long. I occasionally wished I could venture a hint to Miss Lavinia that she treated the darling of my heart a little too much like a plaything, and sometimes awoke, as it were, wondering to find that I had fallen into the general fault and treated her like a plaything too, but not often.
End of chapter 41. Recording by Graham Daly. Chapter 42 of David Copperfield by Charles Dickens. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Father Ziley of Detroit, Michigan. David Copperfield by Charles Dickens Chapter 42 Mischief I feel as if it were not for me to record, even though this manuscript is intended for no eyes but mine, how hard I worked at that tremendous shorthand, and all improvement appertaining to it, in my sense of responsibility to Dora and her aunts. I will only add to what I have already written of my perseverance at this time of my life, and of a patient and continuous energy, which then began to be matured within me, and which I know to be the stronger part of my character, if it have any strength at all, that there, on looking back, I find the source of my success. I have been very fortunate in worldly matters. Many men have worked much harder, and not succeeded half so well. But I could never have done what I have done without the habits of punctuality, order, and diligence, without the determination to concentrate myself on one object at a time, no matter how quickly its successor should come upon its heels, which I then formed. Heaven knows I write this, in no spirit of self-laudation. The man who reviews his own life as I do mine, in going on here from page to page, had need to have been a good man indeed, if he would be spared the sharp consciousness of many talents neglected, many opportunities wasted, many erratic and perverted feelings constantly at war within his breast, and defeating him. I do not hold one natural gift, I dare say, that I have not abused. My meaning simply is, that whatever I have tried to do in life, I have tried with all my heart to do well, that whatever I have devoted myself to, I have devoted myself to completely, that in great aims and in small, I have always been thoroughly in earnest. I have never believed it possible that any natural or improved ability can claim immunity from the companionship of the steady, plain, hard-working qualities, and hope to gain its end. There is no such thing as self-fulfillment on this earth. Some happy talent and some fortunate opportunity may form the two sides of the ladder on which some men mount, but the rounds of that ladder must be made of stuff to stand, wear, and tear, and there is no substitute for thorough-going, ardent, and sincere earnestness. Never to put one hand to anything on which I could throw my whole self, and never to affect depreciation of my work, whatever it was, I find now to have been my golden rules. How much of the practice I have just reduced to precept I owe to Agnes, I will not repeat here. My narrative proceeds to Agnes, with a thankful love. She came on a visit of a fortnight to the doctor's. Mr. Wickfield was the doctor's old friend, and the doctor wished to talk with him and do him good. It had been matter of conversation with Agnes when she was last in town, and this visit was the result. She and her father came together. I was not much surprised to hear from her that she had engaged to find a lodging in the neighborhood for Mrs. Heap, whose rheumatic complaint required change of air, 
and who would be charmed to have it in such company. Neither was I surprised when, on the very next day, Uriah, like a dutiful son, brought his worthy mother to take possession. "'You see, Master Copperfield,' said he, as he forced himself upon my company for a turn in the doctor's garden, "'where a person loves, a person is a little jealous, leastways anxious to keep an eye on the beloved one.' "'Of whom are you jealous now?' said I. "'Thanks to you, Master Copperfield,' he returned, "'of no one in particular just at present, no male person at least.' "'Do you mean that you are jealous of a female person?' He gave me a sidelong glance out of his sinister red eyes and laughed. "'Really, Mr. Copperfield,' he said, "'I should say, Mr., but I know you'll excuse the a bit I've got into. You're so insinuating that you draw me like a corkscrew. Well, I don't mind telling you,' putting his fish-like hand on mine, "'I'm not a ladies' man in general, sir.' and I never was with Mrs. Strong. His eyes looked green now, as they watched mine with a rascally cunning. "'What do you mean?' said I. "'Why, though I am a lawyer, Master Copperfield,' he replied with a dry grin, "'I mean just at present what I say.' "'And what do you mean by your look?' I retorted quietly. "'By my look? Dear me, Copperfield, that's sharp practice!' "'What do I mean by my look?' "'Yes,' said I, "'by your look.' He seemed very much amused, and laughed as heartily as it was in his nature to laugh. After some scrapings of his chin with his hand, he went on to say, with his eyes cast downward, still scraping very slowly, "'When I was but an humble clerk, she always looked down upon me. She was for ever having my Agnes backwards and forwards at her house, and she was for ever being a friend to you, Master Copperfield, but I was too far beneath her myself to be noticed. Well, said I, suppose you were. And beneath him too, pursued Uriah, very distinctly, and in a meditative tone of voice, as he continued to scrape his chin. "'Don't you know the doctor better,' said I, "'than to suppose him conscious of your existence "'when you were not before him?' "'He directed his eyes at me in that sidelong glance again, "'and he made his face very lantern-jawed "'for the greater convenience of scraping as he answered, "'Oh, dear, I am not referring to the doctor. "'Oh, no, poor man. "'I mean Mr. Malden.' "'My heart quite died within me. All my old doubts and apprehensions on that subject, all the doctor's happiness and peace, all the mingled possibilities of innocence and compromise that I could not unravel, I saw in a moment at the mercy of this fellow's twisting. "'He never could come into the office without ordering and shoving me about,' said Uriah. "'One of your fine gentlemen he was. I was very meek and humble, and I am.' "'But I didn't like that sort of thing, and I don't.' He left off scraping his chin and sucked in his cheeks until they seemed to meet inside, keeping his sidelong glance upon me all the while. "'She is one of your lovely women, she is,' he pursued, when he had slowly restored his face to its natural form. "'And ready to be no friend to such as me, I know.' She's just the person as would put my Agnes up to higher sort of game. Now, I ain't one of your ladies' men, Master Copperfield, but I've had eyes in my ed a pretty long time back. We humble ones have got eyes, mostly speaking, and we look out of em. I endeavored to appear unconscious and not disquieted, but I saw in his face with poor success. "'Now I'm not a-goin' to let myself be run down, Copperfield,' he continued, raising that part of his countenance where his red eyebrows would have been, if he had had any, with malignant triumph. "'And I shall do what I can to put a stop to this friendship. I don't approve of it. I don't mind acknowledging to you that I've got rather a grudging disposition and want to keep off all intruders.' 
I ain't a goin', if I know it, to run the risk of being plotted against. You are always plotting and delude yourself into the belief that everybody else is doing the like, I think, said I. Perhaps so, Master Copperfield, he replied. But I've got a motive, as my fellow partner used to say, and I go at it tooth and nail. I mustn't be put upon as a humble person too much. I can't allow people in my way. Really, they must come out of the cart, Master Copperfield. I don't understand you, I said. Don't you, though, he returned with one of his jerks. I'm astonished at that, Master Copperfield, you being usually so quick. I'll try to be plainer another time. Is that Mr. Malden, a Norseback, ringing at the gate, sir? It looks like him, I replied as carelessly as I could. Uriah stopped short put his hands between his great knobs of knees, and doubled himself up with laughter, with perfectly silent laughter. Not a sound escaped from him. I was so repelled by his odious behavior, particularly by this concluding instance, that I turned away without any ceremony, and I left him doubled up in the middle of the garden, like a scarecrow in want of support. It was not on that evening, but, as I well remember, on the next evening but one, which was a Sunday, that I took Agnes to see Dora. I had arranged the visit beforehand with Miss Lavinia, and Agnes was expected to tea. I was in a flutter of pride and anxiety, pride in my dear little betrothed, and anxiety that Agnes should like her, all the way to Putney, Agnes being inside the stagecoach, and I outside, I pictured Dora to myself in every one of the pretty looks I knew so well, now making up my mind that I should like her to look exactly as she looked at such a time, and then doubting whether I should not prefer her looking as she looked at such another time, and almost worrying myself into a fever about it. I was troubled by no doubt of her being very pretty, in any case but it fell out that I had never seen her look so well. She was not in the drawing-room when I presented Agnes to her little aunts, but she was shyly keeping out of the way. I knew where to look for her now, and sure enough I found her stopping her ears again behind the same dull old door. At first she wouldn't come at all, and then she pleaded for five minutes by my watch, when at length she put her arm through mine to be taken to the drawing-room, her charming little face was flushed, and had never been so pretty. But when we went into the room and it turned pale, she was ten thousand times prettier yet. Dora was afraid of Agnes. She had told me that she knew Agnes was too clever. But when she saw her looking at once so cheerful and so earnest, and so thoughtful and so good, she gave a faint little cry of pleased surprise, and just put her affectionate arms around Agnes' neck, and laid her innocent cheek against her face. I was never so happy. I never was so pleased as when I saw those two sit down together side by side, as when I saw my little darling looking up so naturally to those cordial eyes as when I saw the tender, beautiful regard which Agnes cast upon her. Miss Lavinia and Miss Clarissa partook in their way of my joy. It was the pleasantest tea-table in the world. Miss Clarissa presided. I cut and handed the sweet seed-cake. The little sisters had a bird-like fondness for picking up seeds and pecking at sugar. Miss Lavinia looked on with benignant patronage, as if our happy love were all her work, and we were perfectly contented with ourselves and one another. The gentle cheerfulness of Agnes went to all their hearts, her quiet interest in everything that interested Dora, her manner of making acquaintance with Jip, who responded instantly, her pleasant way when Dora was ashamed to come over to her usual seat by me, her modest grace and ease, eliciting a crowd of blushing little marks of confidence from Dora, seemed to make our circle quite complete. "'I am so glad,' said Dora, after tea, "'that you like me. I didn't think you would, 
and I want more than ever to be liked now Miss Julia Mills is gone. I have omitted to mention it, by the by. Miss Mills had sailed, and Dora and I had gone aboard a great East Indiaman at Gravesend to see her and we had preserved ginger and guava and other delicacies of that sort for lunch. And we had left Miss Mills weeping on a camp-stool on the quarter-deck, with a large new diary under her arm, in which the original reflections awakened by the contemplation of ocean were to be recorded under lock and key. Agnes said she was afraid I must have given her an unpromising character, but Dora corrected that directly. Oh, no, she said, shaking her curls at me. It was all praise. He thinks so much of your opinion that I was quite afraid of it. My good opinion cannot strengthen his attachment to some people whom he knows, said Agnes with a smile. It is not worth their having. But please let me have it, said Dora in her coaxing way, if you can. We made merry about Dora's wanting to be liked, and Dora said I was a goose, and she didn't like me at any rate, and the short evening flew away on gossamer wings. The time was at hand when the coach was to call for us. I was standing alone before the fire when Dora came stealing softly in to give me that usual precious little kiss before I went. "'Don't you think if I had had her for a friend a long time ago, Dodie?' said Dora, her bright eyes shining very brightly, and her little right hand idly busying itself with one of the buttons of my coat. "'I might have been more clever, perhaps?' "'My love,' I said, "'what nonsense!' "'Do you think it nonsense?' returned Dora, without looking at me. "'Are you sure it is?' "'Of course I am.' I have forgotten, said Dora, still turning the button round and round, what relation Agnes is to you, you dear bad boy. No blood relation, I replied, but we were brought up together, like brother and sister. I wonder why you ever fell in love with me, said Dora, beginning on another button of my coat. Perhaps because I couldn't see you and not love you, Dora. Suppose you had never seen me at all, said Dora, going to another button. Suppose we had never been born, said I gaily. I wondered what she was thinking about as I glanced in admiring silence at the soft little hand travelling up the row of buttons on my coat, and at the clustering hair that lay against my breast, and at the lashes of her downcast eyes, slightly rising as they followed her idle fingers. At length her eyes were lifted up to mine, and she stood on tiptoe to give me, more thoughtfully than usual, that precious little kiss. Once, twice, three times, and went out of the room. They all came back together within five minutes afterwards, and Dora's unusual thoughtfulness was quite gone then. She was laughingly resolved to put Jip through the whole of his performances before the coach came. They took some time, not so much on account of their variety as Jip's reluctance, and were still unfinished when it was heard at the door. There was a hurried but affectionate parting between Agnes and herself, and Dora was to write to Agnes, who was not to mind her letters being foolish, she said, and Agnes was to write to Dora, and they had a second parting at the coach door, and a third when Dora, in spite of the remonstrances of Miss Lavinia, would come running out once more to remind Agnes that the coach window about writing, and to shake her curls at me on the box. The stage coach was to put us down near Covent Garden, where we were to take another stage coach for Highgate. I was impatient for the short walk in the interval that Agnes might praise Dora to me. Ah, what praise it was! How lovingly and fervently did it commend the pretty creature I had won, with all her artless graces best displayed, to my most gentle care! How thoughtfully remind me, yet with no pretense of doing so, of the trust in which I held the orphan child! Never, never had I loved Dora so deeply and truly as I loved her that night. When we had again alighted, 
and were walking in the starlight along the quiet road that led to the doctor's house, I told Agnes it was her doing. "'When you were sitting by her,' said I, "'you seemed to be no less her guardian angel than mine. "'And you seem so now, Agnes.' "'A poor angel,' she returned, "'but faithful.' The clear tone of her voice, going straight to my heart, made it natural to me to say, The cheerfulness that belongs to you, Agnes, and to no one else that ever I have seen, is so restored, I have observed to-day, that I have begun to hope you are happier at home. I am happier in myself, she said. I am quite cheerful and light-hearted. I glanced at the serene face looking upward, and thought it was the stars that made it seem so noble. "'There has been no change at home,' said Agnes, after a few moments. "'No fresh reference,' said I, to—' "'I wouldn't distress you, Agnes, but I cannot help asking, "'to what we spoke of when we parted last?' "'No, none,' she answered. "'I have thought so much about it. "'You must think less about it. "'Remember that I confide in simple love and truth at last.' "'Have no apprehensions for me, Trotwood,' she added after a moment. "'The step you dread my taking I shall never take.' Although I think I had never really feared it, in any season of cool reflection, it was an unspeakable relief to me to have this assurance from her own truthful lips. I told her so earnestly. "'And when this visit is over,' said I, "'for we may not be alone another time,' How long is it likely to be, my dear Agnes, before you come to London again? Probably a long time, she replied. I think it will be best, for Papa's sake, to remain at home. We are not likely to meet often, for some time to come, but I shall be a good correspondent of Dora's, and we shall frequently hear of one another that way. We were now within the little courtyard of the doctor's cottage. It was growing late. There was a light in the window of Mrs. Strong's chamber, and Agnes, pointing to it, bade me good-night. "'Do not be troubled,' she said, giving me her hand, "'by our misfortunes and anxieties. I can be happier in nothing than in your happiness. If you can ever give me help, rely upon it. I will ask you for it. God bless you always.' In her beaming smile, and in these last tones of her cheerful voice I seemed again to see and hear my little Dora in her company. I stood a while looking through the porch at the stars, with a heart full of love and gratitude, and then walked slowly forth. I had engaged a bed at a decent alehouse close by, and was going out at the gate, when, happening to turn my head, I saw a light in the doctor's study. A half-reproachful fancy came into my mind that he had been working at the dictionary without my help. With the view of seeing if this were so, and in any case of bidding him good-night, if he were yet sitting among his books, I turned back, and going softly across the hall, and gently opening the door, looked in. The first person whom I saw, to my surprise, by the sober light of the shaded lamp, was Uriah. He was standing close beside it, with one of his skeleton hands over his mouth, and the other resting on the doctor's table. The doctor sat in his study chair, covering his face with his hands. Mr. Wickfield, sorely troubled and distressed, was leaning forward, irresolutely touching the doctor's arm. For an instant I supposed that the doctor was ill. I hastily advanced a step under that impression when I met Uriah's eye and saw what was the matter. I would have withdrawn, but the doctor made a gesture to detain me, and I remained. "'At any rate,' observed Uriah, with a writhe of his ungainly person, "'we may keep the door shut. We needn't make it known to all the town.' Saying which, he went on his toes to the door, which I had left open, and carefully closed it. He then came back and took up his former position. There was an obtrusive show of compassionate zeal in his voice and manner, more intolerable, at least to me, than any demeanour he could have assumed. 
"'I have felt it incumbent upon me, Master Copperfield,' said Uriah, "'to point out to Dr. Strong what you and me have already talked about. "'You didn't exactly understand me, though.' "'I gave him a look, but no other answer, "'and going to my good old master, "'said a few words that I meant to be words of comfort and encouragement. "'He put his hand upon my shoulder, "'as it had been his custom to do when I was quite a little fellow.' but did not lift his grey head. "'As you didn't understand me, Master Copperfield,' resumed Uriah, in the same officious manner, "'may I take the liberty of humbly mentioning, being among friends, that I have called Dr. Strong's attention to the goings-on of Mrs. Strong? It's much against the grain with me, I assure you, Copperfield, to be concerned in anything so unpleasant. But really—' as it is, we're all mixing ourselves up with what oughtn't to be. That was what my meaning was, sir, when you didn't understand me. I wonder now, when I recall his leer, that I did not collar him and try to shake the breath out of his body. I dare say I didn't make myself very clear, he went on, nor you neither. Naturally, we was both of us inclined to give such a subject a wide berth. However, at last I have made up my mind to speak plain, and I have mentioned to Dr. Strong that— Did you speak, sir? This was to the doctor, who had moaned. The sound might have touched any heart, I thought, but it had no effect on Uriah's. Mention to Dr. Strong, he proceeded, that any one may see that Mr. Maldon and the lovely and agreeable lady as is Dr. Strong's wife— are too sweet on one another. Really the time is come, we being at present all mixing ourselves up with what oughtn't to be, when Dr. Strong must be told that this was full as plain to everybody as the sun, before Mr. Maldon went to India, that Mr. Maldon made excuses to come back for nothing else, and that he's always here for nothing else. When you come in, sir— I was just putting it to my fellow-partner, towards whom he turned, to say to Dr. Strong, upon his word and honour, whether he'd ever been of this opinion long ago or not. Come, Mr. Wickfield, sir, would you be so good as to tell us? Yes or no, sir? Come, partner. For God's sake, my dear doctor, said Mr. Wickfield, again laying his irresolute hand upon the doctor's arm, don't attach too much weight to any suspicions I may have entertained. There! cried Uriah, shaking his head. What a melancholy confirmation, ain't it? Hm! Such an old friend! Bless your soul, when I was nothing but a clerk in his office, Copperfield, I've seen him twenty times if I've seen him once, quite in a taking about it quite put out, you know, and very proper in him as a father. I'm sure I can't blame him. To think that Miss Agnes was mixing herself up with what oughtn't to be. My dear Strong, said Mr. Wickfield, in a tremulous voice, my good friend, I, I needn't tell you that it has been my vice to look for some one master motive in everybody, and to try all actions by one narrow test. I may have fallen into such doubts as I have had through this mistake." "'You have had doubts, Wickfield,' said the doctor, without lifting up his head. "'You have had doubts.' "'Speak up, fellow-partner,' urged Uriah. "'I had at one time, certainly,' said Mr. Wickfield. "'I—God forgive me, I thought you had—' "'No, no, no,' returned the doctor, in a tone of most pathetic grief. "'I thought at one time,' said Mr. Wickfield, that you wished to send Malden abroad to effect a desirable separation. No, 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 returned the doctor, to give Annie pleasure by making some provision for the companionship of her childhood, nothing else. So I found, said Mr. Wickfield, I couldn't doubt it when you told me so, but I thought I implore you to remember the narrow construction which has been my besetting sin, that in a case where there was so much disparity in point of years. "'That's the way to put it, you see, Master Copperfield,' observed Uriah, with fawning and offensive pity. 
a lady of such youth and such attractions however real her respect for you might have been influenced in marrying by worldly considerations only i make no allowance for innumerable feelings and circumstances that may have all tended to good for heaven's sake remember that how kind he puts it said uriah shaking his head always observing her from one point of view said mr wickfield but by all that is dear to you my old friend i entreat you to consider what it was i am forced to confess now having no escape no there's no way out of it mr wickfield sir observed uriah when it's got to this that i did said mr wickfield glancing helplessly and distractedly at his partner that i did doubt her and think her wanting in her duty to you and that I did sometimes, if I must say all, feel averse to Agnes, being in such a familiar relation towards her, as to see what I saw, or in my diseased theory fancied that I saw. I never mentioned this to any one, I never meant it to be known to any one, and though it is terrible to you to hear, said Mr. Wickfield, quite subdued, if you knew how terrible it is for me to tell— you would feel compassion for me the doctor in the perfect goodness of his nature put out his hand mr wickfield held it for a little while in his with his head bowed down i am sure said uriah writhing himself into the silence like a conjure eel that this is a subject full of unpleasantness to everybody but since we have scott so far i ought to take the liberty of mentioning that copperfield has noticed it too i turned upon him and asked him how he dared refer to me oh it's very kind of you copperfield returned uriah undulating all over and we all know what an amiable character yours is but you know that the moment i spoke to you the other night you knew what i meant you know you knew what i meant copperfield don't deny it you deny it with the best of intentions but don't do it copperfield i saw the mild eye of the good old doctor turned upon me for a moment and i felt that the confession of my old misgivings and remembrances was too plainly written in my face to be overlooked it was of no use raging i could not undo that say what i would i could not unsay it we were silent again and remained so until the doctor rose and walked twice or thrice across the room presently he returned to where his chair stood and leaning on the back of it and occasionally putting his handkerchief to his eyes with a simple honesty that did him more honour to my thinking than any disguise he could have effected said i have been much to blame i believe i have been very much to blame i have exposed one whom i hold in my heart to trials and aspersions i call them aspersions even to have been conceived in anybody's inmost mind of which she never but for me could have been the object uriah heep gave a kind of snivel i think to express sympathy of which my annie said the doctor never but for me could have been the object gentlemen i am old now as you know i do not feel to-night that i have much to live for but my life my life upon the truth and honour of the dear lady who has been the subject of this conversation i do not think that the best embodiment of chivalry the realization of the handsomest and most romantic figure ever imagined by painter could have said this with more impressive and affecting dignity than the plain old doctor did but i am not prepared he went on to deny perhaps i may have been without knowing it in some degree prepared to admit that i may have unwittingly ensnared that lady into an unhappy marriage i am a man quite unaccustomed to observe and i cannot but believe that the observation of several people of different ages and positions all too plainly tending in one direction and that so natural is better than mine i had often admired as i have elsewhere described his benignant manner towards his youthful wife 
but the respectful tenderness he manifested in every reference to her on this occasion, and the almost reverential manner in which he put away from him the lightest doubt of her integrity, exalted him in my eyes beyond description. I married that lady, said the doctor, when she was extremely young. I took her to myself when her character was scarcely formed. So far as it was developed, it had been my happiness to form it. I knew her father well. I knew her well. I had taught her what I could for the love of all her beautiful and virtuous qualities. If I did her wrong, as I fear I did, in taking advantage, but I never meant it, of her gratitude and her affection, I ask pardon of that lady in my heart. He walked across the room, and came back to the same place, holding the chair with a grasp that trembled, like his subdued voice, in its earnestness. I regarded myself as a refuge for her from the dangers and vicissitudes of life. I persuaded myself that unequal though we were in years, she would live tranquilly and contentedly with me. I did not shut out of my consideration the time when I should leave her free, and still young and still beautiful, but with her judgment more matured. No, gentlemen, upon my truth! His homely figure seemed to be lightened up by his fidelity and generosity. Every word he uttered had a force that no other grace could have imparted to it. My life with this lady has been very happy. Until to-night I have had uninterrupted occasion to bless the day on which I did her great injustice. His voice, more and more faltering in the utterance of these words, stopped for a few moments. Then he went on. Once awakened from my dream, I have been a poor dreamer in one way or another all my life. I see how natural it is that she should have some regretful feelings toward her old companion and her equal, that she does regard him with some innocent regret, with some blameless thoughts of what might have been but for me, is, I fear, too true. Much that I have seen, but not noted, has come back upon me with new meaning during this last trying hour. But beyond this, gentlemen, the dear lady's name must never be coupled with a word, a breath of doubt. For a little while his eye kindled and his voice was firm. For a little while he was silent again. Presently he proceeded as before. It only remains for me to bear the knowledge of the unhappiness I have occasioned as submissively as I can. It is she who should reproach, not I. To save her from misconstruction, cruel misconstruction, that even my friends have not been able to avoid, becomes my duty. The more retired we live, the better I shall discharge it. And when the time comes, may it come soon, if it be his merciful pleasure, when my death shall release her from constraint, I shall close my eyes upon her honoured face with unbounded confidence and love, and leave her with no sorrow, then, to happier and brighter days. I could not see him for the tears which his earnestness and goodness, so adorned by and so adorning, the perfect simplicity of his manner brought into my eyes. He had moved to the door when he added, Gentlemen, I have shown you my heart. I am sure you will respect it. What we have said to-night is never to be said more. Wickfield, give me an old friend's arm upstairs. Mr. Wickfield hastened to him. Without interchanging a word, they went slowly out of the room together, Uriah looking after them. "'Well, Master Copperfield,' said Uriah, meekly turning to me, "'the thing hasn't took quite the turn that might have been expected, for the old scholar, what an excellent man, is as blind as a brickbat. But this family's out of the cart, I think.' I needed but the sound of his voice to be so madly enraged as I never was before, and never have been since. "'You villain!' said I. "'What do you mean by entrapping me into your schemes? How dare you appeal to me just now, you false rascal, 
as if we had been in discussion together. As we stood front to front, I saw so plainly in the stealthy exultation of his face what I already so plainly knew. I mean that he forced his confidence upon me expressly to make me miserable, and had set a deliberate trap for me in this very matter, that I couldn't bear it. The whole of his lank cheek was invitingly before me, and I struck it with my open hand, with that force that my fingers tingled as if I had burnt them. He caught the hand in his, and we stood in that connection looking at each other. We stood so a long time, long enough for me to see the white marks of my fingers die out of the deep red of his cheek, and leave it a deeper red. Copperfield, he said at length in a breathless voice, have you taken leave of your senses? I have taken leave of you, said I, resting my hand away. You dog, I'll know no more of you. Won't you? said he, constrained by the pain of his cheek, to put his hand there. Perhaps you wouldn't be able to help it. Isn't this ungrateful of you now? I have shown you often enough, said I, that I despise you. I have shown you now more plainly that I do. Why should I dread your doing your worst to all about you? What else do you ever do? He perfectly understood this allusion to the considerations that had hitherto restrained me in my communications with him. I rather think that neither the blow nor the allusion would have escaped me, but for the assurance I had had from Agnes that night. It is no matter. There was another long pause. His eyes, as he looked at me, seemed to take every shade of color that could make eyes ugly. Copperfield, he said, removing his hand from his cheek, you have always gone against me. I know you always used to be against me at Mr. Wickfield's. You may think what you like, said I, still in a towering rage. If it is not true, so much the worthier you. And yet I always liked you, Copperfield, he rejoined. I deigned to make him no reply, and taking up my hat was going out to bed when he came between me and the door. Copperfield, he said, there must be two parties to a quarrel. I won't be one. You may go to the devil, said I. Don't say that, he replied. I know you'll be sorry afterwards. How can you make yourself so inferior to me? as to show such a bad spirit, but I forgive you. You forgive me, I repeated disdainfully. I do, and you can't help yourself, replied Uriah, to think of your going and attacking me, that have always been a friend to you. But there can't be a quarrel without two parties, and I won't be one. I will be a friend to you in spite of you. So now you know what you've got to expect. The necessity of carrying on this dialogue, his part in which was very slow, mine very quick, in a low tone that the house might not be disturbed at an unseasonable hour, did not improve my temper. Though my passion was cooling down, merely telling him that I should expect from him what I always had expected, and had never yet been disappointed in, I opened the door upon him, as if he had been a great walnut put there to be cracked and went out of the house. But he slept out of the house, too, at his mother's lodging, and before I had gone many hundred yards, came up with me. "'You know, Copperfield,' he said in my ear, I did not turn my head, "'you're in quite a wrong position,' which I felt to be true, and that made me chafe the more. "'You can't make this a brave thing, and you can't help being forgiven.' I don't intend to mention it to mother, nor to any living soul. I'm determined to forgive you. But I do wonder what you should lift your hand against the person that you knew to be so humble. I felt only less mean than he. He knew me better than I knew myself. If he had retorted or openly exasperated me, it would have been a relief and a justification. But he had put me on a slow fire, on which I lay tormented half the night. In the morning when I came out, the early church bell was ringing, and he was walking up and down with his mother. He addressed me as if nothing had happened, and I could do no less than reply. 
I had struck him hard enough to give him the toothache, I suppose. At all events his face was tied up in a black silk handkerchief, which, with his hat perched on top of it, was far from improving his appearance. I heard that he went to a dentist's in London on the Monday morning, and had a tooth out. I hope it was a double one. The doctor gave out that he was not quite well, and remained alone, for a considerable part of every day, during the remainder of the visit. Agnes and her father had been gone a week before we resumed our usual work. On the day preceding its resumption, the doctor gave me with his own hands a folded note not sealed. It was addressed to myself, and laid an injunction on me, in a few affectionate words, never to refer to the subject of that evening. I had confided it to my aunt, but to no one else. It was not a subject I could discuss with Agnes, and Agnes certainly had not the least suspicion of what had passed. Neither, I felt convinced, had Mrs. Strong then. Several weeks elapsed before I saw the least change in her. It came on slowly, like a cloud when there is no wind. At first she seemed to wonder at the gentle compassion with which the doctor spoke to her, and at his wish that she should have her mother with her to relieve the dull monotony of her life. Often when we were at work, and she was sitting by, I would see her pausing and looking at him with that memorable face. Afterwards I sometimes observed her rise with her eyes full of tears, and go out of the room. Gradually an unhappy shadow fell upon her beauty, and deepened every day. Mrs. Markleham was a regular inmate of the cottage then, but she talked and talked, and saw nothing. As this change stole on Annie, once like sunshine in the doctor's house, the doctor became older in appearance and more grave. But the sweetness of his temper, the placid kindness of his manner, and his benevolent solicitude for her, if they were capable of any increase, were increased. I saw him once, early on the morning of her birthday, when she came to sit in the window while we were at work, which she had always done, but now began to do with a timid and uncertain air that I thought very touching, take her forehead between his hands, kiss it, and go hurriedly away, too much moved to remain. I saw her stand where he had left her, like a statue, and then bend down her head, and clasp her hands, and weep, I cannot say how sorrowfully. Sometimes after that I fancied that she tried to speak even to me in intervals when we were left alone, but she never uttered a word. The doctor always had some new project for her participating in amusements away from home with her mother and Mrs. Markleham, who was very fond of amusements and very easily dissatisfied with anything else, entered into them with a great good will and was loud in her commendations but Annie, in a spiritless, unhappy way, only went whither she was led, and seemed to have no care for anything. I did not know what to think, neither did my aunt, who must have walked at various times a hundred miles in her uncertainty. What was strangest of all was that the only real relief which seemed to make its way into the secret region of this domestic unhappiness made its way there in the person of Mr. Dick. What his thoughts were on the subject, or what his observation was, I am as unable to explain as I dare say he would have been to assist me in the task. But as I have recorded in the narrative of my school days, his veneration for the doctor was unbounded, and there is a subtlety of perception in real attachment, even when it is borne towards man by one of the lower animals, which leaves the highest intellect behind. To this mind of the heart, if I may call it so, in Mr. Dick, some bright ray of the truth shot straight. He had proudly resumed his privilege, in many of his spare hours, of walking up and down the garden with the doctor, as he had been accustomed to pace up and down the doctor's walk at Canterbury. But matters were no sooner in this state than he devoted all his spare time and got up earlier to make it more, to these perambulations. If he had never been so happy as when the doctor read that marvellous performance, the dictionary, to him, 
he was now quite miserable unless the doctor pulled it out of his pocket and began. When the doctor and I were engaged, he now fell into the custom of walking up and down with Mrs. Strong and helping her to trim her favorite flowers or weed the beds. I dare say he rarely spoke a dozen words in an hour, but his quiet interest and his wistful face found immediate response in both their breasts. Each knew that the other liked him, and that he loved both, and he became what no one else could be, a link between them. When I think of him with his impenetrably wise face, walking up and down with the doctor, delighted to be battered by the hard words in the dictionary, when I think of him carrying huge watering pots after Annie, kneeling down in very paws of gloves at patient microscopic work among the little leaves, expressing as no philosopher could have expressed, in everything he did, a delicate desire to be her friend, showering sympathy, trustfulness, and affection out of every hole in the watering pot. When I think of him never wandering in that better mind of his to which unhappiness addressed itself, never bringing the unfortunate King Charles into the garden, never wavering in his grateful service, never diverted from his knowledge that there was something wrong, or from his wish to set it right, I really feel almost ashamed of having known that he was not quite in his wits, taking account of the utmost I have done with mine. "'Nobody but myself, Trot, knows what that man is,' my aunt would proudly remark when we conversed about it. "'Dick will distinguish himself yet.' I must refer to one other topic before I close this chapter. While the visit at the doctor's was still in progress, I observed that the postman brought two or three letters every morning for Uriah Heep, who remained at Highgate until the rest went back, it being a leisure time and that these were always directed in a business-like manner by Mr. Micawber, who now assumed a round legal hand. I was glad to infer from these slight premises that Mr. Micawber was doing well, and consequently was much surprised to receive, about this time, the following letter from his amiable wife. Canterbury, Monday evening. You will doubtless be surprised, my dear Mr. Copperfield, to receive this communication still more so by its contents, still more so by the stipulation of implicit confidence which I beg to impose. But my feelings as a wife and mother require relief, and as I do not wish to consult my family, already obnoxious to the feelings of Mr. Micawber, I know no one of whom I can better ask advice than my friend and former lodger. You may be aware, my dear Mr. Copperfield, that between myself and Mr. Micawber, whom I will never desert, there has always been preserved a spirit of mutual confidence. Mr. Micawber may have occasionally given a bill without consulting me, or he may have misled me as to the period when that obligation would become due. This has actually happened. But in general Mr. Micawber has had no secrets from the bosom of affection, I allude to his wife, and has invariably, on our retirement to rest, recalled the events of the day. You will picture to yourself, my dear Mr. Copperfield, what the poignancy of my feelings must be when I inform you that Mr. Micawber is entirely changed. He is reserved. He is secret. His life is a mystery to the partner of his joys and sorrows. I again allude to his wife. And if I should assure you that beyond knowing what it is passed from morning to night at the office, I now know less of it than I do of the man in the South, connected with whose mouth the thoughtless children repeat an idle tale respecting cold plum porridge. I should adopt a popular fallacy to express an actual fact. But this is not all. Mr. Micawber is morose. He is severe. He is estranged from our eldest son and daughter. He has no pride in his twins. He looks with an eye of coldness, even on the unoffending stranger who last became a member of our circle. The pecuniary means of meeting our expenses, kept down to the utmost farthing, are obtained from him with great difficulty, and even under fearful threats that he will settle himself, the exact expression, and he inexorably refuses to give any explanation whatever of this distracting policy. 
This is hard to bear. This is heart-breaking. If you will advise me, knowing my feeble powers such as they are, how you think it will be best to exert them in a dilemma so unwanted, you will add another friendly obligation to the many you have already rendered me. With loves from the children, and a smile from the happily unconscious stranger, I remain, dear Mr. Copperfield, your afflicted Emma Micawber. I did not feel justified in giving a wife of Mrs. Micawber's experience any other recommendation than that she should try to reclaim Mr. Micawber by patience and kindness, as I knew she would in any case. But the letter set me thinking about him very much. End of chapter 42 Recording by Father Ziley, Detroit, Michigan Chapter 43 of David Copperfield This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Laurie Ann Walden David Copperfield by Charles Dickens Chapter 43 Another Retrospect Once again, let me pause upon a memorable period of my life. Let me stand aside to see the phantoms of those days go by me, accompanying the shadow of myself in dim procession. Weeks, months, seasons pass along. They seem little more than a summer day and a winter evening. Now the common where I walk with Dora is all in bloom, a field of bright gold, and now the unseen heather lies in mounds and bunches underneath a covering of snow. In a breath, the river that flows through our Sunday walks is sparkling in the summer sun, is ruffled by the winter wind, or thickened with drifting heaps of ice. Faster than ever river ran towards the sea, it flashes, darkens, and rolls away. Not a thread changes in the house of the two little bird-like ladies. The clock ticks over the fireplace, the weather-glass hangs in the hall. Neither clock nor weather-glass is ever right but we believe in both devoutly. I have come legally to man's estate. I have attained the dignity of twenty-one. But this is a sort of dignity that may be thrust upon one. Let me think what I have achieved. I have tamed that savage stenographic mystery. I make a respectable income by it. I am in high repute for my accomplishment in all pertaining to the art, and am joined with eleven others in reporting the debates in Parliament for a morning newspaper. Night after night I record predictions that never come to pass, professions that are never fulfilled, explanations that are only meant to mystify. I wallow in words. Britannia, that unfortunate female, is always before me, like a trussed fowl, skewered through and through with office pins, and bound hand and foot with red tape. I am sufficiently behind the scenes to know the worth of political life. I am quite an infidel about it, and shall never be converted. My dear old Traddles has tried his hand at the same pursuit, but it is not in Traddles' way. He is perfectly good-humoured respecting his failure, and reminds me that he always did consider himself slow. He has occasional employment on the same newspaper, in getting up the facts of dry subjects, to be written about and embellished by more fertile minds. He is called to the bar, and with admirable industry and self-denial has scraped another hundred pounds together to fee a conveyancer whose chambers he attends. A great deal of very hot port wine was consumed at his call, and, considering the figure, I should think the inner temple must have made a profit by it. I have come out in another way. I have taken with fear and trembling to authorship. I wrote a little something in secret, and sent it to a magazine, and it was published in the magazine. Since then I have taken heart to write a good many trifling pieces. Now I am regularly paid for them. Altogether I am well off. When I tell my income on the fingers of my left hand, I pass the third finger and take in the fourth to the middle joint. We have removed from Buckingham Street to a pleasant little cottage very near the one I looked at when my enthusiasm first came on. 
My aunt, however, who has sold the house at Dover to good advantage, is not going to remain here, but intends removing herself to a still more tiny cottage close at hand. What does this portend? My marriage? Yes. Yes, I am going to be married to Dora. Miss Lavinia and Miss Clarissa have given their consent, and if ever canary-birds were in a flutter, they are. Miss Lavinia, self-charged with the superintendence of my darling's wardrobe, is constantly cutting out brown paper cuirasses, and differing in opinion from a highly respectable young man with a long bundle and a yard measure under his arm. A dressmaker, always stabbed in the breast with a needle and thread, boards and lodges in the house, and seems to me, eating, drinking, or sleeping, never to take her thimble off. They make a lay figure of my dear. They are always sending for her to come and try something on. We can't be happy together for five minutes in the evening, but some intrusive female knocks at the door and says, "'Oh, if you please, Miss Dora, would you step upstairs?' Miss Clarissa and my aunt roam all over London to find out articles of furniture for Dora and me to look at. It would be better for them to buy the goods at once, without this ceremony of inspection, for when we go to see a kitchen fender and meat screen, Dora sees a Chinese house for Jip, with little bells on the top, and prefers that, and it takes a long time to accustom Jip to his new residence, after we have bought it. Whenever he goes in or out, he makes all the little bells ring, and is horribly frightened. Peggotty comes up to make herself useful, and falls to work immediately. Her department appears to be to clean everything over and over again. She rubs everything that can be rubbed until it shines like her own honest forehead with perpetual friction. And now it is that I begin to see her solitary brother passing through the dark streets at night, and looking as he goes among the wandering faces. I never speak to him at such an hour. I know too well, as his grave figure passes onward, what he seeks and what he dreads. Why does Traddles look so important when he calls upon me this afternoon in the Commons, where I still occasionally attend, for form's sake, when I have time? The realization of my boyish daydreams is at hand. I am going to take out the license. It is a little document to do so much, and Traddles contemplates it, as it lies upon my desk, half in admiration, half in awe. There are the names in the sweet old visionary connection, David Copperfield, and Dora Spinlow, and there in the corner is that parental institution, the Stamp Office, which is so benignantly interested in the various transactions of human life, looking down upon our union. And there is the Archbishop of Canterbury invoking a blessing on us in print, and doing it as cheap as could possibly be expected. Nevertheless, I am in a dream, a flustered, happy, hurried dream. I can't believe that it is going to be, and yet I can't believe but that every one I pass in the street must have some kind of perception that I am to be married the day after tomorrow. The surrogate knows me when I go down to be sworn, and disposes of me easily, as if there were a Masonic understanding between us. Traddles is not at all wanted, but is in attendance as my general backer. I hope the next time you come here, my dear fellow, I say to Traddles, it will be on the same errand for yourself, and I hope it will be soon. Thank you for your good wishes, my dear Copperfield, he replies. I hope so, too. It's a satisfaction to know that she'll wait for me any length of time, and that she really is the dearest girl. When are you to meet her at the coach? I ask. At seven, says Traddles, looking at his plain old silver watch, the very watch he once took a wheel out of at school to make a water mill. That is about Miss Wickfield's time, is it not? A little earlier. Her time is half-past eight. I assure you, my dear boy, says Traddles, I am almost as pleased as if I were going to be married myself, to think that this event is coming to such a happy termination. And really, the great friendship and consideration of personally associating Sophie with the joyous occasion, and inviting her to be a bridesmaid in conjunction with Miss Wickfield, demands my warmest thanks. I am extremely sensible of it. I hear him, and shake hands with him, and we talk, and walk, and dine, and so on. But I don't believe it. Nothing is real. Sophie arrives at the house of Dora's aunts in due course. She has the most agreeable of faces, not absolutely beautiful, but extraordinarily pleasant, 
and is one of the most genial, unaffected, frank, engaging creatures I have ever seen. Traddles presents her to us with great pride, and rubs his hands for ten minutes by the clock, with every individual hair upon his head standing on tiptoe, when I congratulate him in a corner on his choice. I have brought Agnes from the Canterbury coach, and her cheerful and beautiful face is among us for the second time. Agnes has a great liking for Traddles, and it is capital to see them meet, and to observe the glory of Traddles as he commends the dearest girl in the world to her acquaintance. Still, I don't believe it. We have a delightful evening, and are supremely happy, but I don't believe it yet. I can't collect myself. I can't check off my happiness as it takes place. I feel in a misty and unsettled kind of state, as if I had got up very early in the morning a week or two ago, and had never been to bed since. I can't make out when yesterday was. I seem to have been carrying the license about in my pocket many months. Next day, too, when we all go in a flock to see the house, our house, Dora's and mine, I am quite unable to regard myself as its master. I seem to be there by permission of somebody else. I half expect to see the real master to come home presently and say he is glad to see me. Such a beautiful little house as it is, with everything so bright and new, with the flowers on the carpets looking as if freshly gathered, and the green leaves on the paper as if they had just come out with the spotless muslin curtains and the blushing rose-coloured furniture and dora's garden hat with the blue ribbon do i remember now how i loved her in such another hat when i first knew her already hanging on its little peg the guitar case quite at home on its heels in a corner and everybody tumbling over gyp's pagoda which is much too big for the establishment another happy evening quite as unreal as all the rest of it and I steal into the usual room before going away. Dora is not there. I suppose they have not done trying on yet. Miss Lavinia peeps in, and tells me mysteriously that she will not be long. She is rather long, notwithstanding, but by and by I hear a rustling at the door, and someone taps. I say, come in, but someone taps again. I go to the door, wondering who it is, there I meet a pair of bright eyes and a blushing face. They are Dora's eyes and face, and Miss Lavinia has dressed her in tomorrow's dress, bonnet and all, for me to see. I take my little wife to my heart, and Miss Lavinia gives a little scream because I tumble the bonnet, and Dora laughs and cries at once because I am so pleased, and I believe it less than ever. "'Do you think it pretty, Doty?' says Dora. "'Pretty? I should rather think I did.' "'And are you sure you like me very much?' says Dora. The topic is fraught with such danger to the bonnet that Miss Lavinia gives another little scream, and begs me to understand that Dora is only to be looked at and on no account to be touched. So Dora stands in a delightful state of confusion for a minute or two to be admired, and then takes off her bonnet, looking so natural without it, and runs away with it in her hand, and comes dancing down again in her own familiar dress, and asks Jip if I have got a beautiful little wife, and whether he'll forgive her for being married, and kneels down to make him stand upon the cookery book for the last time in her single life. I go home, more incredulous than ever, to a lodging that I have hard by, and get up very early in the morning to ride to the Highgate Road and fetch my aunt. I have never seen my aunt in such state. She is dressed in lavender-colored silk, and has a white bonnet on, and is amazing. Janet has dressed her, and is there to look at me. Peggotty is ready to go to church, intending to behold the ceremony from the gallery. Mr. Dick, who is to give my darling to me at the altar, has had his hair curled. Traddles, whom I have taken up by appointment at the turnpike, presents a dazzling combination of cream color and light blue and both he and Mr. Dick have a general effect about them of being all gloves. No doubt I see this because I know it is so, but I am astray and seem to see nothing, nor do I believe anything whatever. Still, as we drive along in an open carriage, this fairy marriage is real enough to fill me with a sort of wondering pity for the unfortunate people who have no part in it, but are sweeping out the shops and going to their daily occupations." My aunt sits with my hand in hers all the way. When we stop a little way short of the church to put down Peggotty, whom we have brought on the box, she gives it a squeeze and me a kiss. 
God bless you, Trot. My own boy never could be dearer. I think of poor dear baby this morning. So do I, and of all I owe to you, dear aunt. Tut, child, says my aunt, and gives her hand an overflowing cordiality to Traddles, who then gives his to Mr. Dick, who then gives his to me, who then gives mine to Traddles, and then we come to the church door. The church is calm enough, I am sure, but it might be a steam-power loom in full action for any sedative effect it has on me. I am too far gone for that. The rest is all a more or less incoherent dream. A dream of their coming in with Dora, of the pew-opener arranging us, like a drill-sergeant, before the altar-rails, of my wondering, even then, why pew-openers must always be the most disagreeable females procurable, and whether there is any religious dread of a disastrous infection of good humour which renders it indispensable to set those vessels of vinegar upon the road to heaven. Of the clergyman and clerk appearing, of a few boatmen and some other people strolling in, of an ancient mariner behind me, strongly flavouring the church with rum, of the service beginning in a deep voice, and our all being very attentive. Of Miss Lavinia, who acts as a semi-auxiliary bridesmaid, being the first to cry, and of her doing homage, as I take it, to the memory of Pidger and sobs, of Miss Clarissa applying a smelling-bottle, of Agnes taking care of Dora, of my aunt endeavouring to represent herself as a model of sternness with tears rolling down her face, of little Dora trembling very much and making her responses in faint whispers, of our kneeling down together side by side, of Dora's trembling less and less, but always clasping Agnes by the hand, of the service being got through quietly and gravely, of our all looking at each other in an April state of smiles and tears when it is over, of my young wife being hysterical in the vestry, and crying for her poor papa, her dear papa. Of her soon cheering up again, and our signing the register all round. Of my going into the gallery for Peggotty to bring her to sign it. Of Peggotty's hugging me in a corner, and telling me she saw my own dear mother married. Of its being over and our going away. Of my walking so proudly and lovingly down the aisle with my sweet wife upon my arm, through a mist of half-seen people, pulpits, monuments, pews, fonts, organs, and church windows, in which there flutter faint airs of association with my childish church at home so long ago. Of their whispering as we pass, what a youthful couple we are, and what a pretty little wife she is. Of our all being so merry and talkative in the carriage going back. Of Sophie telling us that when she saw Traddles, whom I had entrusted with the license, asked for it, she almost fainted, having been convinced that he would contrive to lose it, or to have his pocket picked. Of Agnes laughing gaily, and of Dora being so fond of Agnes that she will not be separated from her, but still keeps her hand. Of there being a breakfast, with abundance of things, pretty and substantial, to eat and drink, whereof I partake, as I should do in any other dream, without the least perception of their flavour. Eating and drinking, as I may say, nothing but love and marriage, and no more believing in the viands than in anything else. Of my making a speech in the same dreamy fashion, without having an idea of what I want to say, beyond such as may be comprehended in the full conviction that I haven't said it. Of our being very sociably and simply happy, always in a dream, though, and of Jip's having wedding-cake, and its not agreeing with him afterwards. Of the pair of hired post-horses being ready, and of Dora's going away to change her dress. Of my aunt and Miss Clarissa remaining with us, and our walking in the garden. And my aunt, who has made quite a speech at breakfast touching Dora's aunts, being mightily amused with herself, but a little proud of it, too. Of Dora's being ready, and of Miss Lavinia's hovering about her, loath to lose the pretty toy that has given her so much pleasant occupation. Of Dora's making a long series of surprise discoveries that she has forgotten all sorts of little things, and of everybody's running everywhere to fetch them. Of their all closing about Dora, when at last she begins to say good-bye, looking with their bright colours and ribbons like a bed of flowers. Of my darling being almost smothered among the flowers, and coming out, laughing and crying both together, to my jealous arms. Of my wanting to carry Jip, 
who was to go along with us, and Dora's saying, no, that she must carry him, or else he'll think she don't like him any more now she is married, and will break his heart. Of our going arm in arm, and Dora stopping and looking back, and saying, if I have ever been cross or ungrateful to anybody, don't remember it, and bursting into tears. Of her waving her little hand in our going away once more, of her once more stopping and looking back and hurrying to Agnes, and giving Agnes, above all the others, her last kisses and farewells. We drive away together, and I awake from the dream. I believe it at last. It is my dear, dear little wife beside me, whom I love so well. "'Are you happy now, you foolish boy?' says Dora. "'And sure you don't repent?' I have stood aside to see the phantoms of those days go by me. They are gone, and I resume the journey of my story. End of chapter 43「it was a strange condition of things, the honeymoon being over, and the bridesmaids gone home, when I found myself sitting down in my own small house with Dora, quite thrown out of employment, as I may say, in respect of the delicious old occupation of making love. It seemed such an extraordinary thing to have Dora always there. It was so unaccountable not to be obliged to go out to see her, not to have any occasion to be tormenting myself about her, not to have to write to her, not to be scheming and devising opportunities of being alone with her. Sometimes of an evening, when I looked up from my writing and saw her seated opposite, I would lean back in my chair and think how queer it was that there we were, alone together as a matter of course, nobody's business any more, all the romance of our engagement put away upon a shelf to rust, no one to please but one another, one another to please for life. When there was a debate and I was kept out very late, it seemed so strange to me as I was walking home to think that Dora was at home. It was such a wonderful thing at first to have her coming softly down to talk to me as I ate my supper. It was such a stupendous thing to know for certain that she put her hair in papers. It was altogether such an astonishing event to see her do it. I doubt whether two young birds could have known less about keeping house than I and my pretty Dora did. We had a servant, of course. She kept house for us. I have still a latent belief that she must have been Mrs. Crupp's daughter in disguise. We had such an awful time of it with Mary Ann. Her name was Paragon. Her nature was represented to us, when we engaged her, as being feebly expressed in her name. She had a written character as large as a proclamation, and according to this document could do everything of a domestic nature that ever I heard of, and a great many things that I never did hear of. She was a woman in the prime of life, of a severe countenance, and subject, particularly in the arms, to a sort of perpetual measles or fiery rash. She had a cousin in the lifeguards with such long legs that he looked like the afternoon shadow of somebody else. His shell jacket was as much too little for him as he was too big for the premises. He made the cottage smaller than it need have been by being so very much out of proportion to it. Besides which, the walls were not thick, and whenever he passed the evening at our house, we always knew of it by hearing one continual growl in the kitchen. Our treasure was warranted sober and honest. I am therefore willing to believe that she was in a fit when we found her under the boiler, and that the deficient teaspoons were attributable to the dustman. But she preyed upon our minds dreadfully. We felt our inexperience, and were unable to help ourselves." We should have been at her mercy if she had had any, but she was a remorseless woman and had none. She was the cause of our first little quarrel. "'My dearest life,' I said one day to Dora, "'do you think Mary Ann has any idea of time?' "'Why, Dodie?' inquired Dora, looking up innocently from her drawing. "'My love, because it's five, and we were to have dined at four. Dora glanced wistfully at the clock, and hinted that she thought it was too fast. "'On the contrary, my love,' said I, referring to my watch, "'it's a few minutes too slow.' 
my little wife came and sat upon my knee to coax me to be quiet, and drew a line with her pencil down the middle of my nose. But I couldn't dine off that, though it was very agreeable. "'Don't you think, my dear,' said I, "'it would be better for you to remonstrate with Marianne?' "'Oh, no, please, I couldn't, Dodie,' said Dora. "'Why not, my love?' I gently asked. "'Oh, because I am such a little goose,' said Dora, "'and she knows I am.' I thought this sentiment so incompatible with the establishment of any system of check on Mary Ann that I frowned a little. "'Oh, what ugly wrinkles in my bad boy's forehead,' said Dora, and still being on my knee, she traced them with her pencil, putting it to her rosy lips to make it mark blacker, and working at my forehead with a quaint little mockery of being industrious, that quite delighted me in spite of myself. "'There's a good child,' said Dora. "'It makes its face so much prettier to laugh.' "'But my love,' said I. "'No, no, please,' cried Dora, with a kiss. "'Don't be a naughty bluebeard. Don't be serious.' "'My precious wife,' said I, "'we must be serious sometimes. "'Come, sit down on this chair close beside me. "'Give me the pencil. "'There, now let us talk sensibly. "'You know, dear, what a little hand it was to hold "'and what a tiny wedding ring it was to see. "'You know, my love, it is not exactly comfortable "'to have to go out without one's dinner. "'Now is it?' "'No,' replied Dora, faintly. "'My love, how you tremble!' "'Because I know you're going to scold me,' exclaimed Dora, in a piteous voice. "'My sweet, I am only going to reason.' "'Oh, but reasoning is worse than scolding,' exclaimed Dora, in despair. "'I didn't marry to be reasoned with. "'If you meant to reason with such a poor little thing as I am, "'you ought to have told me so, you cruel boy.' "'I tried to pacify Dora, but she turned away her face "'and shook her curls from side to side and said, "'You cruel, cruel boy!' so many times that I really did not exactly know what to do, so I took a few turns up and down the room in my uncertainty, and came back again. "'Dora, my darling. No, I am not your darling, because you must be sorry that you married me, or else you wouldn't reason with me,' returned Dora. I felt so injured by the inconsequential nature of this charge that it gave me courage to be grave." "'Now, my own Dora,' said I, "'you are very childish and are talking nonsense. "'You must remember, I am sure, "'that I was obliged to go out yesterday "'when dinner was half over, "'and that the day before I was made quite unwell "'by being obliged to eat underdone veal in a hurry. "'Today I don't dine at all, "'and I am afraid to say how long we waited for breakfast, "'and then the water didn't boil. "'I don't mean to reproach you, my dear, "'but this is not comfortable.' "'Oh, you cruel, cruel boy, to say I am a disagreeable wife!' cried Dora. "'Now, my dear Dora, you must know that I never said that.' "'You said I wasn't comfortable,' cried Dora. "'I said the housekeeping was not comfortable.' "'It's exactly the same thing,' cried Dora, and she evidently thought so, for she wept most grievously. I took another turn across the room, full of love for my pretty wife, and distracted by self-accusatory inclinations to knock my head against the door. I sat down again and said, "'I am not blaming you, Dora. We have both a great deal to learn. I am only trying to show you, my dear, that you must, you really must,' I was resolved not to give this up, "'accustom yourself to look after Mary Ann, likewise to act a little for yourself and me.' "'I wonder I do at your making such ungrateful speeches,' sobbed Dora. "'When you know that the other day, when you said you would like a little bit of fish, "'I went out myself, miles and miles, and ordered it to surprise you.' "'And it was very kind of you, my own darling,' said I. "'I felt it so much that I wouldn't on any account have even mentioned "'that you bought a salmon, which was too much for two, "'or that it cost one pound six, which was more than we can afford.' "'You enjoyed it very much,' sobbed Dora, "'and you said I was a mouse.' "'And I'll say so again, my love,' I returned, "'a thousand times.' "'But I had wounded Dora's soft little heart, "'and she was not to be comforted. "'She was so pathetic in her sobbing and bewailing "'that I felt as if I had said I don't know what to hurt her. "'I was obliged to hurry away. "'I was kept out late, 
and I felt all night such pangs of remorse as made me miserable. I had the conscience of an assassin, and was haunted by a vague sense of enormous wickedness. It was two or three hours past midnight when I got home. I found my aunt in our house, sitting up for me. "'Is anything the matter, aunt?' said I, alarmed. "'Nothing, Trot,' she replied. "'Sit down, sit down. Little Blossom has been rather out of spirits, and I have been keeping her company. That's all.' I leaned my head upon my hand, and felt more sorry and downcast, as I sat looking at the fire, than I could have supposed possible so soon after the fulfillment of my brightest hopes. As I sat thinking, I happened to meet my aunt's eyes, which were resting on my face. There was an anxious expression in them, but it cleared directly. "'I assure you, aunt,' said I, "'I have been quite unhappy myself all night to think of Dora's being so. But I had no other intention than to speak to her tenderly and lovingly about our home affairs.' My aunt nodded encouragement. "'You must have patience, Trot,' said she. "'Of course. Heaven knows I don't mean to be unreasonable, aunt.' "'No, no,' said my aunt. "'But little Blossom is a very tender little Blossom, "'and the wind must be gentle with her.' "'I thanked my good aunt in my heart "'for her tenderness towards my wife, "'and I was sure that she knew I did. "'Don't you think, aunt,' said I, "'after some further contemplation of the fire, "'that you could advise and counsel Dora a little "'for our mutual advantage now and then?' "'Trot,' returned my aunt, with some emotion, "'no,' "'Don't ask me such a thing.' Her tone was so very earnest that I raised my eyes in surprise. "'I look back on my life, child,' said my aunt, "'and I think of some who are in their graves "'with whom I might have been on kinder terms. "'If I judged harshly of other people's mistakes in marriage, "'it may have been because I had bitter reason "'to judge harshly of my own. "'Let that pass. "'I have been a grumpy, frumpy, wayward sort of a woman "'a good many years.' I am still, and I always shall be. But you and I have done one another some good, Trot. At all events, you have done me good, my dear, and division must not come between us at this time of day. Division between us, cried I. Child, child, said my aunt, smoothing her dress, how soon it might come between us, or how unhappy I might make our little blossom if I meddled in anything, a prophet couldn't say. I want our pet to like me, and be as gay as a butterfly. Remember your own home in that second marriage, and never do both me and her the injury you have hinted at. I comprehended at once that my aunt was right, and I comprehended the full extent of her generous feeling toward my dear wife. These are early days, Trot, she pursued, and Rome was not built in a day, nor in a year. You have chosen freely for yourself— a cloud passed over her face for a moment, I thought. And you have chosen a very pretty and a very affectionate creature. It will be your duty, and it will be your pleasure, too. Of course I know that. I am not delivering a lecture. To estimate her, as you chose her, by the qualities she has, and not by the qualities she may not have. The latter you must develop in her, if you can. And if you cannot, child, here my aunt rubbed her nose, you must just accustom yourself to do without em. But remember, my dear, your future is between you two. No one can assist you. You are to work it out for yourselves. This is marriage, Trot, and heaven bless you both in it, for a pair of babes in the wood as you are. My aunt said this in a sprightly way, and gave me a kiss to ratify the blessing. Now, said she, light my little lantern and see me into my bandbox by the garden path for there was a communication between our cottages in that direction. Give Betsy Trotwood's love to Blossom when you come back, and whatever you do, Trot, never dream of setting Betsy up as a scarecrow, for if I ever saw her in the glass, she's quite grim enough and gaunt enough in her private capacity. With this my aunt tied her head up in a handkerchief, with which she was accustomed to make a bundle of it on such occasions, and I escorted her home. As she stood in her garden, holding up her little lantern to light me back, I thought her observation of me had an anxious air again, but I was too much occupied in pondering on what she had said, and too much impressed, for the first time, in reality, 
by the conviction that Dora and I had indeed to work out our future for ourselves, and that no one could assist us to take much notice of it. Dora came stealing down in her little slippers to meet me, now that I was alone, and cried upon my shoulder, and said I had been hard-hearted, and she had been naughty, and I said much the same thing in effect, I believe, and we made it up, and agreed that our first little difference was to be our last, and that we were never to have another if we lived a hundred years. The next domestic trial we went through was the ordeal of servants. Mary Ann's cousin deserted into our coal-hole, and was brought out, to our great amazement, by a piquet of his companions in arms, who took him away handcuffed in a procession that covered our front garden with ignominy. This nerved me to get rid of Mary Ann, who went so mildly on receipt of wages, that I was surprised, until I found out about the teaspoons, and also about the little sum she had borrowed in my name of the tradespeople, without authority. After an interval of Mrs. Kidgerberry, the oldest inhabitant of Kentish Town, I believe, who went out chairing, but was too feeble to execute her conceptions of that art, we found another treasure who was one of the most amiable of women, but who generally made a point of falling either up or down the kitchen stairs with the tray, and almost plunged into the parlour, as into a bath with the tea-things. The ravages committed by this unfortunate, rendering her dismissal necessary, she was succeeded, with intervals of Mrs. Kidgerberry, by a long line of incapables, terminating in a young person of genteel appearance, who went to Greenwich Fair in Dora's bonnet, after whom I remember nothing but an average equality of failure. Everybody we had anything to do with seemed to cheat us. Our appearance in a shop was a signal for the damaged goods to be brought out immediately. If we bought a lobster, it was full of water. All our meat turned out to be tough, and there was hardly any crust to our loaves. In search of the principle on which joints ought to be roasted, to be roasted enough, and not too much, I myself referred to the cookery book, and found it there established as the allowance of a quarter of an hour to every pound, and say a quarter over. But the principle always failed us by some curious fatality and we never could hit any medium between redness and cinders. I had reason to believe that in accomplishing these failures we incurred a far greater expense than if we had achieved a series of triumphs. It appeared to me, on looking over the tradesmen's books, as if we might have kept the basement story paved with butter, such was the extensive scale of our consumption of that article. I don't know whether the excise returns of the period may have exhibited any increase in the demand for pepper, but if our performances did not affect the market, I should say several families must have left off using it. And the most wonderful fact of all was that we never had anything in the house. As to the washerwoman pawning the clothes, and coming in a state of penitent intoxication to apologize, I suppose that might have happened several times to anybody. Also the chimney on fire, the parish engine, and perjury on the part of the beetle. But I apprehend that we were personally fortunate in engaging a servant with a taste for cordials, who swelled our running account for porter at the public house by such inexplicable items as quartern rum shrub, Mrs. C., half quartern gin and cloves, Mrs. C., glass, rum, and peppermint, Mrs. C., the parentheses always referring to Dora, who was supposed, it appeared on explanation, to have imbibed the whole of these refreshments. One of our first feats in the housekeeping way was a little dinner to Traddles. I met him in town, and asked him to walk out with me that afternoon. He readily consenting, I wrote to Dora, saying I would bring him home. It was pleasant weather, and on the road we made my domestic happiness the theme of conversation. Traddles was very full of it, and said that, picturing himself with such a home, and Sophie waiting and preparing for him, he could think of nothing wanting to complete his bliss. I could not have wished for a prettier little wife at the opposite end of the table, but I certainly could have wished, when we sat down, for a little more room. I did not know how it was, but though there were only two of us, we were at once always cramped for room, and yet had always room enough to lose everything in. I suspect it may have been because nothing had a place of its own, except Gyp's pagoda, which invariably blocked up the main thoroughfare. 
On the present occasion, Traddles was so hemmed in by the pagoda and the guitar case, and Dora's flower painting and my writing table, that I had serious doubts of the possibility of his using his knife and fork. But he protested with his own good humour, Oceans of room, Copperfield, I assure you, oceans. There was another thing I could have wished, namely that Jip had never been encouraged to walk about the tablecloth during dinner. I began to think there was something disorderly in his being there at all, even if he had not been in the habit of putting his foot in the salt or the melted butter. On this occasion he seemed to think he was introduced expressly to keep Traddles at bay, and he barked at my old friend, and made short runs at his plate, with such undaunted pertinacity that he may be said to have engrossed the conversation. However, as I knew how tender-hearted my dear Dora was, and how sensitive she would be to any slight upon her favourite, I hinted no objection. For similar reasons I made no allusion to the skirmishing plates upon the floor, or to the disreputable appearance of the casters, which were all at sixes and sevens, and looked drunk, or to the further blockade of traddles by wandering vegetable dishes and jugs. I could not help wondering in my own mind, as I contemplated the boiled leg of mutton before me, previous to carving it, how it came to pass that our joints of meat were of such extraordinary shapes, and whether our butcher contracted for all the deformed sheep that came into the world. But I kept my reflections to myself. "'My love,' said I to Dora, "'what have you got in that dish?' I could not imagine why Dora had been making tempting little faces at me, as if she wanted to kiss me. "'Oysters, dear,' said Dora, timidly. "'Was that your thought?' said I, delighted. Y "'Yes, Doady,' said Dora. "'There never was a happier one,' I exclaimed, laying down the carving-knife and fork. "'There is nothing Traddles likes so much.' Y "'Yes, Doady,' said Dora. "'And so I bought a beautiful little barrel of them, and the man said they were very good. "'But I, I am afraid there is something the matter with them. They don't seem right.' Here Dora shook her head, and diamonds twinkled in her eyes. "'They are only opened in both shells,' said I. "'Take the top one off, my love.' "'But it won't come off,' said Dora, trying very hard, and looking very much distressed. "'Do you know, Copperfield?' said Traddles, cheerfully examining the dish. "'I think it is in consequence.' They are capital oysters, but I think it is in consequence of their never having been opened. They never had been opened, and we had no oyster knives, and couldn't have used them if we had. So we looked at the oysters and ate the mutton. At least we ate as much of it as was done, and made up with capers. If I had permitted him, I am satisfied that Traddles would have made a perfect savage of himself, and eaten a plateful of raw meat, to express enjoyment of the repast." but I would hear of no such immolation on the altar of friendship, and we had a course of bacon instead, there happening by good fortune to be cold bacon in the larder. My poor little wife was in such affliction when she thought I should be annoyed, and in such a state of joy when she found I was not, that the discomfiture I had subdued very soon vanished, and we passed a happy evening, Dora sitting with her arm on my chair, while Traddles and I discussed a glass of wine, and taking every opportunity of whispering in my ear that it was so good of me not to be a cruel, cross old boy. By and by she made tea for us, which it was so pretty to see her do, as if she was busying herself with a set of doll's tea-things, that I was not particular about the quality of the beverage. Then Traddles and I played a game or two at cribbage, and Dora singing to the guitar the while, it seemed to me as if our courtship and marriage were a tender dream of mine, and the night when I first listened to her voice were not yet over. When Traddles went away, and I came back into the parlour from seeing him out, my wife planted her chair close to mine, and sat down by my side. "'I am very sorry,' she said. "'Will you try to teach me, Doty?" "'I must teach myself first, Dora,' said I. "'I am as bad as you, love.' "'Ah, but you can learn,' she returned, "'and you are a clever, clever man.' "'Nonsense, Mouse,' said I. "'I wish,' resumed my wife, after a long silence, "'that I could have gone down into the country for a whole year "'and lived with Agnes.' "'Her hands were clasped upon my shoulder, "'and her chin rested on them, and her blue eyes looked quietly into mine. 
"'Why so?' I asked. "'I think she might have improved me, and I think I might have learned from her,' said Dora. "'All in good time, my love. Agnes has had her father to take care of for these many years, you should remember. Even when she was quite a child, she was the Agnes whom we know,' said I. "'Will you call me a name I want you to call me?' inquired Dora, without moving. "'What is it?' I asked with a smile. "'It's a stupid name.' she said, shaking her curls for a moment. Child-wife. I laughingly asked my child-wife what her fancy was in desiring to be so called. She answered without moving, otherwise than as the arm I twined about her may have brought her blue eyes nearer to me. I don't mean, you silly fellow, that you should use the name instead of Dora. I only mean that you should think of me that way. When you are going to be angry with me, say to yourself, It's only my child-wife. When I am very disappointing, say, I knew a long time ago that she would make but a child-wife. When you miss what I should like to be, and I think can never be, say, Still my foolish child-wife loves me, for indeed I do. I had not been serious with her, having no idea until now that she was serious herself. But her affectionate nature was so happy in what I now said to her with my whole heart, that her face became a laughing one before her glittering eyes were dry. She was soon my child-wife indeed, sitting down on the floor outside the Chinese house, ringing all the little bells one after another to punish Jip for his recent bad behavior, while Jip lay blinking in the doorway with his head out, even too lazy to be teased. This appeal of Dora's made a strong impression on me. I look back on the time I write of. I invoke the innocent figure that I dearly loved to come out from the mists and shadows of the past and turn its gentle head towards me once again. And I can still declare that this one little speech was constantly in my memory. I may not have used it to the best account. I was young and inexperienced. But I never turned a deaf ear to its artless pleading. Dora told me, shortly afterwards, that she was going to be a wonderful housekeeper. Accordingly, she polished the tablets, pointed the pencil, bought an immense account book, carefully stitched up with a needle and thread all the leaves of the cookery book which Jip had torn, and made quite a desperate little attempt to be good, as she called it. But the figures had the old obstinate propensity. They would not add up. When she had entered two or three laborious items in the account book, Jip would walk over the page, wagging his tail, and smear them all out. Her own little right-hand middle finger got steeped to the very bone in ink, and I think that was the only decided result obtained. Sometimes of an evening, when I was at home and at work, for I wrote a good deal now, and was beginning in a small way to be known as a writer, I would lay down my pen and watch my child-wife trying to be good. First of all, she would bring out the immense account book and lay it down upon the table with a deep sigh. Then she would open it at the place where Jip had made it illegible last night, and call Jip up to look at his misdeeds. This would occasion a diversion in Jip's favor, and some inking of his nose, perhaps, as a penalty. Then she would tell Jip to lie down on the table instantly, like a lion, which was one of his tricks, though I cannot say the likeness was striking. And, if he were in an obedient humor, he would obey. Then she would take up a pen and begin to write, and find a hair in it. Then she would take up another pen, and begin to write, and find that it spluttered. Then she would take up another pen, and begin to write, and say in a low voice, Oh, it's a talking pen, and will disturb Doty. And then she would give it up as a bad job, and put the account book away, after pretending to crush the lion with it. Or, if she were in a very sedate and serious state of mind, she would sit down with the tablets and a little basket of bills and other documents, which looked more like curl papers than anything else, and endeavor to get some result out of them. After severely comparing one with another, and making entries on the tablets, and blotting them out, and counting all the fingers of her left hand over and over again, backwards and forwards, she would be so vexed and discouraged, and would look so unhappy, that it gave me pain to see her bright face clouded, and for me, and I would go softly to her and say, "'What's the matter, Dora?' Dora would look up hopelessly and reply, "'They won't come right.' They make my head ache so, and they won't do anything I want. Then I would say, Now let us try together. Let me show you, Dora. 
Then I would commence a practical demonstration, to which Dora would pay profound attention, perhaps for five minutes, when she would begin to be dreadfully tired, and would lighten the subject by curling my hair, or trying the effect of my face with my shirt collar turned down. If I tacitly checked this playfulness and persisted, she would look so scared and disconsolate, as she became more and more bewildered, that the remembrance of her natural gaiety when I first strayed into her path, and of her being my child-wife, would come reproachfully upon me, and I would lay the pencil down and call for the guitar. I had a great deal of work to do, and had many anxieties, but the same considerations made me keep them to myself. I am far from sure now that it was right to do this, but I did it for my child-wife's sake. I search my breast, and I commit its secrets, if I know them, without any reservation to this paper. The old unhappy loss or want of something had, I am conscious, some place in my heart, but not to the embitterment of my life. When I walked alone in the fine weather, and thought of the summer days when all the air had been filled with my boyish enchantment, I did miss something of the realization of my dreams, but I thought it was a softened glory of the past, which nothing could have thrown upon the present time. I did feel sometimes, for a little while, that I could have wished my wife had been my counsellor, had had more character and purpose to sustain me and improve me by, had been endowed with power to fill up the void which somewhere seemed to be about me but I felt as if this were an unearthly consummation of my happiness that had never been meant to be, and never could have been. I was a boyish husband as to years. I had known the softening influence of no other sorrows or experiences than those recorded in these leaves. If I did any wrong, as I may have done much, I did it in mistaken love, and in my want of wisdom. I write the exact truth. It would avail me nothing to extenuate it now." Thus it was that I took upon myself the toils and cares of our life, and had no partner in them. We lived much as before, in reference to our scrambling household arrangements, but I had got used to those, and Dora, I was pleased to see, was seldom vexed now. She was bright and cheerful in the old childish way, loved me dearly, and was happy with her old trifles. When the debates were heavy, I mean as to length, not quality, for in the last respect they were not often otherwise— and I went home late. Dora would never rest when she heard my footsteps, but would always come downstairs to meet me. When my evenings were unoccupied by the pursuit for which I had qualified myself with so much pains, and I was engaged in writing at home, she would sit quietly near me, however late the hour, and be so mute that I would often think she had dropped asleep. But generally, when I raised my head, I saw her blue eyes looking at me with the quiet attention of which I have already spoken." "'Oh, what a weary boy!' said Dora one night, when I met her eyes as I was shutting up my desk. "'What a weary girl!' said I. "'That's more to the purpose. You must go to bed another time, my love. It's far too late for you.' "'No, don't send me to bed,' pleaded Dora, coming to my side. "'Pray, don't do that.' Dora! To my amazement she was sobbing on my neck. "'Not well, my dear? Not happy?' "'Yes, quite well and very happy,' said Dora. "'But say you'll let me stop and see you write.' "'Why, what a sight for such bright eyes at midnight,' I replied. "'Are they bright, though?' returned Dora, laughing. "'I'm so glad they're bright.' "'Little vanity,' said I. "'But it was not vanity. "'It was only harmless delight in my admiration. "'I knew that very well before she told me so.' "'If you think them pretty, say I may always stop and see you write,' said Dora. "'Do you think them pretty?' "'Very pretty. "'Then let me always stop and see you write.' "'I am afraid that won't improve their brightness, Dora.' "'Yes, it will. "'Because, you clever boy, you'll not forget me then, "'while you are full of silent fancies. "'Will you mind it if I say something very, very silly, "'more than usual?' inquired Dora." peeping over my shoulder into my face. "'What wonderful thing is that?' said I. "'Please let me hold the pins,' said Dora. "'I want to have something to do with all those many hours when you are so industrious. May I hold the pins?' The remembrance of her pretty joy when I said yes brings tears into my eyes. 
The next time I sat down to write, and regularly afterwards, she sat in her old place, with a spare bundle of pens at her side. Her triumph in this connection with my work, and her delight when I wanted a new pen, which I very often feigned to do, suggested to me a new way of pleasing my child wife. I occasionally made a pretense of wanting a page or two of manuscript copied. Then Dora was in her glory. The preparations she made for this great work, the aprons she put on, the bibs she borrowed from the kitchen to keep off the ink, the time she took, the innumerable stoppages she made to have a laugh with Jip as if he understood it all, her conviction that her work was incomplete unless she signed her name at the end, and the way in which she would bring it to me, like a school copy, and then, when I praised it, clasped me round the neck, are touching recollections to me, simple as they might appear to other men. She took possession of the keys soon after this, and went jingling about the house with the whole bunch in a little basket, tied to her slender waist. I seldom found that the places to which they belonged were locked, or that they were of any use except as a plaything for Jip. But Dora was pleased, and that pleased me. She was quite satisfied that a good deal was affected by this make-belief of housekeeping, and was as merry as if we had been keeping a baby-house, for a joke. So we went on. Dora was hardly less affectionate to my aunt than to me, and often told her of the time when she was afraid she was a cross old thing. I never saw my aunt unbend more systematically to any one. She courted Jip, though Jip never responded, listened day after day to the guitar, though I am afraid she had no taste for music, never attacked the incapables, though the temptation must have been severe, went wonderful distances on foot to purchase, as surprises, any trifles that she found out Dora wanted, and she never came in by the garden, and missed her from the room, but she would call out, at the foot of the stairs, in a voice that sounded cheerfully all over the house, "'Where's little Blossom?' End of chapter 44Chapter 45 of David Copperfield. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Deborah Lynn. David Copperfield by Charles Dickens. Chapter 45 Mr. Dick Fulfills My Aunt's Predictions. It was some time now since I had left the doctor. Living in his neighbourhood I saw him frequently, and we all went to his house on two or three occasions to dinner or tea. The old soldier was in permanent quarters under the doctor's roof. She was exactly the same as ever, and the same immortal butterflies hovered over her cap. Like some other mothers whom I have known in the course of my life, Mrs. Markleham was far more fond of pleasure than her daughter was. She required a great deal of amusement, and like a deep old soldier pretended, in consulting her own inclinations, to be devoting herself to her child. The doctor's desire that Annie should be entertained was therefore particularly acceptable to this excellent parent, who expressed unqualified approval of his discretion. I have no doubt, indeed, that she probed the doctor's wound without knowing it. Meaning nothing but a certain matured frivolity and selfishness, not always inseparable from full-blown years, I think she confirmed him in his fear that he was a constraint upon his young wife, and that there was no congeniality of feeling between them, by so strongly commending his design of lightening the load of her life. "'My dear soul,' she said to him one day when I was present, "'you know there is no doubt it would be a little pokey for Annie to be always shut up here.' The doctor nodded his benevolent head. "'When she comes to her mother's age,' said Mrs. Markleham, with a flourish of her fan, "'then it'll be another thing. "'You might put me into a jail with genteel society and a rubber, "'and I should never care to come out. "'But I am not Annie, you know, and Annie is not her mother.' "'Surely, surely,' said the doctor. "'You are the best of creatures. "'No, I beg your pardon,' for the doctor made a gesture of deprecation. I must say before your face, as I always say behind your back, you are the best of creatures, but of course you don't, now do you, enter into the same pursuits and fancies as Annie. No, said the doctor in a sorrowful tone. No, of course not, retorted the old soldier. 
Take your dictionary, for example. What a useful work a dictionary is. What a necessary work. The meanings of words. Without Dr. Johnson or somebody of that sort, we might have been at this present moment calling an Italian iron a bedstead. But we can't expect a dictionary, especially when it's making, to interest Annie, can we? The doctor shook his head. "'And that's why I so much approve,' said Mrs. Markleham, tapping him on the shoulder with her shut-up fan, "'of your thoughtfulness. It shows that you don't expect, as many elderly people do expect, old heads on young shoulders. You have studied Annie's character, and you understand it. That's what I find so charming.' Even the calm and patient face of Dr. Strong expressed some little sense of pain, I thought, under the infliction of these compliments." "'Therefore, my dear doctor,' said the old soldier, giving him several affectionate taps, "'you may command me at all times and seasons. "'Now, do understand that I am entirely at your service. "'I am ready to go with Annie to operas, concerts, exhibitions, all kinds of places, "'and you shall never find that I am tired. "'Duty, my dear doctor, before every consideration in the universe.' "'She was as good as her word.' She was one of those people who can bear a great deal of pleasure, and she never flinched in her perseverance in the cause. She seldom got hold of the newspaper, which she settled herself down in the softest chair in the house to read through an eyeglass every day for two hours, but she found out something that she was certain Annie would like to see. It was in vain for Annie to protest that she was weary of such things. Her mother's remonstrance always was— "'Now, my dear Annie, I am sure you know better, and I must tell you, my love, "'that you are not making a proper return for the kindness of Dr. Strong.' "'This was usually said in the doctor's presence, "'and appeared to me to constitute Annie's principal inducement "'for withdrawing her objections when she made any. "'But in general she resigned herself to her mother, "'and went where the old soldier would. "'It rarely happened now that Mr. Malden accompanied them.' Sometimes my aunt and Dora were invited to do so, and accepted the invitation. Sometimes Dora only was asked. The time had been when I should have been uneasy in her going, but reflection on what had passed that former night in the doctor's study had made a change in my mistrust. I believed that the doctor was right, and I had no worse suspicions. My aunt rubbed her nose sometimes when she happened to be alone with me, and said she couldn't make it out. She wished they were happier. She didn't think our military friend, so she always called the old soldier, mended the matter at all. My aunt further expressed her opinion that if our military friend would cut off those butterflies and give them to the chimney sweepers for May Day, it would look like the beginning of something sensible on her part. But her abiding reliance was on Mr. Dick. That man had evidently an idea in his head, she said, and if he could only once pen it up into a corner, which was his great difficulty, he would distinguish himself in some extraordinary manner. Unconscious of this prediction, Mr. Dick continued to occupy precisely the same ground in reference to the doctor and to Mrs. Strong. He seemed neither to advance nor to recede. He appeared to have settled into his original foundation like a building, and I must confess that my faith in his ever moving was not much greater than if he had been a building. But one night, when I had been married some months, Mr. Dick put his head into the parlour, where I was riding alone, Dora having gone out with my aunt to take tea with the two little birds, and said, with a significant cough, "'You couldn't speak to me without inconveniencing yourself, Trotwood, I am afraid?' "'Certainly, Mr. Dick,' said I. "'Come in.' "'Trotwood,' said Mr. Dick, laying his finger on the side of his nose, after he had shaken hands with me, "'Before I sit down, I wish to make an observation. "'You know your aunt?' "'A little,' I replied. "'She is the most wonderful woman in the world, sir.' "'After the delivery of this communication, "'which he shot out of himself as if he were loaded with it, "'Mr. Dick sat down with greater gravity than usual and looked at me. "'Now, boy,' said Mr. Dick, "'I am going to put a question to you. "'As many as you please,' said I. "'What do you consider me, sir?' asked Mr. Dick, folding his arms. "'A dear old friend,' said I. "'Thank you, Trotwood,' returned Mr. Dick, laughing and reaching across in high glee to shake hands with me. "'But I mean, boy,' resuming his gravity, "'what do you consider me in this respect?' touching his forehead. "'I was puzzled how to answer, but he helped me with a word. 
"'Weak?' said Mr. Dick. "'Well,' I replied dubiously, "'rather so.' "'Exactly,' cried Mr. Dick, who seemed quite enchanted by my reply. "'That is, Trotwood, when they took some of the trouble out of you-know-whose head, and put it you-know-where, there was a—' Mr. Dick made his two hands revolve very fast about each other a great number of times, and then brought them into collision, and rolled them over and over one another to express confusion. "'There was that sort of thing done to me somehow, eh?' I nodded at him, and he nodded back again. "'In short, boy,' said Mr. Dick, dropping his voice to a whisper, "'I am simple.' I would have qualified that conclusion, but he stopped me. "'Yes, I am. She pretends I am not. She won't hear of it. But I am. I know I am. If she hadn't stood my friend, sir, I should have been shut up to lead a dismal life these many years. But I'll provide for her. I never spend the copying money. I put it in a box. I have made a will. I'll leave it all to her. She shall be rich, noble.' Mr. Dick took out his pocket-handkerchief and wiped his eyes. He then folded it up with great care, pressed it smooth between his two hands, put it in his pocket, and seemed to put my aunt away with it. "'Now you are a scholar, Trotwood,' said Mr. Dick. "'You are a fine scholar. You know what a learned man, what a great man the doctor is. You know what honour he has always done me. Not proud in his wisdom. Humble, humble, condescending even to poor Dick, who is simple and knows nothing.' I have sent his name up on a scrap of paper to the kite along the string when it has been in the sky among the larks. The kite has been glad to receive it, sir, and the sky has been brighter with it. I delighted him by saying, most heartily, that the doctor was deserving of our best respect and highest esteem. And his beautiful wife is a star, said Mr. Dick, a shining star. I have seen her shine, sir. But, bringing his chair nearer and laying one hand upon my knee, "'Clouds, sir, clouds.' I answered the solicitude which his face expressed by conveying the same expression into my own and shaking my head. "'What clouds?' said Mr. Dick. He looked so wistfully into my face and was so anxious to understand that I took great pains to answer him slowly and distinctly, as I might have entered on an explanation to a child. "'There is some unfortunate division between them,' I replied, some unhappy cause of separation, a secret. It may be inseparable from the discrepancy in their years. It may have grown up out of almost nothing. Mr. Dick, who had told off every sentence with a thoughtful nod, paused when I had done and sat considering, with his eyes upon my face and his hand upon my knee. "'Doctor not angry with her, Trotwood,' he said, after some time. "'No, devoted to her.' "'Then I have got it, boy,' said Mr. Dick." The sudden exultation with which he slapped me on the knee and leaned back in his chair, with his eyebrows lifted up as high as he could possibly lift them, made me think him farther out of his wits than ever. He became as suddenly grave again, and leaning forward as before said, first respectfully taking out his pocket-handkerchief, as if it really did represent my aunt, "'Most wonderful woman in the world, Trotwood! Why has she done nothing to set things right?' "'Too delicate and difficult a subject for such interference,' I replied. "'Fine scholar,' said Mr. Dick, touching me with his finger. "'Why has he done nothing?' "'For the same reason,' I returned. "'Then I have got it, boy,' said Mr. Dick, and he stood up before me more exultingly than before, nodding his head and striking himself repeatedly upon the breast, until one might have supposed that he had nearly nodded and struck all the breath out of his body.' "'A poor fellow with a craze, sir,' said Mr. Dick. "'A simpleton, a weak-minded person, present company, you know, striking himself again, "'may do what wonderful people may not do. "'I'll bring them together, boy. I'll try. "'They'll not blame me. They'll not object to me. "'They'll not mind what I do if it's wrong. "'I'm only Mr. Dick, and who minds Dick? "'Dick's nobody. Whoo!' "'He blew a slight contemptuous breath as if he blew himself away.' It was fortunate he had proceeded so far with his mystery, for we heard the coach stop at the little garden gate which brought my aunt and Dora home. "'Not a word, boy,' he pursued in a whisper. "'Leave all the blame with Dick, simple Dick, mad Dick. I have been thinking, sir, for some time that I was getting it, and now I have got it. After what you have said to me, I am sure I have got it. All right.' Not another word did Mr. Dick utter on the subject, but he made a very telegraph of himself for the next half-hour— 
for the great disturbance of my aunt's mind, to enjoin inviolable secrecy on me. To my surprise I heard no more about it for some two or three weeks, though I was sufficiently interested in the result of his endeavours, descrying a strange gleam of good sense, I say nothing of good feeling, for that he always exhibited, in the conclusion to which he had come. At last I began to believe that, in the flighty and unsettled state of his mind, he had either forgotten his intention or abandoned it. One fair evening, when Dora was not inclined to go out, my aunt and I strolled up to the doctor's cottage. It was autumn, when there were no debates to vex the evening air, and I remember how the leaves smelt like our garden at Blunderstone as we trod them underfoot, and how the old unhappy feeling seemed to go by on the sighing wind. It was twilight when we reached the cottage. Mrs. Strong was just coming out of the garden where Mr. Dick yet lingered, busy with his knife, helping the gardener to point some stakes. The doctor was engaged with someone in his study, but the visitor would be gone directly, Mrs. Strong said, and begged us to remain and see him. We went into the drawing-room with her and sat down by the darkening window. There was never any ceremony about the visits of such old friends and neighbours as we were. We had not sat here many minutes when Mrs. Markleham, who usually contrived to be in a fuss about something, came bustling in with her newspaper in her hand, and said, out of breath, "'My goodness gracious, Annie! Why didn't you tell me there was someone in the study?' "'My dear mamma," she quietly returned, "'how could I know that you desired the information?' "'Desired the information?' said Mrs. Markleham, sinking on the sofa. "'I never had such a turn in all my life!' "'Have you been to the study, then, Mamma? asked Annie. "'Been to the study, my dear,' she returned emphatically. "'Indeed I have. I came upon the amiable creature, if you'll imagine my feelings, Miss Trotwood and David, in the act of making his will.' Her daughter looked round from the window quickly. "'In the act, my dear Annie,' repeated Mrs. Markleham, spreading the newspaper on her lap like a tablecloth, and patting her hands upon it, "'of making his last will and testament.' the foresight and affection of the dear. I must tell you how it was. I really must, in justice to the darling, for he is nothing less. Tell you how it was. Perhaps you know, Miss Trotwood, that there is never a candle lighted in this house until one's eyes are literally falling out of one's head with being stretched to read the paper, and that there is not a chair in this house in which a paper can be what I call read, except one in the study. This took me to the study where I saw a light. I opened the door. In company with the dear doctor were two professional people, evidently connected with the law, and they were all three standing at the table, the darling doctor pen in hand. This simply expresses, then, said the doctor, Annie, my love, attend to the very words. This simply expresses, then, gentlemen, the confidence I have in Mrs. Strong, and gives her all unconditionally. One of the professional people replied, and gives her all unconditionally. Upon that, with the natural feelings of a mother, I said, "'Good God, I beg your pardon,' fell over the doorstep, and came away through the little back passage where the pantry is. Mrs. Strong opened the window and went out into the veranda, where she stood, leaning against a pillar. "'But now, isn't it, Miss Trotwood, isn't it, David, invigorating?' said Mrs. Markleham, mechanically following her with her eyes, "'to find a man at Dr. Strong's time of life, with the strength of mind to do this kind of thing? "'It only shows how right I was.' I said to Annie, when Dr. Strong paid a very flattering visit to myself, and made her the subject of a declaration and an offer, I said, My dear, there is no doubt whatever, in my opinion, with reference to a suitable provision for you, that Dr. Strong will do more than he binds himself to do. Here the bell rang, and we heard the sound of the visitors' feet as they went out. It's all over, no doubt, said the old soldier, after listening. The dear creature has signed, sealed, and delivered, and his mind's at rest— "'Well, it may be. What a mind! "'Annie, my love, I am going to the study with my paper, "'for I am a poor creature without news. "'Miss Trotwood, David, pray come and see the doctor.' "'I was conscious of Mr. Dix standing in the shadow of the room, "'shutting up his knife, when we accompanied her to the study, "'and of my aunt's rubbing her nose violently, by the way, "'as a mild vent for her intolerance of our military friend. "'But who got first into the study?' or how Mrs. Markleham settled herself in a moment in her easy-chair, or how my aunt and I came to be left together near the door, unless her eyes were quicker than mine and she held me back, I have forgotten if I ever knew. But this I know, 
that we saw the doctor before he saw us, sitting at his table among the folio volumes in which he delighted, resting his head calmly on his hand, that in the same moment we saw Mrs. Strong glide in, pale and trembling, that Mr. Dick supported her on his arm, that he laid his other hand upon the doctor's arm, causing him to look up with an abstracted air, that, as the doctor moved his head, his wife dropped down on one knee at his feet, and, with her hands imploringly lifted, fixed upon his face the memorable look I had never forgotten, that at this sight Mrs. Markleham dropped the newspaper, and stared more like a figurehead intended for a ship to be called the Astonishment than anything else I can think of. The gentleness of the doctor's manner and surprise, the dignity that mingled with the supplicating attitude of his wife, the amiable concern of Mr. Dick, and the earnestness with which my aunt said to herself, "'That man mad!' triumphantly expressive of the misery from which she had saved him, I see and hear rather than remember as I write about it. "'Doctor,' said Mr. Dick, "'what is it that's amiss? Look here!' "'Annie!' cried the doctor. "'Not at my feet, my dear.' "'Yes,' she said. "'I beg and pray that no one will leave the room. "'Oh, my husband and father, break this long silence. "'Let us both know what it is that has come between us.' "'Mrs. Markleham, by this time, recovering the power of speech, "'and seeming to swell with family pride and motherly indignation, "'here exclaimed, "'Annie, get up immediately, and don't disgrace everybody belonging to you "'by humbling yourself like that, unless you wish to see me go out of my mind on the spot.' Mamma returned Annie, waste no words on me, for my appeal is to my husband, and even you are nothing here. Nothing, exclaimed Mrs. Markleham. Me, nothing. The child has taken leave of her senses. Please to get me a glass of water. I was too attentive to the doctor and his wife to give any heed to this request, and it made no impression on anybody else. So Mrs. Markleham panted, stared, and fanned herself. Annie! said the doctor, tenderly taking her in his hands. "'My dear, if any unavoidable change has come in the sequence of time upon our married life, you are not to blame. The fault is mine, and only mine. There is no change in my affection, admiration, and respect. I wish to make you happy. I truly love and honour you. Rise, Annie, pray.' But she did not rise. After looking at him for a little while, she sank down closer to him, laid her arm across his knee, and, dropping her head upon it, said, "'If I have any friend here who can speak one word for me, or for my husband in this matter, if I have any friend here who can give a voice to any suspicion that my heart has sometimes whispered to me, if I have any friend here who honours my husband, or has ever cared for me, and has anything within his knowledge, no matter what it is, that may help to mediate between us, I implore that friend to speak.' There was a profound silence. After a few moments of painful hesitation, I broke the silence. "'Mrs. Strong,' I said, "'there is something within my knowledge which I have been earnestly entreated by Dr. Strong to conceal, and have concealed until to-night. But I believe the time has come when it would be mistaken faith and delicacy to conceal it any longer, and when your appeal absolves me from his injunction.' She turned her face towards me for a moment, and I knew that I was right. I could not have resisted its entreaty if the assurance that it gave me had been less convincing. "'Our future peace,' she said, "'may be in your hands. I trust it confidently to your not suppressing anything. I know beforehand that nothing you or any one can tell me will show my husband's noble heart in any other light than one. Howsoever it may seem to you to touch me, disregard that. I will speak for myself before him and before God afterwards.' Thus earnestly besought, I made no reference to the doctor for his permission, but without any other compromise of the truth than a little softening of the coarseness of Uriah Heep, related plainly what had passed in that same room that night. The staring of Mrs. Markleham during the whole narration, and the shrill, sharp interjections with which she occasionally interrupted it, defy description. When I had finished, Annie remained for some few moments silent, with her head bent down, as I have described. Then she took the doctor's hand—he was sitting in the same attitude as when we had entered the room—and pressed it to her breast and kissed it. Mr. Dick softly raised her, and she stood, when she began to speak, leaning on him and looking down upon her husband, from whom she never turned her eyes. 
"'All that has ever been in my mind since I was married,' she said, in a low, submissive, tender voice, "'I will lay bare before you. "'I could not live and have one reservation, knowing what I know now.' "'Nay, Annie,' said the doctor, mildly, "'I have never doubted you, my child. "'There is no need. "'Indeed, there is no need, my dear.' "'There is great need,' she answered in the same way, "'that I should open my whole heart before the soul of generosity and truth, "'whom year by year and day by day I have loved and venerated more and more, as heaven knows.' "'Willie!' interrupted Mrs. Markleham. "'If I have any discretion at all—' "'Which you haven't, you marplot,' observed my aunt in an indignant whisper. "'I must be permitted to observe that it cannot be requisite to enter into these details.' "'No one but my husband can judge of that, mamma," said Annie, without removing her eyes from his face, "'and he will hear me. "'If I say anything to give you pain, mamma, forgive me. "'I have borne pain first, often and long, myself.' "'Upon my word,' gasped Mrs. Markleham. "'When I was very young,' said Annie, "'quite a little child, "'my first associations with knowledge of any kind "'were inseparable from a patient friend and teacher.' the friend of my dead father, who was always dear to me. I can remember nothing that I know without remembering him. He stored my mind with its first treasures, and stamped his character upon them all. They never could have been, I think, as good as they have been to me, if I had taken them from any other hands. "'Makes her mother nothing!' exclaimed Mrs. Markleham. "'Not so, Mamma," said Annie. "'But I make him what he was. I must do that.' As I grew up, he occupied the same place still. I was proud of his interest, deeply, fondly, gratefully attached to him. I looked up to him, I can hardly describe how, as a father, as a guide, as one whose praise was different from all other praise, as one in whom I could have trusted and confided if I had doubted all the world. You know, Mamma, how young and inexperienced I was when you presented him before me, of a sudden, as a lover." "'I have mentioned the fact fifty times at least to everybody here,' said Mrs. Markleham. "'Then hold your tongue, for the Lord's sake, and don't mention it any more,' muttered my aunt. "'It was so great a change, so great a loss, I felt it at first, said Annie, still preserving the same look and tone, that I was agitated and distressed. I was but a girl, and when so great a change came in the character in which I had so long looked up to him, I think I was sorry.' "'but nothing could have made him what he used to be again, "'and I was proud that he should think me so worthy, "'and we were married.' "'At St. Alphage, Canterbury,' observed Mrs. Markleham. "'Confound the woman,' said my aunt. "'She won't be quiet.' "'I never thought,' proceeded Annie, with a heightened colour, "'of any worldly gain that my husband would bring to me. "'My young heart had no room in its homage "'for any such poor reference.' "'Mamma, forgive me when I say that it was you who first presented to my mind "'the thought that any one could wrong me, and wrong him, by such a cruel suspicion.' "'Me?' cried Mrs. Markleham. "'Ah, you to be sure,' observed my aunt, "'and you can't fan it away, my military friend.' "'It was the first unhappiness of my new life,' said Annie. "'It was the first occasion of every unhappy moment I have known. "'These moments have been more of late than I can count.' "'But not, my generous husband, not for the reason you suppose. "'For in my heart there is not a thought, a recollection, or a hope "'that any power could separate from you.' "'She raised her eyes and clasped her hands "'and looked as beautiful and true, I thought, as any spirit. "'The doctor looked on her henceforth as steadfastly as she on him. "'Mamma is blameless,' she went on, "'of having ever urged you for herself.' "'and she is blameless in intention every way, I am sure. "'But when I saw how many important claims were pressed upon you in my name, "'how you were traded on in my name, "'how generous you were, and how Mr. Wickfield, "'who had your welfare very much at heart, resented it, "'the first sense of my exposure to the mean suspicion "'that my tenderness was bought and sold to you, "'of all men on earth, "'fell upon me like unmerited disgrace "'in which I forced you to participate.' I cannot tell you what it was, Mamma cannot imagine what it was, to have this dread and trouble always on my mind, yet know in my own soul that on my marriage day I crowned the love and honour of my life. 
"'A specimen of the thanks one gets,' cried Mrs. Markleham in tears, "'for taking care of one's family. I wish I was a Turk.' "'I wish you were with all my heart, and in your native country,' said my aunt. "'It was at that time that Mamma was most solicitous about my cousin Malden. "'I had liked him,' she spoke softly, but without any hesitation, "'very much. We had been little lovers once.' If circumstances had not happened otherwise, I might have come to persuade myself that I really loved him, and might have married him, and been most wretched. There can be no disparity in marriage like unsuitability of mind and purpose. I pondered on those words, even while I was studiously attending to what followed, as if they had some particular interest, or some strange application that I could not divine. There can be no disparity in marriage like unsuitability of mind and purpose. No disparity in marriage like unsuitability of mind and purpose. There is nothing, said Annie, that we have in common. I have long found that there is nothing. If I were thankful to my husband for no more instead of for so much, I should be thankful to him for having saved me from the first mistaken impulse of my undisciplined heart. She stood quite still before the doctor and spoke with an earnestness that thrilled me, yet her voice was just as quiet as before. When he was waiting to be the object of your munificence, so freely bestowed for my sake, and when I was unhappy in the mercenary shape I was made to wear, I thought it would have become him better to have worked his own way on. I thought that if I had been he, I would have tried to do it, at the cost of almost any hardship. But I thought no worse of him until the night of his departure for India. That night I knew he had a false and thankless heart. I saw a double meaning then in Mr. Whitfield's scrutiny of me. I perceived for the first time the dark suspicion that shadowed my life. "'Suspicion, Annie,' said the doctor. "'No, no, no!' "'In your mind there was none, I know, my husband,' she returned. "'And when I came to you that night to lay down all my load of shame and grief, and knew that I had to tell that underneath your roof one of my own kindred, to whom you had been a benefactor, for the love of me, had spoken to me words that should have found no utterance, even if I had been the weak and mercenary wretch he thought me. My mind revolted from the taint the very tale conveyed. It died upon my lips, and from that hour till now has never passed them. Mrs. Markleham, with a short groan, leaned back in her easy chair, and retired behind her fan as if she were never coming out any more. I have never but in your presence interchanged a word with him from that time. "'then only when it has been necessary for the avoidance of this explanation. "'Years have passed since he knew from me what his situation here was. "'The kindnesses you have secretly done for his advancement, "'and then disclosed to me, for my surprise and pleasure, "'have been, you will believe, but aggravations of the unhappiness and burden of my secret.' "'She sunk down gently at the doctor's feet, though he did his utmost to prevent her, "'and said, looking up tearfully into his face, do not speak to me yet. Let me say a little more. Right or wrong, if this were to be done again, I think I should do just the same. You never can know what it was to be devoted to you with those old associations, to find that any one could be so hard as to suppose that the truth of my heart was bartered away, and to be surrounded by appearances confirming that belief. I was very young and had no adviser. Between Mamma and me, and all relating to you, there was a wide division." If I shrunk into myself, hiding the disrespect I had undergone, it was because I honoured you so much, and so much wished that you should honour me. "'Annie, my pure heart,' said the doctor, "'my dear girl, a little more, a very few words more. I used to think there were so many whom you might have married, who would not have brought such charge and trouble on you, and who would have made your home a worthier home.' I used to be afraid that I had better have remained your pupil, and almost your child. I used to fear that I was so unsuited to your learning and wisdom, if all this made me shrink within myself, as indeed it did, when I had that to tell, it was still because I honoured you so much, and hoped that you might one day honour me. "'That day has shown this long time, Annie,' said the doctor, "'and can have but one long night, my dear.' "'Another word.' I afterwards meant, steadfastly meant and purposed to myself, to bear the whole weight of knowing the unworthiness of one to whom you had been so good. And now a last word, dearest and best of friends. The cause of the late change in you, 
which I have seen with so much pain and sorrow, and have sometimes referred to my old apprehension, at other times to lingering suppositions nearer to the truth, has been made clear to-night, and by an accident I have also come to know to-night the full measure of your noble trust in me, even under that mistake. I do not hope that any love and duty I may render in return will ever make me worthy of your priceless confidence. But with all this knowledge fresh upon me, I can lift my eyes to this dear face, revered as a father's, loved as a husband's, sacred to me in my childhood as a friend's, and solemnly declare that in my lightest thought I have never wronged you, never wavered in the love and the fidelity I owe you. She had her arms around the doctor's neck, and he leant his head down over her, mingling his grey hair with her dark brown tresses. "'Oh, hold me to your heart, my husband. Never cast me out. Do not think or speak of disparity between us, for there is none, except in all my many imperfections. Every succeeding year I have known this better, as I have esteemed you more and more. Oh, take me to your heart, my husband, for my love was founded on a rock, and it endures.' In the silence that ensued, my aunt walked gravely up to Mr. Dick, without at all hurrying herself, and gave him a hug and a sounding kiss. And it was very fortunate, with a view to his credit, that she did so, for I am confident that I detected him at that moment in the act of making preparations to stand on one leg as an appropriate expression of delight. "'You are a very remarkable man, Dick,' said my aunt, with an air of unqualified approbation and never pretend to be anything else, for I know better. With that, my aunt pulled him by the sleeve and nodded to me, and we three stole quietly out of the room and came away. "'That's a settler for our military friend, at any rate,' said my aunt on the way home. "'I should sleep the better for that if there was nothing else to be glad of.' "'She was quite overcome, I am afraid,' said Mr. Dick, with great commiseration. "'What? Did you ever see a crocodile overcome?' inquired my aunt. "'I don't think I ever saw a crocodile,' returned Mr. Dick mildly. "'There never would have been anything the matter if it hadn't been for that old animal,' said my aunt, with strong emphasis. "'It's very much to be wished that some mothers would leave their daughters alone after marriage, and not be so violently affectionate. They seem to think the only return that can be made them for bringing an unfortunate young woman into the world—God bless my soul as if she asked to be brought or wanted to come—is full liberty to worry her out of it again.' "'What are you thinking of, Trot?' "'I was thinking of all that had been said. "'My mind was still running on some of the expressions used. "'There can be no disparity in marriage like unsuitability of mind and purpose. "'The first mistaken impulse of an undisciplined heart. "'My love was founded on a rock. "'But we were at home, and the trodden leaves were lying underfoot, "'and the autumn wind was blowing.' End of chapter 45「forty six of David Copperfield. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. David Copperfield by Charles Dickens Chapter 46 Intelligence I must have been married, if I may trust to my imperfect memory for dates, about a year or so, when one evening, as I was returning from a solitary walk, thinking of the book I was then writing, for my success had steadily increased with my steady application, and I was engaged at that time upon my first work of fiction, I came past Mrs. Steerforth's house. I had often passed it before during my residence in that neighbourhood, though never when I could choose another road. Howbeit, it did sometimes happen that it was not easy to find another without making a long circuit, and so I had passed that way upon the whole pretty often. I had never done more than glance at the house as I went by with a quickened step. It had been uniformly gloomy and dull. None of the best rooms abutted on the road, and the narrow, heavily framed, old-fashioned windows, never cheerful under any circumstances, looked very dismal, close shut, and with their blinds always drawn down. There was a covered way across a little paved court to an entrance that was never used, and there was one round staircase window, at odds with all the rest, and the only one unshaded by a blind, which had the same unoccupied blank look. 
I do not remember that I ever saw a light in all the house. If I had been a casual passer-by, I should have probably supposed that some childless person lay dead in it. If I had happily possessed no knowledge of the place, and had seen it often in that changeless state, I should have pleased my fancy with many ingenious speculations, I dare say. As it was, I thought as little of it as I might, but my mind could not go by it and leave it as my body did, and it usually awakened a long train of meditations. Coming before me on this particular evening that I mention, mingled with the childish recollections and later fancies, the ghosts of half-formed hopes, the broken shadows of disappointments dimly seen and understood, the blending of experience and imagination, incidental to the occupation with which my thoughts had been busy, it was more than commonly suggestive. I fell into a brown study as I walked on, and a voice at my side made me start. It was a woman's voice, too. I was not long in recollecting Mrs. Steerforth's little parlour-maid, who had formerly worn blue ribbons in her cap. She had taken them out now to adapt herself, I suppose, to the altered character of the house, and wore but one or two disconsolate bows of sober brown. "'If you please, sir, would you have the goodness to walk in and speak to Miss Dartle?' "'Has Miss Dartle sent you for me?' I inquired. "'Not to-night, sir, but it's just the same. Miss Dartle saw you pass a night or two ago, and I was to sit at work on the staircase, and when I saw you pass again, to ask you to step in and speak to her.' I turned back, and inquired of my conductor, as we went along, how Mrs. Steerforth was. She said her lady was but poorly, and kept her own room a good deal. When we arrived at the house, I was directed to Miss Dartle in the garden, and left to make my presence known to her myself. She was sitting on a seat at one end of a kind of terrace overlooking the great city. It was a sombre evening, with a lurid light in the sky, and as I saw the prospect scowling in the distance, with here and there some larger object starting up into the sullen glare, I fancied it was no inapt companion to the memory of this fierce woman. She saw me as I advanced, and rose for a moment to receive me. I thought her then still more colourless and thin than when I had seen her last, the flashing eyes still brighter, and the scar still plainer. Our meeting was not cordial. We had parted angrily on the last occasion, and there was an air of disdain about her which she took no pains to conceal. "'I am told you wish to speak to me, Miss Dartle,' said I, standing near her with my hand upon the back of the seat, and declining her gesture of invitation to sit down. "'If you please,' said she, "'pray, has this girl been found?' "'No.' "'And yet she has run away.' I saw her thin lips working while she looked at me, as if they were eager to load her with reproaches. "'Run away?' I repeated. "'Yes, from him,' she said with a laugh. "'If she is not found, perhaps she never will be found. She may be dead.' The vaunting cruelty with which she met my glance I never saw expressed in any other face that ever I have seen. "'To wish her dead,' said I, "'may be the kindest wish that one of her own sex could bestow upon her.' "'I am glad that time has softened you so much, Miss Dartle.' She condescended to make no reply, but turning on me with another scornful laugh, said, "'The friends of this excellent and much injured young lady are friends of yours. You are their champion, and assert their rights. Do you wish to know what is known of her?' "'Yes,' said I. She rose with an ill-favoured smile, and taking a few steps towards a wall of holly that was near at hand, dividing the lawn from a kitchen garden, said in a louder voice, "'Come here,' as if she were calling to some unclean beast. "'You will restrain any demonstrative championship or vengeance in this place, of course, Mr. Copperfield,' said she, looking over her shoulder at me with the same expression. I inclined my head without knowing what she meant, and she said, "'Come here,' again, and returned, followed by the respectable Mr. Littimer who, with undiminished respectability, made me a bow, and took up his position behind her. The air of wicked grace, of triumph, in which, strange to say, there was yet something feminine and alluring, with which she reclined upon the seat between us, and looked at me, was worthy of a cruel princess in a legend. "'Now,' said she, imperiously, without glancing at him, and touching the old wound as it throbbed, perhaps in this instance with pleasure rather than pain, "'Tell Mr. Copperfield about the flight.' "'Mr. James and myself, ma'am. "'Don't address yourself to me,' she interrupted with a frown. 
"'Mr. James and myself, sir.' "'Nor to me, if you please,' said I. Mr. Littimer, without being at all discomposed, signified by a slight obeisance that anything that was most agreeable to us was most agreeable to him, and began again. "'Mr. James and myself have been abroad with the young woman ever since she left Yarmouth under Mr. James's protection. We have been in a variety of places, and seen a deal of foreign country. We have been in France, Switzerland, Italy, in fact almost all parts.' He looked at the back of the seat, as if he were addressing himself to that, and softly played upon it with his hands, as if he were striking chords upon a dumb piano. Mr. James took quite uncommonly to the young woman, and was more settled for a length of time than I have known him to be since I have been in his service. The young woman was very improvable, and spoke the languages, and wouldn't have been known for the same country person. I noticed that she was much admired wherever we went." Miss Dartle put her hand upon her side. I saw him steal a glance at her and slightly smile to himself. Very much admired indeed the young woman was. What with her dress, what with the air and sun, what with being made so much of, what with this, that, and the other, her merits really attracted general notice. He made a short pause. Her eyes wandered restlessly over the distant prospect, and she bit her nether lip to stop that busy mouth. Taking his hands from the seat and placing one of them within the other as he settled himself on one leg, Mr. Littimer proceeded, with his eyes cast down and his respectable head a little advanced and a little on one side. The young woman went on in this manner for some time, being occasionally low in her spirits, until I think she began to weary Mr. James by giving way to her low spirits and tempers of that kind, and things were not so comfortable. Mr. James, he began to be restless again. The more restless he got, the worse she got, and I must say for myself that I had a very difficult time of it indeed between the two. Still, matters were patched up here and made good there, over and over again, and altogether lasted, I am sure, for a longer time than anybody could have expected. Recalling her eyes from the distance, she looked at me again now with her former air. Mr. Littimer, clearing his throat behind his hand with a respectable short cough, changed legs, and went on. At last, when there had been upon the whole a good many words and reproaches, Mr. James, he set off one morning from the neighbourhood of Naples, where we had a villa, the young woman being very partial to the sea, and, under pretence of coming back in a day or so, left it in charge with me to break it out that for the general happiness of all concerned he was, here an interruption of the short cough, gone. But Mr. James, I must say, certainly did behave extremely honourable, for he proposed that the young woman should marry a very respectable person, who was fully prepared to overlook the past, and who was, at least as good as anybody the young woman could have aspired to in a regular way, her connections being very common. He changed legs again, and wetted his lips. I was convinced that the scoundrel spoke of himself, and I saw my conviction reflected in Miss Dartle's face. This I also had it in charge to communicate. I was willing to do anything to relieve Mr. James from his difficulty, and to restore harmony between himself and an affectionate parent who has undergone so much on his account. Therefore I undertook the commission. The young woman's violence, when she came to, after I broke the fact of his departure, was beyond all expectations. She was quite mad, and had to be held by force— or if she couldn't have got to a knife, or got to the sea, she'd have beaten her head against the marble floor. Miss Dartle, leaning back upon the seat, with a light of exultation in her face, seemed almost to caress the sounds this fellow had uttered. "'But when I came to the second part of what had been entrusted to me,' said Mr. Littimer, rubbing his hands uneasily, which anybody might have supposed would have been, at all events, appreciated as a kind intention, then the young woman came out in her true colours. A more outrageous person I never did see. Her conduct was surprisingly bad. She had no more gratitude, no more feeling, no more patience, no more reason in her than a stock or a stone. If I hadn't been upon my guard, I am convinced she would have had my blood. "'I think the better of her for it,' said I indignantly. Mr. Littimer bent his head as much as to say, "'Indeed, sir, but you're young,' and resumed his narrative. It was necessary, in short, for a time, to take away everything nigh her that she could do herself or anybody else an injury with, and to shut her up close. Notwithstanding which, she got out in the night, forced the lattice of a window that I had nailed up myself, 
dropped on a vine that was trailed below, and never has been seen or heard of, to my knowledge, since. "'She is dead, perhaps,' said Miss Dartle, with a smile as if she could have spurned the body of the ruined girl. "'She may have drowned herself, miss,' returned Mr. Littimer, catching at an excuse for addressing himself to somebody. "'It's very possible. Or she may have had assistance from the boatmen and the boatmen's wives and children. Being given to low company, she was very much in the habit of talking to them on the beach, Miss Dartle, and sitting by their boats. I have known her do it when Mr. James has been away whole days. Mr. James was far from pleased to find out, once, that she had told the children she was a boatman's daughter, and that in her own country, long ago, she had roamed about the beach like them. "'Oh, Emily, unhappy beauty!' What a picture rose before me of her sitting on the far-off shore among the children like herself when she was innocent, listening to little voices such as might have called her mother had she been a poor man's wife, and to the great voice of the sea with its eternal nevermore. When it was clear that nothing could be done, Miss Dartle, did I tell you not to speak to me? she said with stern contempt. You spoke to me, miss, he replied. I beg your pardon, but it is my service to obey. "'Do your service,' she returned. "'Finish your story and go.' "'When it was clear,' he said, with infinite respectability and an obedient bow, "'that she was not to be found, I went to Mr. James at the place where it had been agreed that I should write to him, and informed him of what had occurred. Words passed between us in consequence, and I felt it due to my character to leave him. I could bear and have borne a great deal from Mr. James, but he insulted me too far. He hurt me.' Knowing the unfortunate difference between himself and his mother, and what her anxiety of mind was likely to be, I took the liberty of coming home to England, and relating, "'For money which I paid him,' said Miss Dartle to me, "'just so, ma'am, and relating what I knew. I am not aware,' said Mr. Littimer, after a moment's reflection, "'that there is anything else. I am at present out of employment, and should be happy to meet with a respectable situation.' Miss Dartle glanced at me as though she would inquire if there were anything that I desired to ask. As there was something which had occurred to my mind, I said in reply, "'I could wish to know from this creature—I could not bring myself to utter any more conciliatory word—whether they intercepted a letter that was written to her from home, or whether he supposes that she received it.' He remained calm and silent, with his eyes fixed on the ground, and the tip of every finger of his right hand delicately poised against the tip of every finger of his left. Miss Dartle turned her head disdainfully towards him. "'I beg your pardon, miss,' he said, awakening from his abstraction. "'But, however submissive to you, I have my position, though a servant. Mr. Copperfield and you, miss, are different people.' If Mr. Copperfield wishes to know anything from me, I take the liberty of reminding Mr. Copperfield that he can put a question to me. I have a character to maintain. After a momentary struggle with myself, I turned my eyes upon him and said, "'You have heard my question. Consider it addressed to yourself, if you choose. What answer do you make?' "'Sir,' he rejoined, with an occasional separation and reunion of those delicate tips, my answer must be qualified, because to betray Mr. James's confidence to his mother, and to betray it to you, are two different actions. It is not probable, I consider, that Mr. James would encourage the receipt of letters likely to increase low spirits and unpleasantness. But further than that, sir, I should wish to avoid going. "'Is that all?' inquired Miss Dartle of me. I indicated that I had nothing more to say. "'Except,' I added, as I saw him moving off, that I understand this fellow's part in the wicked story, and that, as I shall make it known to the honest man who has been her father from her childhood, I would recommend him to avoid going too much into public. He had stopped the moment I began, and had listened with his usual repose of manner. "'Thank you, sir, but you'll excuse me if I say, sir, that there are neither slaves nor slave-drivers in this country, and that people are not allowed to take the law into their own hands. If they do, it is more to their own peril, I believe, than to other people's. "'Consequently speaking, I am not at all afraid of going wherever I may wish, sir.' With that he made a polite bow, and with another to Miss Dartle, went away through the arch in the wall of holly by which he had come. Miss Dartle and I regarded each other for a little while in silence, her manner being exactly what it was when she had produced the man. "'He says besides,' she observed, with a slow curling of her lip, 
that his master, as he hears, is coasting Spain, and this done is a way to gratify his seafaring tastes till he is weary. But this is of no interest to you. Between these two proud persons, mother and son, there is a wider breach than before, and little hope of its healing, for they are one at heart, and time makes each more obstinate and imperious. Neither is this of any interest to you, but it introduces what I wish to say. This devil whom you make an angel of, I mean this low girl whom he picked out of the tide mud, with her black eyes full upon me and her passionate finger up, may be alive, for I believe some common things are hard to die. If she is, you will desire to have a pearl of such price found and taken care of. We desire that, too, that he may not by any chance be made her prey again. So far we are united in one interest, and that is why I, who would do her any mischief that so coarse a wretch is capable of feeling, have sent for you to hear what you have heard. I saw by the change in her face that some one was advancing behind me. It was Mrs. Steerforth, who gave me her hand more coldly than of yore, and with an augmentation of her former stateliness of manner, but still, I perceived, and I was touched by it, with an ineffaceable remembrance of my old love for her son. She was greatly altered. Her fine figure was far less upright, her handsome face was deeply marked, and her hair was almost white. But when she sat down on the seat she was a handsome lady still, and well I knew the bright eye with its lofty look that had been a light in my very dreams at school. "'Is Mr. Copperfield informed of everything, Rosa?' "'Yes.' "'And has he heard Littimer himself?' "'Yes, I have told him why you wished it.' "'You are a good girl. I have had some slight correspondence with your former friend, sir.' addressing me, but it has not restored his sense of duty or natural obligation. Therefore I have no other object in this than what Rosa has mentioned. If, by the course which may relieve the mind of the decent man you brought here, for whom I am sorry, I can say no more, my son may be saved from again falling into the snares of a designing enemy, well. She drew herself up and sat looking straight before her, far away. Madam, I said respectfully, I understand. I assure you I am in no danger of putting any strange construction on your motives. But I must say, even to you, having known this injured family from childhood, that if you suppose the girl, so deeply wronged, has not been cruelly deluded, and would not rather die a hundred deaths than take a cup of water from your son's hand now, you cherish a terrible mistake. "'Well, Rosa, well,' said Mrs. Steerforth, as the other was about to interpose, "'it is no matter. Let it be.' "'You are married, sir, I am told?' "'I answered that I had been some time married. "'And are doing well? "'I hear little in the quiet life I lead, "'but I understand you are beginning to be famous.' "'I have been very fortunate,' I said, "'and find my name connected with some praise. "'You have no mother?' in a softened voice. "'No.' "'It is a pity,' she returned. "'She would have been proud of you. "'Good night.' I took the hand she held out with a dignified, unbending air, and it was as calm in mine as if her breast had been at peace. Her pride could still its very pulses, it appeared, and draw the placid veil before her face, through which she sat looking straight before her on the far distance. As I moved away from them along the terrace, I could not help observing how steadily they both sat gazing on the prospect, and how it thickened and closed around them. Here and there some early lamps were seen to twinkle in the distant city, and in the eastern quarter of the sky the lurid light still hovered. But, from the greater part of the broad valley interposed, a mist was rising like a sea, which, mingling with the darkness, made it seem as if the gathering waters would encompass them. I have reason to remember this, and think of it with awe, for before I looked upon those two again a stormy sea had risen to their feet. Reflecting on what had been thus told me, I felt it right that it should be communicated to Mr. Peggotty. On the following evening I went into London in quest of him. He was always wandering about from place to place, with his one object of recovering his niece before him, but was more in London than elsewhere. Often and often now had I seen him in the dead of night, passing along the streets, searching among the few who loitered out of doors at those untimely hours, for what he dreaded to find. He kept a lodging over the little chandler's shop in Hungerford Market, which I have had occasion to mention more than once, and from which he first went forth upon his errand of mercy. Hither I directed my walk. 
On making inquiry for him, I learned from the people of the house that he had not gone out yet, and I should find him in his room upstairs. He was sitting reading by a window in which he kept a few plants. The room was very neat and orderly. I saw in a moment that it was always kept prepared for her reception, and that he never went out, but he thought it possible he might bring her home. He had not heard my tap at the door, and only raised his eyes when I laid my hand upon his shoulder. "'Master Davy, thank you, sir. Thank you hearty for this visit. Sit you down. You're kindly welcome, sir.' "'Mr. Peggotty,' said I, taking the chair he handed me, "'don't expect much. I have heard some news. "'Of Emily?' He put his hand in a nervous manner on his mouth, and turned pale as he fixed his eyes on mine. "'It gives no clue to where she is, but she is not with him.' He sat down, looking intently at me, and listened in profound silence to all I had to tell. I well remember the sense of dignity, beauty even, with which the patient gravity of his face impressed me, when, having gradually removed his eyes from mine, he sat looking downward, leaning his forehead on his hand. He offered no interruption, but remained throughout perfectly still. He seemed to pursue her figure through the narrative, and to let every other shape go by him as if it were nothing. When I had done, he shaded his face and continued silent. I looked out of the window for a little while, and occupied myself with the plants. "'How do you fare to feel about it, Master Davy?' he inquired at length. "'I think that she is living,' I replied. "'I don't know. Maybe the first shock was too rough, and in the wildness of her art, that there blew water, as she used to speak on. Could she have thought of that so many year, because it was to be her grave?' He said this, musing in a low, frightened voice, and walked across the little room. "'And yet,' he added, "'Master Davy, I have felt so sure as she was living. I have knowed, awake and sleeping, as it was so true that I should find her. I have been so led on by it, and held up by it, that I don't believe I can have been deceived. No, Emily's alive.' He put his hand down firmly on the table, and set his sunburnt face into a resolute expression. "'My niece Emily is alive, sir,' he said steadfastly. "'I don't know where it comes from or how tis, but I am told as she's alive.' He looked almost like a man inspired as he said it. I waited for a few moments until he could give me his undivided attention, and then proceeded to explain the precaution that, it had occurred to me last night, it would be wise to take. "'Now, my dear friend,' I began. "'Thank ye, thank ye, kind sir,' he said, grasping my hand in both of his. If she should make her way to London, which is likely, for where could she lose herself so readily as in this vast city, and what would she wish to do but lose and hide herself if she does not go home? And she won't go home, he interposed, shaking his head mournfully. If she had left of her own accord she might. Not as it was, sir. If she should come here, said I, I believe there is one person here more likely to discover her than any other in the world. Do you remember— Hear what I say with fortitude. Think of your great object. Do you remember Martha? Of our town? I needed no other answer than his face. Do you know that she is in London? I have seen her in the streets, he answered with a shiver. But you don't know, said I, that Emily was charitable to her with Ham's help long before she fled from home, nor that when we met one night and spoke together in the room yonder over the way, she listened at the door. "'Master Davy,' he replied in astonishment, "'that night when it snew so hard?' "'That night. I have never seen her since. I went back after parting from you to speak to her, but she was gone. I was unwilling to mention her to you then, and I am now. But she is the person of whom I speak, and with whom I think we should communicate. Do you understand?' "'Too well, sir,' he replied. We had sunk our voices almost to a whisper, and continued to speak in that tone. "'You say you have seen her. Do you think that you could find her? I could only hope to do so by chance.' "'I think, Master Davy, I know where to look. It is dark. Being together, shall we go out now and try to find her to-night?' He assented, and prepared to accompany me. Without appearing to observe what he was doing, I saw how carefully he adjusted the little room— put a candle ready, and the means of lighting it, arranged the bed, and finally took out of a drawer one of her dresses, 
I remember to have seen her wear it, neatly folded with some other garments and a bonnet which he placed upon a chair. He made no allusion to these clothes, neither did I. There they had been waiting for her many and many a night, no doubt. "'The time was, Master Davy,' he said, as we came downstairs, "'when I thought this girl Martha almost like the dirt underneath my Emily's feet. "'God forgive me, there's a difference now.' "'As we went along, partly to hold him in conversation, and partly to satisfy myself, "'I asked him about Ham. "'He said, almost in the same words as formerly, that Ham was just the same, "'wearing away his life with kinder no care no how for it, "'but never murmuring and liked by all.' I asked him what he thought Ham's state of mind was in reference to the cause of their misfortunes, whether he believed it was dangerous, what he supposed, for example, Ham would do if he and Steerforth ever should encounter. "'I don't know, sir,' he replied. "'I have thought of it oftentimes, but I can't awise myself of it, no matters.' I recalled to his remembrance the morning after her departure, when we were all three on the beach. "'Do you recollect,' said I, "'a certain wild way in which he looked out to sea "'and spoke about the end of it?' "'Sure I do,' said he. "'What do you suppose he meant?' "'Master Davy,' he replied, "'I've put the question to myself a more to times "'and never found no answer. "'And there's one curious thing, "'that, though he is so pleasant, "'I wouldn't fear to feel comfortable "'to try and get his mind upon it. He never said a word to me as warn't as dutiful as dutiful could be, and it ain't likely as he'd begin to speak any other ways now. But it's fur from being fleet water in his mind where them thoughts lays. It's deep, sir, and I can't see down. You are right, said I, and that has sometimes made me anxious. And me too, Master Davy, he rejoined. Even more so, I do assure you, than his venturesome ways, though both belongs to the alteration in him. I don't know as he'd do violence under any circumstances, but I hope as them two may be kept asunders. We had come through Temple Bar into the city. Conversing no more now, and walking at my side, he yielded himself up to the one aim of his devoted life, and went on with that hushed concentration of his faculties which would have made his figure solitary in a multitude. We were not far from Blackfriars Bridge when he turned his head and pointed to a solitary female figure flitting along the opposite side of the street. I knew it readily to be the figure that we sought. We crossed the road and were pressing on towards her, when it occurred to me that she might be more disposed to feel a woman's interest in the lost girl if we spoke to her in a quieter place, aloof from the crowd, and where we should be less observed. I advised my companion, therefore, that we should not address her yet, but follow her, consulting in this, likewise, an indistinct desire I had to know where she went. He acquiescing, we followed at a distance, never losing sight of her, but never caring to come very near, as she frequently looked about. Once she stopped to listen to a band of music, and then we stopped too. She went on a long way. Still we went on. It was evident, from the manner in which she held her course, that she was going to some fixed destination, and this, and her keeping in the busy streets— and, I suppose, the strange fascination and the secrecy and mystery of so following any one, made me adhere to my first purpose. At length she turned into a dull, dark street, where the noise and crowd were lost, and I said, We may speak to her now. And mending our pace, we went after her. End of chapter 46《Chapter 47 of David Copperfield》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michael Bradford.《David Copperfield by Charles Dickens》Chapter 47 Martha We were now down in Westminster. We had turned back to follow her, having encountered her coming towards us, and Westminster Abbey was the point at which she passed from the lights and noise of the leading streets. She proceeded so quickly, when she got free of the two currents of passengers setting towards and from the bridge, that between this and the advance she had of us when she struck off, we were in the narrow waterside street by Millbank before we came up with her. At that moment she crossed the road as if to avoid the footsteps that she heard so close behind, and without looking back passed on even more rapidly. 
A glimpse of the river through a dull gateway, where some wagons were housed for the night, seemed to arrest my feet. I touched my companion without speaking, and we both forbore to cross after her, and both followed on that opposite side of the way, keeping as quietly as we could in the shadow of the houses, but keeping very near her. There was, and is when I write, at the end of that low-lying street, a dilapidated little wooden building, probably an obsolete old ferry house. Its position is just at the point where the street ceases, and the road begins to lie between a row of houses and the river. As soon as she came here and saw the water, she stopped as if she had come to her destination, and presently went slowly along by the brink of the river, looking intently at it. All the way here I had supposed that she was going to some house. Indeed, I had vaguely entertained the hope that the house might be in some way associated with the lost girl. But that one dark glimpse of the river through the gateway had instinctively prepared me for her going no farther. The neighborhood was a dreary one at that time, as oppressive, sad, and solitary by night as any about London. There are neither wharves nor houses on the melancholy waste of road near the great blank prison. A sluggish ditch deposited its mud at the prison walls. Coarse grass and rank weeds straggled over all the marshy land in the vicinity. In one part, carcasses of houses, inauspiciously begun and never finished, rotted away. In another, the ground was cumbered with rusty iron monsters of steam boilers, wheels, cranks, pipes, furnaces, paddles, anchors, diving bells, windmill sails, and I know not what strange objects, accumulated by some spectacular and groveling in the dust, underneath which, having sunk into the soil of their own weight in wet weather, they had the appearance of vainly trying to hide themselves. The clank and glare of sundry fiery works upon the riverside arose by night to disturb everything except the heavy and unbroken smoke that poured out of their chimneys. Slimy gaps and causeways, winding among old wooden piles, with a sickly substance clinging to the latter, like green hair, and the rags of last year's handbills offering rewards for drowned men fluttering above high-water mark, led down through the ooze and slush to the ebb tide. There was a story that one of the pits dug for the dead at the time of the Great Plague was hereabout, and a blighting influence seemed to have proceeded from it over the whole place, or else it looked as if it had gradually decomposed into that nightmare condition, out of the overflowings of the polluted stream. As if she were a part of the refuse it had cast out, and left to corruption and decay, the girl we had followed strayed down to the river's brink, and stood in the midst of this night picture, lonely and still, looking at the water. There were some boats and barges astrand in the mud, and these enabled us to come within a few yards of her without being seen. I then signed Mr. Peggotty to remain where he was, and emerged from their shade to speak to her. I did not approach her solitary figure without trembling, for this gloomy end to her determined walk, and the way in which she stood, almost with the cavernous shadow of the iron bridge, looked at the lights crookedly reflected in the strong tide, inspired a dread with me. I think she was talking to herself. I am sure, although absorbed in gazing at the water, that her shawl was off her shoulders, and that she was muffled her hands in it. In an unsettled and bewildered way, more like the action of a sleepwalker than a waking person, I know and never can forget that there was that in her wild manner which gave me no assurance, but that she would sink before my eyes, until I had her arm within my grasp. At that moment I said, Martha! She uttered a terrified scream and struggled with me with such strength that I doubt if I could have held her alone, but a stronger hand than mine was laid upon her. And when she raised her frightened eyes and saw whose it was, she made but one more effort and dropped down between us. We carried her away from the water to where there were some dry stones, and there laid her down, crying and moaning. In a little while she sat among the stones, holding her wretched head with both her hands. "'Oh, the river!' she cried passionately. "'Oh, the river!' "'Hush, hush!' said I. "'Calm yourself!' But she still repeated the same words, continually exclaiming, Oh, the river, over and over again. I know it's like me, she exclaimed. I know that I belong to it. 
I know that it's the natural company of such as I am. It comes from country places, where there was once no harm in it, and it creeps through the dismal streets, defiled and miserable, and it goes away like my life to a great sea that is always troubled, and I feel that I must go with it. I would never know in what despair was, except in the tone of those words. I can't keep away from it. I can't forget it. It haunts me day and night. It's the only thing in all the world that I am fit for, or that's fit for me. Oh, the dreadful river! The thought passed through my mind that in the face of my companion, as he looked upon her without speech or motion, I might have read his niece's history, if I had known nothing of it. I never saw, in any painting or reality, horror and compassion so impressively blended. He shook as if he would have fallen, and his hand, I touched it with my own, for his appearance alarmed me, was deadly cold. She is in a state of frenzy, I whispered to him. She will speak differently in a little time. I don't know what he would have said in answer. He made some motion with his mouth, and seemed to think he had spoken, but he had only pointed to her with his outstretched hand. A new burst of crying came upon her now, in which she once more hid her face among the stones, and lay before us, a prostrate image of humiliation and ruin. Knowing that this state must pass, before he could speak to her with any hope, I ventured to restrain him when he would have raised her, and we stood by in silence until she became more tranquil. Martha, said I then, leaning down, and helping her to rise. She seemed to want to rise, as if with the intention of going away, but she was weak and leaned against a boat. Do you know who this is, who is with me? She said faintly, yes. Do you know we have followed you a long way tonight? She shook her head. She looked neither at him nor at me, but stood in a humble attitude, holding her bonnet and shawl in one hand, without appearing conscious of time, and pressing the other, clenched, against her forehead. Are you composed enough, said I, to speak on the subject which so interested you? I hope heaven may remember it, that snowy night. Her sobs broke out afresh, and she murmured some inarticulate thanks to me for not having driven her away from the door. I want to say nothing for myself, she said, after a few moments. I am bad. I am lost. I have no hope at all. But tell him, sir. She had shrunk away from him. If you don't feel too hard to me to do it, that I never was in any of the cause of this misfortune. It has never been attributed to you, I returned, earnestly responding to her earnestness. It was you. If I don't deceive myself, she said, in a broken voice, that came into the kitchen the night she took such pity on me, was so gentle to me, didn't shrink away from me like all the rest, and gave me such kind help. Was it you, sir? It was, said I. I should have been in the river long ago, she said, glancing at it with a terrible expression. If any wrong to her had been upon my mind, I never could have kept out of it a single winter's night if I had not been free of any share in that. The cause of her flight is too well understood, I said. You are innocent of any part in it. We thoroughly believe, we know. Oh, I might have been much better for her if I had a better heart, exclaimed the girl, with most forlorn regret. For she was always good to me. She never spoke a word to me but what was pleasant and right. It is likely I would try to make her what I am myself, knowing what I am myself so well. When I lost everything that makes life dear, the worst of all my thoughts was that I was parted for her ever for her. Mr. Peggotty, standing with one hand in the gunwale of the boat, and his eyes cast down, put his disengaged hand before his face. And when I heard what had happened before that snowy night, from some belonging to our town, cried Martha, the bitterest thought in all my mind was that people would remember she once kept company with me and would say I had corrupted her, when, heaven knows, I would have died to have brought back her good name. Long unused to any self-control, the piercing agony of her remorse and grief was terrible. To have died would not have been much, what can I say, 
I would have lived, she cried. I would have lived to be old in the wretched streets and to wander about, avoided in the dark, and to see the daybreak on the ghastly line of houses, and remember how the same sun used to shine into my room and wake me once. I would have done that to save her. Sinking on the stones, she took some in each hand and clenched them up, as if she would have ground them. She writhed into some new posture constantly, stiffening her arms, twisting them before her face, and then to shut out from her eyes the little light there was, and drooping her head as if it, it were heavy with insupportable recollections. "'Whatever shall I do?' she said, fighting thus with her despair. "'How can I go on as I am, a solitary curse to myself, a living disgrace to every one I come near?' Suddenly. She turned to my companion. Stamp upon me! Kill me! When she was your pride, you would have thought I had done her harm if I had brushed against her in the streets. You can't believe. Why should you? A syllable that comes out of my lips, it would be burning shame upon you, even now, if she and I exchanged a word. I don't complain. I don't say she and I were alike. I know there is a long, long way between us. I only say, with all my guilt and wretchedness upon my head, that I am grateful to her for my soul, and love her. Oh, don't think that all the power I had of loving anything is quite worn out. Throw me away, as all the world does. Kill me for being what I am, and having ever known her. But don't think that of me. He looked upon her, while she made his supplication in a wild, distracted manner. And when she was silent gently raised her. Martha, said Mr. Peggotty, God forbid as I should judge you. Forbid as I, of all men, should do that, my girl. You don't know half the change that's come in course of time upon me, when you think it likely. Well, he paused a moment, then went on, you don't understand how tis that this here gentleman and me has wished to speak to you. You don't understand what tis we has before us. Listen now. His influence upon her was complete. She stood, shrinkingly, before him, as if she were afraid to meet his eyes. But her passionate sorrow was quite hushed and mute. If you heard, said Mr. Peggotty, out of what passed between Master Davy and me the night when it snew so hard, you know it as I have been, we're not for to see my dear niece my dear niece he repeated steadily for she's more dear to me now martha than she was dear afore she put her hands before her face but otherwise remained quiet i have heard her tale said mr peggotty as you was early left fatherless and motherless with no friend for to take in a rough seafaring way their place maybe you can guess that if you'd had such a friend you'd have gotten to a way of being fond of him in course of time, and that my niece was kinder daughter-like to me. As she was silently trembling, he put a shawl carefully about her, taking it up from the ground for that purpose. Whereby, said he, I know, both that she would go to the world's furthest end with me, if she could once see me again, and that she would fly to the world's furthest end to keep off seeing me, for though she ain't no call to doubt my love, and doin't, and doin't, he repeated, with quiet assurance of the truth of what he said, there's shame steps in, and keeps betwixt us. I read, in every word of his plain, impressive way of delivering himself, new evidence of his having thought of this one topic in every feature it presented. According to our reckoning, he proceeded, Master Davies here, and mine, she is like one day to make her own poor solitary course to London. We believe, Master Davy, me, and all of us, that you are as innocent of, as everything that has befell her as the unborn child. You spoke of her being pleasant, kind, and gentle to you. Bless her. I knew she was. I knew she always was to all. You're thankful to her, and you love her. Keep us all you can to find her, and may heaven reward you. She looked at him hastily, and for the first time, as if she were doubtful of what he had said. Will you trust me? she asked, in a low voice of astonishment. 
"'Full and free,' said Mr. Peggotty. "'To speak her, if I should ever find her, shelter her, "'if I have any shelter to divide with her, "'and then without her knowledge come to you and bring you to her?' "'She asked hurriedly. "'We both replied together, "'Yes!' She lifted up her eyes and solemnly declared that she would devote herself to this task, fervently and faithfully, that she would never waver in it, never be diverted from it, never relinquish it, while there was any chance of hope. If she were not true to it, might, a, might the object she now had in life, which bound her to something devoid of evil in its passing away from her, leave her more forlorn and more despairing, if that were possible? than she had been upon the river's brink that night, and then might all help, human and divine, renounce her evermore. She did not raise her voice above her breath, or address us, but said this to the night sky, then stood profoundly quiet, looking at the gloomy water. We judged it expedient now to tell her all we knew, which I recounted at length. She listened with great attention, and with a face that often changed, but had the same purpose in all its varying expressions. It seemed as if her spirit were quite altered, and she could not be too quiet. She asked, when all was told, where we were to be communicated with, if occasion should arise. Under a dull lamp in the road, I wrote our two addresses on a leaf of my pocket-book, which I tore out and gave to her, and which she put in her poor bosom. I asked her where she lived herself. She said, after a pause, in no place long, it were better not to know. Mr. Peggotty suggested to me, in a whisper, what had already occurred to myself, and I took out my purse, but I could not prevail upon her to accept any money, nor could I exact any promise from her that she would do so at another time. I represented to her that Mr. Peggotty could not be called, for one in his condition, poor, and that the idea of engaging in this search, while depending on her own resources, shocked us both. She continued steadfast, in this particular his influence upon her was equally powerless with mine. She gratefully thanked him, but remained inexorable. "'There may be work to be got,' she said. "'I'll try.' "'At least take some assistance,' I returned, "'until you have tried.' "'I could not do what I have promised for money,' she replied. "'I could not take it. If I was starving, to give me money would be to take away your trust, to take away the object that you have given me, to take away from the only certain thing that saves me from the river. In the name of the great judge, said I, before whom you all of us must stand at his dread time, dismiss that terrible idea. We can all do some good if we will. She trembled, and her lips shook, and her face was paler as she answered. It has been put into your hearts, perhaps, to save a wretched creature for repentance. I am afraid to think so. It seems too bold. If any good should come of me, I might begin to hope, for nothing but harm has ever come of my deeds yet. I am to be trusted, for the first time in a long while, with my miserable life on account of what you have given me to try for. I know no more, and I can say no more. Again she repressed the tears that had begun to flow, and putting out her trembling hand and touching Mr. Peggotty, as if there was some healing virtue in him, went away along the desolate road. She had been ill, probably for a long time. I observed upon that closer opportunity of observation that she was worn and haggard, and that her sunken eyes expressed privation and endurance. We followed her at a short distance, our way lying in the same direction, until we came back into the lighted and populous streets. I had such implicit confidence in her declaration that I then put it to Mr. Peggotty whether it would not seem, in the onset, like distrusting her, to follow her any farther. He, being of the same mind, and equally reliant on her, we suffered her to take her own road, and took ours, which was toward Highgate. He accompanied me a good part of the way, and when we parted with a prayer for the success of this fresh effort, there was a new and thoughtful compassion in him that I was at no loss to interpret. It was midnight when I arrived at home. I had reached my own gate, and was standing listening for the deep bell of St. Paul's, 
the sound of which I thought had been borne towards me among the multitude of striking clocks, when I was rather surprised to see that the door of my aunt's cottage was open, and that a faint light in the entry was shining out across the road. Thinking that my aunt might have relapsed into one of her old alarms, and might be watching the progress of some imaginary conflagration in the distance, I went to speak to her. It was with very great surprise that I saw a man standing in her little garden. He had a glass and bottle in his hand, and was in the act of drinking. I stopped short among the thick foliage outside, for the moon was up now, though obscured, and I recognized the man who I had once supposed to be a delusion of Mr. Dick's, and had once encountered with my aunt in the streets of the city. He was eating as well as drinking, and seemed to eat with a hungry appetite. He seemed curious regarding this cottage, too, as if it were the first time he had seen it. After stooping to put the bottle on the ground, he looked up at the windows, and looked about, though with a covert and impatient air, as if he were anxious to be gone. The light in the passage was obscured for a moment, and my aunt came out. She was agitated, and told some money into his hand. I heard it chink. "'What's the use of this?' he demanded. "'I could spare no more,' returned my aunt. "'Then I can't go,' said he. "'Here, you may take it back.' "'You bad man,' returned my aunt, with great emotion. "'How can you use me so? "'But why do I ask? "'It is because you know how weak I am. "'What have I to do to free myself forever of your visits, "'but to abandon you to your deserts?' "'And why don't you abandon me to my deserts?' said he. "'You ask me why?' returned my aunt. "'What a heart you must have!' He stood moodily, rattling the money, and shaking his hand, until at length he said, "'Is this all you mean to give me, then?' "'It is all I can give you,' said my aunt. "'You know I have losses, and am poorer than I used to be. "'I have told you so. "'Having got it, why do you give me the pain of looking at you for another moment "'and seeing what you have become?' I have become shabby enough, if you mean that, he said. I lead the life of an owl. You stripped me of the greater part of all I ever had, said my aunt. You closed my heart against the whole world, years and years. You treated me falsely, ungratefully, and cruelly. Go and repent of it. Don't add new injuries to the long, long list of injuries you have done to me. Aye, he returned. It's all very fine. Well... I must do the best I can for the present, I suppose. In spite of himself, he appeared abashed by my aunt's indigent tears and came slouching out of the garden. Taking two or three steps as if I had just come up, I met him at the gate and went in as he came out. We eyed one another narrowly in passing and with no favor. Aunt, said I hurriedly, this man alarming you again? Let me speak to him. Who is he? Child, returned my aunt, taking my arm. Come in, and don't speak to me for ten minutes. We sat down in her little parlor. My aunt retired behind the round green fan of former days, which was screwed onto the back of a chair, and occasionally wiped her eyes for about a quarter of an hour. Then she came out and took a seat beside me. Trot, said my aunt calmly, it's my husband. Your husband, aunt? I thought he had been dead. Dead to me returned my aunt, but living. I sat in silent amazement. Betsy Trotwood don't look like a likely subject for the tender passion, said my aunt composedly. But the time was, Trot, when she believed in that man most entirely, when she loved him, Trot, right well, when there was no proof of attachment and affection that she would not have given him. He repaid her by breaking her fortune, and nearly breaking her heart. So she put all that sort of sentiment, once and forever, in a grave, and filled it up, and flattened it down. My dear good aunt, I left him, my aunt proceeded, laying her hand as usual on the back of mine, generously. I may say at the distance of time, Trot, that I left him generously. He had been so cruel to me that I might have effected a separation on easy terms for myself, but I did not. He soon made ducks and drakes of what I gave him, sank lower and lower, 
marries another woman, I believe, became an adventurer, a gambler, and a cheat. What he is now, you see. But he was a fine-looking man when I married him, said my aunt, with an echo of her old pride and admiration in her tone. And when I believed him, I was a fool, to be the soul of honor. She gave my hand a squeeze and shook her head. He is nothing to me now, Trot, less than nothing. But sooner than have him punished for his offenses, as he would be if he had fouled about in this country, I gave him more money than I can afford at intervals when he reappears to go away. I was a fool when I married him, and I am so far an incurable fool on that subject that for the sake of what I once believed him to be, I wouldn't have even the shadow of my idle fancy hardly dealt with. For I was in earnest, Trot, if ever a woman was. My aunt dismissed this matter with a heavy sigh and soothed her dress. There, my dear, she said. Now you know the beginning, middle, and end, and all about it. We won't mention the subject to one another any more. Neither, of course, will you mention it to anybody else. This is my grumpy, frumpy story, and we'll keep it to ourselves, Trot. End of chapter 47 Recording by Michael Bradford Chapter 48 of David Copperfield This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Robin Cotter, October 2007 David Copperfield by Charles Dickens Chapter 48 Domestic I labored hard at my book, without allowing it to interfere with the punctual discharge of my newspaper duties, and it came out and was very successful. I was not stunned by the praise which sounded in my ears, notwithstanding that I was keenly alive to it, and thought better of my own performance. I have little doubt than anybody else did. It has always been in my observation of human nature that a man who has any good reason to believe in himself never flourishes himself before the faces of other people, in order that they may believe in him. For this reason I retained my modesty in very self-respect, and the more praise I got, the more I tried to deserve. It is not my purpose in this record, though in all other essentials it is my written memory, to pursue the history of my own fictions. They express themselves, and I leave them to themselves. When I refer to them, incidentally, it is only as a part of my progress. Having some foundation for believing, by this time, that nature and accident had made me an author, I pursued my vocation with confidence. Without such assurance, I should certainly have left it alone, and bestowed my energy on some other endeavor. I should have tried to find out what nature and accident really had made me, and to be that, and nothing else. I had been writing, in the newspaper and elsewhere, so prosperously, that when my new success was achieved, I considered myself reasonably entitled to escape from the dreary debates. One joyful night, therefore, I noted down the music of the parliamentary bagpipes for the last time, and I have never heard it since, though I still recognize the old drone in the newspapers, without any substantial variation, except, perhaps, that there is more of it, all the live-long session. I now write of the time when I had been married, I suppose about a year and a half. After several varieties of experiment, we had given up the housekeeping as a bad job, the house kept itself, and we kept a page. The principal function of this retainer was to quarrel with the cook, in which respect he was a perfect Whittington, without his cat, or the remotest chance of being made Lord Mayor. He appears to me to have lived in a hail of saucepan lids. His whole existence was a scuffle. He would shriek for help on the most improper occasions, as when we had a little dinner party or a few friends in the evening, and would come tumbling out of the kitchen with iron missiles flying after him. We wanted to get rid of him, but he was very much attached to us and wouldn't go. 
He was a tearful boy, and broke into such deplorable lamentations when a cessation of our connection was hinted at, that we were obliged to keep him. He had no mother, no anything in the way of a relative that I could discover, except a sister, who fled to America the moment we had taken him off her hands, and he became quartered on us, like a horrible young changeling. He had a lively perception of his own unfortunate state, and was always rubbing his eyes with the sleeve of his jacket, or stooping to blow his nose on the extreme corner of a little pocket handkerchief, which he never would take completely out of his pocket, but always economized and secreted. This unlucky page, engaged in an evil hour, at six pounds ten per annum, was a source of continual trouble to me. I watched him as he grew, and he grew like scarlet beans, with painful apprehensions of the time when he would begin to shave, even of the days when he would be bald or grey. I saw no prospect of ever getting rid of him, and projecting myself into the future, used to think what an inconvenience he would be when he was an old man. I never expected anything less than this unfortunate's manner of getting me out of my difficulty. He stole Dora's watch, which, like everything else belonging to us, had no particular place of its own, and converting it into money, spent the produce, he was always a weak-minded boy, in incessantly riding up and down between London and Uxbridge outside the coach. He was taken to Bow Street, as well as I remember, on the completion of his fifteenth journey, when four and sixpence, and a second-hand fife, which he couldn't play, were found upon his person. The surprise and its consequences would have been much less disagreeable to me if he had not been penitent, but he was very penitent indeed, and in a peculiar way, not in the lump, but by installments. For example, the day after that, on which I was obliged to appear against him, he made certain revelations, touching a hamper in the cellar, which we believed to be full of wine, but which had nothing in it except bottles and corks. We supposed he had now eased his mind, and told the worst he knew of the cook. But a day or two afterwards his conscience sustained a new twinge, and he disclosed how she had a little girl, who, early every morning, took away our bread, and also how he himself had been suborned to maintain the milkman in coals. In two or three days more I was informed by the authorities of his having led to the discovery of sirloins of beef among the kitchen stuff and sheets in the rag-bag. A little while afterwards he broke out in an entirely new direction, and confessed to a knowledge of burglarious intentions as to our premises, on the part of the pot-boy, who was immediately taken up. I got to be so ashamed of being such a victim, that I would have given him any money to hold his tongue, or would have offered a round bribe for his being permitted to run away. It was an aggravating circumstance in the case that he had no idea of this, but conceived that he was making me amends in every new discovery, not to say heaping obligations on my head. At last I ran away myself, whenever I saw an emissary of the police approaching with some new intelligence, and lived a stealthy life until he was tried and ordered to be transported. Even then he couldn't be quiet, but was always writing us letters, and wanted so much to see Dora before he went away, that Dora went to visit him, and fainted when she found herself inside the iron bars. In short, I had no peace of my life until he was expatriated, and made, as I afterwards heard, a shepherd of, up the country, somewhere. I have no geographical idea where. All this led me into some serious reflections, and presented our mistakes in a new aspect, as I could not help communicating to Dora one evening, in spite of my tenderness for her. "'My love,' said I, "'it is very painful to me to think that our want of system and management involves not only ourselves, which we have got used to, but other people.' "'You have been silent for a long time, and now you are going to be cross,' said Dora. "'No, my dear, indeed. Let me explain to you what I mean.' "'I think I don't want to know,' said Dora. "'But I want you to know, my love. Put Jip down.' Dora put his nose to mine, and said, "'Boh!' to drive my seriousness away. But not succeeding, ordered him into his pagoda, and sat looking at me, with her hands folded, and a most resigned little expression of countenance. "'The fact is, my dear,' I began, "'there is contagion in us. We infect every one about us.' 
I might have gone on in this figurative manner if Dora's face had not admonished me that she was wondering with all her might whether I was going to propose any new kind of vaccination or other medical remedy for this unwholesome state of ours. Therefore I checked myself, and made my meaning plainer. "'It is not merely my pet,' said I, "'that we lose money and comfort, and even temper sometimes, by not learning to be more careful.' but that we incur the serious responsibility of spoiling every one who comes into our service, or has any dealings with us. I begin to be afraid that the fault is not entirely on one side, but that these people all turn out ill, because we don't turn out very well ourselves. "'Oh, what an accusation!' exclaimed Dora, opening her eyes wide. "'To say that you ever saw me take gold watches! Oh!' "'My dearest,' I remonstrated, "'don't talk preposterous nonsense. "'Who has made the least allusion to gold watches?' "'You did,' returned Dora. "'You know you did. "'You said I hadn't turned out well, and compared me to him.' "'To whom?' I asked. "'To the page,' sobbed Dora. "'Oh, you cruel fellow, to compare your affectionate wife to a transported page! "'Why didn't you tell me your opinion of me before we were married? "'Why didn't you say, you hard-hearted thing, "'that you were convinced I was worse than a transported page?' "'Oh, what a dreadful opinion to have of me! "'Oh, my goodness!' "'Now, Dora, my love,' I returned, "'gently trying to remove the handkerchief she pressed to her eyes, "'this is not only very ridiculous of you, but very wrong. "'In the first place, it's not true.' "'You always said he was a story-teller,' sobbed Dora, "'and now you say the same of me. "'Oh, what shall I do? What shall I do?' "'My darling girl,' I retorted, I really must entreat you to be reasonable, and listen to what I did say, and do say. My dear Dora, unless we learn to do our duty to those whom we employ, they will never learn to do their duty to us. I am afraid we present opportunities to people to do wrong, that never ought to be presented. Even if we were as lax as we are, in all our arrangements by choice, which we are not, even if we liked it, and found it agreeable to be so, which we don't, I am persuaded we should have no right to go on in this way. We are positively corrupting people. We are bound to think of that. I can't help thinking of it, Dora. It is a reflection I am unable to dismiss, and it sometimes makes me very uneasy. There, dear, that's all. Come now, don't be foolish. Dora would not allow me for a long time to remove the handkerchief. She sat sobbing and murmuring behind it, that if I was uneasy, why had I ever been married? Why hadn't, I said, even the day before we went to church, that I knew I should be uneasy, and I would rather not? If I couldn't bear her, why didn't I send her away to her aunts at Putney, or to Julia Mills in India? Julia would be glad to see her, and would not call her a transported page. Julia never had called her anything of the sort. In short, Dora was so afflicted, and so afflicted me by being in that condition, that I felt it was of no use repeating this kind of effort, though never so mildly, and I must take some other course. What other course was left to take? To form her mind? This was a common phrase of words, which had a fair and promising sound, and I resolved to form Dora's mind. I began immediately, when Dora was very childish, and I would have infinitely preferred to humour her. I tried to be grave, and disconcerted her, and myself, too. I talked to her on the subjects which occupied my thoughts, and I read Shakespeare to her, and fatigued her to the last degree. I accustomed myself to giving her, as it were, quite casually, little scraps of useful information, or sound opinion, and she started from them when I let them off, as if they had been crackers. No matter how incidentally or naturally I endeavoured to form my little wife's mind, I could not help seeing that she always had an instinctive perception of what I was about, and became a prey to the keenest apprehensions. In particular, it was clear to me that she thought Shakespeare a terrible fellow. The formation went on very slowly. I pressed Traddles into the service without his knowledge, and whenever he came to see us exploded my minds upon him for the edification of Dora at second hand. The amount of practical wisdom I bestowed upon Traddles in this manner was immense, and of the best quality, but it had no other effect upon Dora than to depress her spirits, and make her always nervous with the dread that it would be her turn next. 
I found myself in the condition of a schoolmaster, a trap, a pitfall, of always playing spider to Dora's fly, and always pouncing out of my hole to her infinite disturbance. Still, looking forward through this intermediate stage, to the time when there should be a perfect sympathy between Dora and me, and when I should have formed her mind to my entire satisfaction, I persevered, even for months. Finding at last, however, that although I had been all this time a very porcupine or hedgehog, bristling all over with determination, I had effected nothing. It began to occur to me that Dora's mind was already formed. On further consideration this appeared so likely that I abandoned my scheme, which had had a more promising appearance in words than in action, resolving henceforth to be satisfied with my child-wife, and to try to change her into nothing else by any process. I was heartily tired of being sagacious and prudent by myself, and of seeing my darling under restraint, so I bought a pretty pair of earrings for her, and a collar for Jip, and went home one day to make myself agreeable. Dora was delighted with the little presents, and kissed me joyfully, but there was a shadow between us, however slight, and I had made up my mind that it should not be there. If there must be such a shadow anywhere, I would keep it for the future in my own breast. I sat down by my wife on the sofa, and put the earrings in her ears, and then I told her that I feared we had not been quite as good company lately as we used to be, and that the fault was mine, which I sincerely felt, and which indeed it was. The truth is, Dora, my life, I said, I have been trying to be wise. And to make us wise, too, said Dora timidly. Haven't you, Doady? I nodded assent to the pretty inquiry of the raised eyebrows, and kissed the parted lips. It's of not a bit of use— said Dora, shaking her head, until the earrings rang again. "'You know what a little thing I am, and what I wanted you to call me from the first. If you can't do so, I am afraid you'll never like me. Are you sure you don't think, sometimes, it would have been better to have—' "'Done what, my dear?' For she made no effort to proceed. "'Nothing,' said Dora. "'Nothing,' I repeated. She put her arms round my neck, and laughed— and called herself by her favorite name of a goose, and hid her face on my shoulder, in such a profusion of curls, that it was quite a task to clear them away and see it. Don't I think it would have been better to have done nothing, than to have tried to form my little wife's mind? said I, laughing at myself. Is that the question? Yes, indeed, I do. Is that what you have been trying? cried Dora. Oh, what a shocking boy! But I shall never try any more said I, for I love her dearly, as she is. "'Without a story, really?' inquired Dora, creeping closer to me. "'Why should I seek to change?' said I. "'What has been so precious to me for so long? "'You never can show better than as your own natural self, my sweet Dora, "'and we'll try no conceited experiments, "'but go back to our old way and be happy.' "'And be happy,' returned Dora. "'Yes, all day.' "'And you won't mind things going a tiny morsel wrong sometimes?' "'No, no,' said I. "'We must do the best we can.' "'And you won't tell me any more that we make other people bad?' coaxed Dora. "'Will you? "'Because you know it's so dreadfully cross.' "'No, no,' said I. "'It's better for me to be stupid than uncomfortable, isn't it?' said Dora. "'Better to be naturally Dora than anything else in the world.' "'In the world!' "'Ah, Doty, it's a large place.' She shook her head, turned her delighted bright eyes up to mine, kissed me, broke into a merry laugh, and sprang away to put on Jip's new collar. So ended my last attempt to make any change in Dora. I had been unhappy in trying it. I could not endure my own solitary wisdom. I could not reconcile it with her former appeal to me as my child-wife. I resolved to do what I could, in a quiet way, to improve our proceedings myself, but I foresaw that my utmost would be very little, or I must degenerate into the spider again, and be forever lying in wait. And the shadow I have mentioned, that was not to be between us any more, but was to rest wholly on my own heart? How did that fall? The old unhappy feeling pervaded my life. It was deepened, if it were changed at all, but it was as undefined as ever— and addressed me like a strain of sorrowful music 
faintly heard in the night. I loved my wife dearly, and I was happy, but the happiness I had vaguely anticipated once was not the happiness I enjoyed, and there was always something wanting. In fulfillment of the compact I have made with myself to reflect my mind on this paper, I again examine it closely, and bring its secrets to the light. What I missed I still regarded, I always regarded, as something that had been a dream of my youthful fancy, that was incapable of realization, that I was now discovering to be so, with some natural pain, as all men did. But that it would have been better for me if my wife could have helped me more, and shared the many thoughts in which I had no partner, and that this might have been, I knew. Between these two irreconcilable conclusions, the one, that what I felt was general and unavoidable, the other, that it was particular to me, and might have been different, I balanced curiously, with no distinct sense of their opposition to each other. When I thought of the airy dreams of youth that are incapable of realization, I thought of the better state preceding manhood that I had outgrown, and then the contented days with Agnes in the dear old house arose before me like spectres of the dead that might have some renewal in another world, but never more could be reanimated here. Sometimes the speculation came into my thoughts. What might have happened, or what would have happened, if Dora and I had never known each other? But she was so incorporated with my existence that it was the idlest of all fancies, and would soon rise out of my reach and sight, like gossamer floating in the air. I always loved her. What I am describing slumbered and half awoke, and slept again in the innermost recesses of my mind. There was no evidence of it in me. I know of no influence it had in anything I said or did. I bore the weight of all our little cares, and all my projects. Dora held the pens, and we both felt that our shares were adjusted as the case required. She was truly fond of me, and proud of me, and when Agnes wrote a few earnest words in her letters to Dora, of the pride and interest with which my old friends heard of my growing reputation, and read my book as if they heard me speaking its contents. Dora read them out to me with tears of joy in her bright eyes, and said I was a dear, old, clever, famous boy. The first mistaken impulse of an undisciplined heart. Those words of Mrs. Strong's were constantly recurring to me, at this time, were almost always present to my mind. I awoke with them often in the night. I remember to have even read them in dreams, inscribed upon the walls of houses, for I knew now that my own heart was undisciplined when it first loved Dora, and that if it had been disciplined, it never could have felt, when we were married, what it had felt in its secret experience. There can be no disparity in marriage, like unsuitability of mind and purpose. Those words are remembered, too. I had endeavored to adapt Dora to myself, and found it impracticable. It remained for me to adapt myself to Dora, to share with her what I could be, and be happy, to bear on my own shoulders what I must, and be happy still. This was the discipline to which I tried to bring my heart. When I began to think, it made my second year much happier than my first, and, what was better still, made Dora's life all sunshine. But as that year wore on, Dora was not strong. I had hoped that lighter hands than mine would help to mould her character, and that a baby smile upon her breast might change my child wife to a woman. It was not to be. The spirit fluttered for a moment on the threshold of its little prison, and, unconscious of captivity, took wing. "'When I can run about again, as I used to do, Aunt,' said Dora, "'I shall make Jip race. He is getting quite slow and lazy.' "'I suspect, my dear,' said my aunt, quietly working by her side, "'he has a worse disorder than that.' age, Dora. "'Do you think he is old?' said Dora, astonished. "'Oh, how strange it seems that Jip should be old. "'It's a complaint we are all liable to, little one, as we get on in life,' said my aunt cheerfully. "'I don't feel more free from it than I used to be, I assure you.' "'But Jip,' said Dora, looking at him with compassion, "'even little Jip, oh, poor fellow. "'I dare say he'll last a long time yet, Blossom.' said my aunt, patting Dora on the cheek, as she leaned out of her coach to look at Jip, 
who responded by standing on his hind legs and balking himself in various asthmatic attempts to scramble up by the head and shoulders. He must have a piece of flannel in his house this winter, and I shouldn't wonder if he came out quite fresh again with the flowers in the spring. Bless the little dog! exclaimed my aunt. If he had as many lives as a cat, and was on the point of losing them all, he'd bark at me with his last breath, I believe. Dora had helped him up on the sofa, where he really was defying my aunt to such a furious extent that he couldn't keep straight, but barked himself sideways. The more my aunt looked at him, the more he reproached her, for she had lately taken to spectacles, and for some inscrutable reason he considered the glasses personal. Dora made him lie down by her, with a good deal of persuasion, and when he was quiet, drew one of his long ears through and through her hand, repeating thoughtfully, "'Even little Jip! Oh, poor fellow!' "'His lungs are good enough,' said my aunt gaily, "'and his dislikes are not at all feeble. He is a good many years before him, no doubt, but if you want a dog to race with little Blossom, he has lived too well for that, and I'll give you one.' "'Thank you, aunt,' said Dora faintly. "'But don't, please.' "'No,' said my aunt, taking off her spectacles. "'I couldn't have any other dog but Jip,' said Dora. "'It would be so unkind to Jip. "'Besides, I couldn't be such friends with any other dog but Jip, "'because he wouldn't have known me before I was married, "'and wouldn't have barked at Dodie when he first came to our house. "'I couldn't care for any other dog but Jip, I am afraid, aunt.' "'To be sure,' said my aunt, patting her cheek again. "'You are right.' "'You are not offended,' said Dora. "'Are you?' "'Why, what a sensitive pet it is!' cried my aunt, bending over her affectionately, to think that I could be offended. "'No, no, I didn't really think so,' returned Dora. "'But I am a little tired, and it made me silly for a moment. I am always a silly little thing, you know, but it made me more silly, to talk about Jip. He has known me in all that has happened to me. Haven't you, Jip?' and I couldn't bear to slight him, because he was a little altered. Could I, Jip? Jip nestled closer to his mistress, and lazily licked her hand. You are not so old, Jip, are you, that you'll leave your mistress yet? said Dora. We may keep one another company a little longer. My pretty Dora, when she came down to dinner on the ensuing Sunday, and was so glad to see old Traddles, who always dined with us on Sunday, we thought she would be running about as she used to do, in a few days. But they said, wait a few days more, and then, wait a few days more, and still she neither ran nor walked. She looked very pretty, and was very merry, but the little feet that used to be so nimble when they danced round Jip were dull and motionless. I began to carry her downstairs every morning, and upstairs every night. She would clasp me round the neck and laugh the while, as if I did it for a wager. Jip would bark and caper round us, and go on before, and look back on the landing, breathing short to see that we were coming. My aunt, the best and most cheerful of nurses, would trudge after us, a moving mass of shawls and pillows. Mr. Dick would not have relinquished his post of candle-bearer to anyone alive. Traddles would be often at the bottom of the staircase, looking on and taking charge of sportive messages from Dora to the dearest girl in the world. We made quite a gay procession of it, and my child-wife was the gayest there. But sometimes, when I took her up, and felt that she was lighter in my arms, a dead blank feeling came upon me, as if I were approaching to some frozen region yet unseen that numbed my life. I avoided the recognition of this feeling by any name, or by any communing with myself, until one night, when it was very strong upon me, and my aunt had left her with a parting cry of good night, little blossom. I sat down at my desk alone, and cried to think, oh, what a fatal name it was, and how the blossom withered in its bloom upon the tree. End of chapter 48 Chapter 49 of David Copperfield. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Vivian Bush. David Copperfield by Charles Dickens. Chapter 49 
I am involved in a mystery. I received one morning by the post the following letter, dated Canterbury, and addressed to me at Doctor's Commons, which I read with some surprise. My dear sir, circumstances beyond my individual control have, for a considerable lapse of time, effected a severance of that intimacy which, in the limited opportunities conceded to me, in the midst of my professional duties, of contemplating the scenes and events of the past, tinged by the prismatic cues of memory, has ever afforded me, as it ever must continue to afford, gratifying emotions of no common description. This fact, my dear sir, combined with the distinguished elevation to which your talents have raised you, deters me from presuming to aspire to the liberty of addressing the companion of my youth by the familiar appellation of Copperfield. It is sufficient to know that the name to which I do myself the honor to refer will ever be treasured among the monuments of our house. I allude to the archives connected with our former lodgers, preserved by Mrs. Micawber, with sentiments of personal esteem amounting to affection. It is not for one situated, through his original errors and a fortuitous combination of unpropitious events, as is the foundered bark, if he may be allowed to assume so maritime a denomination, who now takes up the pen to address you. It is not, I repeat, for one so circumstanced, to adopt the language of compliment or of congratulation. That he leaves to abler and to purer hands. If your more important avocation should admit of your ever tracing these imperfect characters thus far, which may be, or may not be, as circumstances arise, you will naturally inquire by what object I am influenced, then, in indicting the present missive. Allow me to say that I fully defer to the reasonable character of that inquiry, and proceed to develop it, premising that it is not an object of a pecuniary nature. Without more directly referring to any latent ability that may possibly exist on my part, of wielding the thunderbolt, or directing the devouring and avenging flame in any quarter, I may be permitted to observe, in passing, that my brightest visions are forever dispelled, that my peace is shattered, and my power of enjoyment destroyed, that my heart is no longer in the right place, and that I no more walk erect before my fellow man. The canker is in the flower. The cup is bitter to the brim. The worm is at his work, and will soon dispose of his victim. The sooner the better. But I will not digress. Placed in a mental position of peculiar painfulness, beyond the assuaging reach even of Mrs. Micawber's influence, though exercised in the tripartite character of woman, wife, and mother, it is my intention to fly from myself for a short period, and devote a respite of eight-and-forty hours to revisiting some metropolitan scenes of past enjoyment. Among other havens of domestic tranquillity and peace of mind, my feet will naturally tend towards the King's Bench Prison. In stating that I shall be, D.V., on the outside of the south wall of that place of incarceration on civil process, the day after to-morrow, at seven in the evening, precisely, my object in this epistolary communication is accomplished. I do not feel warranted in soliciting my former friend Mr. Copperfield, or my former friend Mr. Thomas Traddles of the Inner Temple, if that gentleman is still existent and forthcoming, to condescend to meet me, and renew, so far as may be, our past relations of the olden time. I confine myself to throwing out the observation that, at the hour and place I have indicated, may be found such ruined vestiges as yet remain, of a fallen tower, Wilkins Micawber. P.S. It may be advisable to superadd to the above the statement that Mrs. Micawber is not in confidential possession of my intentions. I read the letter over several times, making due allowance for Mr. Micawber's lofty style of composition, and for the extraordinary relish with which he sat down and wrote long letters on all possible and impossible occasions. I still believed that something important lay hidden at the bottom of this roundabout communication. I put it down to think about it and took it up again to read it once more, and was still pursuing it when Traddles found me in the height of my perplexity. "'My dear fellow,' said I, "'I never was better pleased to see you. You come to give me the benefit of your sober judgment at a most opportune time. I have received a very singular letter, Traddles, from Mr. Micawber.' "'No,' cried Traddles, "'you don't say so, and I have received one from Mrs. Micawber.' And with that, Traddles, who was flushed with walking, and whose hair, under the combined effects of exercise and excitement, stood on end as if he saw a cheerful ghost, produced his letter, and made an exchange with me. 
I watched him into the heart of Mr. Micawber's letter, and returned the elevation of eyebrows with which he said, wielding the thunderbolt, or directing the devouring and avenging flame, Bless me, Copperfield! And then entered on to the perusal of Mrs. Micawber's epistle. It ran thus. My best regards to Mr. Thomas Traddles, and if he should still remember one who formerly had the happiness of being well acquainted with him, may I beg a few moments of his leisure time. I assure Mr. T.T. T. that I would not intrude upon his kindness, were I in any other position than on the confines of distraction. Though harrowing to myself to mention, the alienation of Mr. Micawber, formerly so domesticated, from his wife and family, is the cause of my addressing my unhappy appeal to Mr. Traddles, and soliciting his best indulgence. Mr. T. can form no adequate idea of the change in Mr. Micawber's conduct, of his wildness, of his violence. It is gradually augmented, until it assumes the appearance of aberration of intellect. Scarcely a day passes, I assure Mr. Traddles, on which some paroxysm does not take place. Mr. T. will not require me to depict my feelings, when I inform him that I have become accustomed to hear Mr. Micawber assert that he has sold himself to the D. Mystery and secrecy have long been his principal characteristic, have long replaced unlimited confidence. The slightest provocation, even being asked if there is anything he would prefer for dinner, causes him to express a wish for a separation. Last night, on being childishly solicited for twopence, to buy lemon stunners, a local sweetmeat, he presented an oyster-knife at the twins. I entreat Mr. Traddles to bear with me in entering into these details. Without them, Mr. T. would indeed find it difficult to form the faintest conception of my heart-rending situation. May I now venture to confide to Mr. T. the purport of my letter? Will he now allow me to throw myself on his friendly consideration? Oh, yes, for I know his heart. The quick eye of affection is not easily blinded, when of the female sex. Mr. Micawber is going to London. Though he studiously concealed his hand, this morning before breakfast, in writing the direction card which he attached to the little brown valise of happier days, the eagle glance of matrimonial anxiety detected, D.O.N., distinctly traced. The West End destination of the coach is the Golden Cross. Dare I fervently implore Mr. T. to see my misguided husband, and to reason with him? Dare I ask Mr. T. to endeavour to step in between Mr. Micawber and his agonised family? Oh, no, for that would be too much. If Mr. Copperfield should yet remember one unknown to fame, will Mr. T. take charge of my unalterable regards and similar entreaties? In any case, he will have the benevolence to consider this communication strictly private, and on no account whatever to be alluded to, however distantly, in the presence of Mr. Micawber. If Mr. T. should ever reply to it, which I cannot but feel to be most improbable, a letter addressed to M. E., Post Office, Canterbury, will be fraught with less painful consequences than any addressed immediately to one who subscribes herself in extreme distress, Mr. Thomas Traddle's respectful friend and suppliant, Emma Micawber. "'What do you think of that letter?' said Traddles, casting his eyes upon me, when I had read it twice. "'What do you think of the other?' said I, for he was still reading it with knitted brows." "'I think that the two together, Copperfield,' replied Traddles, "'mean more than Mr. and Mrs. Micawber usually mean in their correspondence. "'But I don't know what. "'They are both written in good faith, I have no doubt, and without any collusion. "'Poor thing,' he was now alluding to Mrs. Micawber's letter, "'and we were standing side by side comparing the two. "'It will be a charity to write to her, at all events, "'and tell her that we will not fail to see Mr. Micawber.' I acceded to this the more readily, because I now reproached myself with having treated her former letter rather lightly. It had set me thinking a good deal at the time, as I have mentioned in its place, but my absorption in my own affairs, my experience of the family, and my hearing nothing more, had gradually ended in my dismissing the subject. I had often thought of the Micawbers, but chiefly to wonder what pecuniary liabilities they were establishing in Canterbury, and to recall how shy Mr. Micawber was of me when he became clerk to Uriah Heep. However, I now wrote a comforting letter to Mrs. Micawber, in our joint names, and we both signed it. As we walked into town to post it, Traddles and I held a long conference, and launched into a number of speculations, which I need not repeat. We took my aunt into our councils in the afternoon, but our only decided conclusion was that we would be very punctual in keeping Mr. Micawber's appointment. Although we appeared at the stipulated place a quarter of an hour before the time, we found Mr. Micawber already there. He was standing with his arms folded, over against the wall, looking at the spikes on the top, 
with a sentimental expression, as if they were the interlacing boughs of trees that had shaded him in his youth. When we accosted him, his manner was something more confused, and something less genteel than of yore. He had relinquished his legal suit of black for the purposes of this excursion, and wore the old shirt out in tights, but not quite with the old air. He gradually picked up more and more of it as we conversed with him, but his very eyeglass seemed to hang less easily, and his shirt-collar, though still of the old formidable dimensions, rather drooped. "'Gentlemen,' said Mr. Micawber, after the first salutations, "'you are friends in need, and friends indeed. Allow me to offer my inquiries with reference to the physical welfare of Mrs. Copperfield and Essay, and Mrs. Traddles and Posse, presuming, that is to say, that my friend Mr. Traddles is not yet united to the object of his affections, for weal and for woe. We acknowledged his politeness and made suitable replies. He then directed our attention to the wall, and was beginning, I assure you, gentlemen, when I ventured to object to that ceremonious form of address, and to beg that he would speak to us in the old way. My dear Copperfield, he returned, pressing my hand, your cordiality overpowers me. This reception of a shattered fragment of the temple once called man, if I may be permitted to so express myself, bespeaks a heart that is an honor to our common nature. I was about to observe that I again behold the serene spot where some of the happiest hours of my existence fleeted by. Made so, I am sure, by Mrs. Micawber, said I. I hope she is well. Thank you, returned Mr. Micawber, whose face clouded at this reference. She is but so-so. And this, said Mr. Micawber, nodding his head sorrowfully, is the bench, where, for the first time in many revolving years, the overwhelming pressure of pecuniary liabilities was not proclaimed, from day to day, by importunate voices declining to vacate the passage, and where there was no knocker on the door for any creditor to appeal to, where personal service of process was not required, and detainees were merely lodged at the gate. "'Gentlemen,' said Mr. Micawber, "'when the shadow of that ironwork on the summit of the brick structure has been reflected on the gravel of the parade, I have seen my children thread the mazes of the intricate pattern, avoiding the dark marks. I have been familiar with every stone in the place. If I betray weakness, you will know how to excuse me.' "'We have all gone on in life since then, Mr. Micawber,' said I. "'Mr. Copperfield,' returned Mr. Micawber bitterly, when I was an inmate of that retreat, I could look at my fellow man in the face, and punch his head if he offended me. My fellow man and myself are no longer on those glorious terms. Turning from the building in a downcast manner, Mr. Micawber accepted my proffered arm on one side, and the proffered arm of Traddles on the other, and walked away between us. There are some landmarks, observed Mr. Micawber, looking fondly back over his shoulder, on the road to the tomb, which but for the impiety of the aspiration— a man would wish never to have passed. Such is the bench in my checkered career. "'Oh, you were in low spirits, Mr. Micawber,' said Traddles. "'I am, sir,' interposed Mr. Micawber. "'I hope,' said Traddles, "'it is not because you have conceived a dislike to the law. "'For I am a lawyer myself, you know.' Mr. Micawber answered not a word. "'How is our friend Heap, Mr. Micawber?' said I, after a silence." "'My dear Copperfield,' returned Mr. Micawber, bursting into a state of much excitement and turning pale, "'if you ask after my employer as your friend, I am sorry for it. "'If you ask after him as my friend, I sardonically smile at it. "'In whatever capacity you ask after my employer, I beg, without offence to you, "'to limit my reply to this, that whatever his state of health may be, "'his appearance is foxy, not to stay diabolical.' You will allow me, as a private individual, to decline pursuing a subject which has lashed me to the utmost verge of desperation in my professional capacity. I expressed my regret for having innocently touched upon a theme that roused him so much. May I ask, said I, without any hazard of repeating the mistake, how my old friends Mr. and Miss Wickfield are? Miss Wickfield, said Mr. Micawber, now turning red, is, as she always is, a pattern and a bright example. My dear Copperfield, she is the only starry spot in a miserable existence. My respect for that young lady, my admiration of her character, my devotion to her for her love and truth and goodness. Take me, said Mr. Micawber, down a turning, for upon my soul, in my present state of mind, I am not equal to this. We wheeled him off into a narrow street, where he took out his pocket-handkerchief, and stood with his back to a wall. If I looked as gravely at him as Traddles did, he must have found our company by no means inspiriting. "'It is my fate,' said Mr. Micawber, unfeigningly sobbing, but doing even that, 
with a shadow of the old expression of doing something genteel. It is my fate, gentlemen, that the finer feelings of our nature have become reproaches to me. My homage to Miss Wickfield is a flight of arrows in my bosom. You had better leave me, if you please, to walk the earth as a vagabond. The worm will settle my business in double-quick time. Without attending to this invocation, we stood by, until he put up his pocket-handkerchief, pulled up his shirt-collar, and to delude any person in the neighborhood who might have been observing him, hummed a tune with his hat very much on one side. I then mentioned, not knowing what might be lost if we lost sight of him yet, that it would give me great pleasure to introduce him to my aunt, if he would ride out to Highgate, where a bed was at his service. "'You shall make us a glass of your own punch, Mr. Micawber," said I, "'and forget whatever you have on your mind, in pleasanter reminiscences. "'Or, if confiding anything to friends will be more likely to relieve you, "'you shall impart it to us, Mr. Micawber," said Traddles, prudently. "'Gentlemen,' returned Mr. Micawber, "'do with me as you will. "'I am a straw upon the surface of the deep, "'and am tossed in all directions by the elephants. "'I beg your pardon. "'I should have said the elements.' "'We walked on, arm in arm, again.' found the coach in the act of starting, and arrived at Highgate without encountering any difficulties by the way. I was very uneasy and very uncertain in my mind what to say or do for the best. So was Traddles, evidently. Mr. Micawber was for the most part plunged into deep gloom. He occasionally made an attempt to smarten himself, and hum the fag end of a tune, but his relapses into profound melancholy were only made the more impressive by the mockery of a hat exceedingly on one side, and a shirt-collar pulled up to his eyes. We went to my aunt's house rather than to mine, because of Dora's not being well. My aunt presented herself on being sent for, and welcomed Mr. Micawber with gracious cordiality. Mr. Micawber kissed her hand, retired to the window, and pulling out his pocket-handkerchief, had a mental wrestle with himself. Mr. Dick was at home. He was by nature so exceedingly compassionate of any one who seemed to be ill at ease, and was so quick to find any such person out, that he shook hands with Mr. Micawber at least half a dozen times in five minutes. To Mr. Micawber, in his trouble, this warmth on the part of a stranger was so extremely touching that he could only say, on the occasion of each successive shake, "'My dear sir, you overpower me,' which gratified Mr. Dick so much that he went at it again with greater vigor than before." "'The friendliness of this gentleman,' said Mr. Micawber to my aunt, "'if you will allow me, ma'am, to cull a figure of speech "'from the vocabulary of our coarser national sports, floors me. "'To a man who is struggling with a complicated burden of perplexity and disquiet, "'such a reception is trying, I assure you.' "'My friend Mr. Dick,' replied my aunt proudly, "'is not a common man.' "'That I am convinced of,' said Mr. Micawber. "'My dear sir,' for Mr. Dick was shaking hands with him again, I am deeply sensible of your cordiality. "'How do you find yourself?' said Mr. Dick, with an anxious look. "'Indifferent, my dear sir,' returned Mr. Micawber, sighing. "'You must keep up your spirits,' said Mr. Dick, "'and make yourself as comfortable as possible.' Mr. Micawber was quite overcome by these friendly words, and by finding Mr. Dick's hand again within his own. "'It has been my lot,' he observed, "'to meet, in the diversified panorama of human existence, "'with an occasional oasis, "'but never with one so green, so gushing, as the present. "'At another time I should have been amused by this, "'but I felt that we were all constrained and uneasy, "'and I watched Mr. Micawber so anxiously "'in his vacillations between an evident disposition to reveal something "'and a counter-disposition to reveal nothing, "'that I was in a perfect fever.' Traddles, sitting on the edge of his chair, with his eyes wide open, and his hair more emphatically erect than ever, stared by turns at the ground and at Mr. Micawber, without so much as attempting to put in a word. My aunt, though I saw that her shrewdest observation was concentrated on her new guest, had more useful possession of her wits than either of us, for she held him in conversation, and made it necessary for him to talk, whether he liked it or not. "'You are a very old friend of my nephew's, Mr. Micawber,' said my aunt. "'I wish I had had the pleasure of seeing you before.' "'Madam,' returned Mr. Micawber, "'I wish I had had the honour of knowing you at an earlier period. "'I was not always the wreck you at present behold.' "'I hope Mrs. Micawber and your family are well, sir,' said my aunt. "'Mr. Micawber inclined his head. "'They are as well, ma'am,' he desperately observed after a pause, "'as aliens and outcasts can ever hope to be.' "'Lord bless you, sir,' exclaimed my aunt, in her abrupt way. "'What are you talking about?' The subsistence of my family, ma'am, returned Mr. Micawber, trembles in the balance. My employer, here Mr. Micawber provokingly left off, 
and began to peel the lemons that had been under my direction set before him, together with all the other appliances he used in making punch. "'Your employer, you know,' said Mr. Dick, jogging his arm as a gentle reminder. "'My good sir,' returned Mr. Micawber, "'you recall me. I am obliged to you.' They shook hands again. "'My employer, ma'am, Mr. Heap, once did me the favour to observe to me, that if I were not in the receipt of the stipendary emoluments appertaining to my engagement with him, I should probably be a mountebank about the country, swallowing a sword-blade, and eating the devouring element. For anything that I can perceive to the contrary, it is still probable that my children may be reduced to seek a livelihood by personal contortion, while Mrs. Micawber abets their unnatural feats by playing the barrel-organ. Mr. Micawber, with a random but expressive flourish of his knife, signified that these performances might be expected to take place after he was no more, then resumed his peeling with a desperate air. My aunt leaned her elbow on the little round table that she usually kept beside her, and eyed him attentively. Notwithstanding the aversion with which I regarded the idea of entrapping him into any disclosure he was not prepared to make voluntarily, I should have taken him up at this point, but for the strange proceedings in which I saw him engaged, whereof his putting the lemon peel into the kettle, the sugar into the snuffer tray, the spirit into the empty jug, and confidently attempting to pour boiling water out of a candlestick, were among the most remarkable. I saw that a crisis was at hand, and it came. He clattered all his means and implements together, rose from his chair, pulled out his pocket-handkerchief, and burst into tears. "'My dear Copperfield,' said Mr. Micawber, behind his handkerchief, "'this is an occupation of all others, requiring an untroubled mind and self-respect. "'I cannot perform it. It is out of the question.' "'Mr. Micawber,' said I, "'what is the matter? Pray speak out. You are among friends.' "'Among friends, sir,' repeated Mr. Micawber, and all he had reserved came breaking out of him. "'Good heavens! It is principally because I am among friends that my state of mind is what it is.' "'What is the matter, gentlemen? What is not the matter? Villainy is the matter. Baseness is the matter. Deception, fraud, conspiracy are the matter. And the name of the whole atrocious mass is Heap!' My aunt clapped her hands, and we all started up as if we were possessed. "'The struggle is over,' said Mr. Micawber, violently gesticulating with his pocket-handkerchief, and fairly striking out from time to time with both arms, as if he were swimming under superhuman difficulties. I will lead this life no longer. I am a wretched being, cut off from everything that makes life tolerable. I have been under a taboo in that infernal scoundrel service. Give me back my wife, give me back my family. Substitute Micawber for the petty wretch who walks about in the boots at present on my feet, and call upon me to swallow a sword to-morrow, and I'll do it, with an appetite. I never saw a man so hot in my life. I tried to calm him, that we might come to something rational, but it got hotter and hotter, and wouldn't hear a word. "'I'll put my hand in no man's hand,' said Mr. Micawber, gasping, puffing and sobbing, to that degree that he was like a man fighting with cold water, until I have blown to fragments the a detestable serpent heap. I'll partake of no one's hospitality until I have uh, moved Mount Vesuvius to eruption on uh, the abandoned rascal heap. Refreshment uh, underneath this roof particularly punch, would uh, choke me, unless I had previously choked the eyes out of the head of uh, an interminable cheat and liar, heap. I, uh, I'll know nobody, and uh, say nothing, and I'll live nowhere, until I have crushed uh, to undiscoverable atoms, the transcendent and immortal hypocrite and perjurer, heap. I really had some fear of Mr. Micawber's dying on the spot. The manner in which he struggled through these inarticulate sentences, and whenever he found himself getting near the name of Heap, fought his way on to it, dashed at it in a fainting state, and brought it out with a vehemence little less than marvellous, was frightful. But now, when he sank into a chair, steaming, and looked at us with every possible colour in his face that had no business there, and an endless procession of lumps following one another in hot haste up his throat, whence they seemed to shoot into his forehead, he had the appearance of being in the last extremity. I would have gone to his assistance, but he waved me off, and wouldn't hear a word. No, Copperfield, no communication, uh, until Miss Wickfield, a redress from wrongs inflicted by consummate scoundrel, heap! I am quite convinced he could not have uttered three words, but for the amazing energy with which this word inspired him when he felt it coming. Inviolable secret! Uh, from the whole world, uh, no exceptions! This day week, uh, breakfast time, uh, everybody present, including aunt, uh, 
an extremely friendly gentleman, to be at the hotel at Canterbury, a uh, where Mrs. Micawber and myself, on Lang Syne in chorus, and a uh, uh, will expose intolerable ruffian heap. No more to say, uh, or listen to persuasion. Go immediately, not capable of bare society, upon the track of devoted and doomed traitor. Heap! With this last repetition of the magic word that had kept him going at all, and in which he surpassed all his previous efforts, Mr. Micawber rushed out of the house, leaving us in a state of excitement, hope, and wonder, that reduced us to a condition little better than his own. But even then his passion for writing letters was too strong to be resisted, for while we were yet in the height of our excitement, hope, and wonder, the following pastoral note was brought to me from a neighboring tavern, at which he had called to write it. Most secret and confidential. My dear sir, I beg to be allowed to convey, through you, my apologies to your excellent aunt for my late excitement. An explosion of a smoldering volcano long suppressed was the result of an internal contest more easily conceived than described. I trust I rendered tolerably intelligible my appointment for the morning of this day week at the house of public entertainment at Canterbury, where Mrs. Micawber and myself had once the honor of uniting our voices to yours in the well-known strain of the immortal exesman nurtured beyond the tweed. The duty done, an act of reparation performed, which can alone enable me to contemplate my fellow mortal, I shall be known no more. I shall simply require to be deposited in that place of universal resort where, each in his narrow cell forever laid, the rude forefathers of the hamlet sleep, with the plain inscription, Wilkins Micawber. End of chapter 49 Recording by Vivian Bush, Houston, Texas, on October 18, 2007
I asked her, Master Davy, he replied, but it is but few words as she ever says, and she only got my promise and so went away. Did she say when you might expect to see her again? I demanded. No, Master Davy, he returned, drawing his hand thoughtfully down his face. I asked that too, but it was more, she said, than she could tell. As I had long forborne to encourage him with hopes that hung on threads, I made no comment on this information than that I supposed he would see her soon. Such speculations as it engendered within me I kept to myself, and those were faint enough. I was walking alone in the garden one evening about a fortnight afterwards. I remember that evening well. It was the second week of Mr. Micawber's week of suspense. There had been rain all day, and there was a damp feeling in the air. The leaves were thick upon the trees and heavy with wet, but the rain had ceased, though the sky was still dark, and the hopeful birds were singing cheerfully. As I walked to and fro in the garden, and the twilight began to close around me, their little voices were hushed, and that peculiar silence which belongs to such an evening in the country, when the lightest trees are quite still, save for the occasional droppings from their boughs, prevailed. There was a little green perspective of trellis work and ivy at the side of our cottage, through which I could see, from the garden where I was walking, into the road before the house. I happened to turn my eyes toward this place, as I was thinking of many things, and I saw a figure beyond, dressed in a plain cloak. It was bending eagerly toward me, and beckoning. "'Martha,' I said, going to it, "'can you come with me?' she inquired in an agitated whisper. "'I have been to him, and he is not at home. I wrote down where he was to come, and left it on his table with my own hand. They said he would not be out long.' I have tidings for him. Can you come directly? My answer was to pass out at the gate immediately. She made a hasty gesture with her hand, as if to entreat my patience and my silence, and turned toward London, whence, as her dress betokened, she had come expeditiously on foot. I asked her if that were not our destination. On her motioning yes, with the same hasty gesture as before, I stopped an empty coach that was coming by, and we got into it. When I asked her where the coachman was to drive, she answered, Anywhere near Golden Square and quick, then shrunk into a corner, with one trembling hand before her face, and the other making the former gesture as if she could not bear a voice. Now much disturbed and dazzled with conflicting gleams of hope and dread, I looked at her for some explanation. But seeing how strongly she desired to remain quiet, and feeling that it was my own natural inclination too at such a time, I did not attempt to break the silence. We proceeded without a word being spoken. Sometimes she glanced out of the window as though she thought we were going slowly, though indeed we were going fast, but otherwise remained exactly as at first. We alighted at one of the entrances to the square she had mentioned, where I directed the coach to wait, not knowing but that we might have some occasion for it. She laid her hand on my arm and hurried me on to one of the somber streets, of which there are several in that part, where the houses were once fair dwellings in the occupation of single families, but have and had long degenerated into poor lodgings let off in rooms. Entering at the open door of one of these, and releasing my arm, she beckoned to me to follow her up the common staircase, which was like a tributary channel to the street. The house swarmed with inmates. As we went up, doors of rooms were opened, and people's heads put out, and we passed other people on the stairs who were coming down. In glancing up from the outside before we entered, I had seen women and children lolling at windows over flower-pots, and we seemed to have attracted their curiosity, for these were principally the observers who looked out of their doors. It was a broad panelled staircase with massive balustrades of some dark wood, cornices above the doors ornamented with carved fruit and flowers, and broad seats in the windows. But all these tokens of past grandeur were miserably decayed and dirty. Rot, damp, and age had weakened the flooring, which in many places was unsound and even unsafe. Some attempts had been made, I noticed, to infuse new blood into this dwindling frame, by repairing the costly old woodwork here and there, with common deal, but it was like the marriage of a reduced old noble to a plebeian pauper, and each party to the ill-assorted union shrunk away from the other. Several of the back windows on the staircase had been darkened or wholly blocked up. In those that remained there was scarcely any glass, and, through the crumbling frames by which the bad air seemed always to come in and never to go out, I saw through other glassless windows into other houses in a similar condition, and looked giddily down into a wretched yard, which was the common dust-heap of the mansion. We proceeded to the top story of the house. Two or three times, by the way, I thought I observed in the indistinct light the skirts of a female figure going up before us. 
As we turned to ascend the last flight of stairs between us and the roof, we caught a full view of this figure pausing for a moment at a door. Then it turned the handle and went in. "'What's this?' said Martha in a whisper. "'She's gone into my room. I don't know her.' I knew her. I had recognized her with amazement, for Miss Dartle. I said something to the effect that it was a lady whom I had seen before, in a few words to my conductress, and had scarcely done so when we heard her voice in the room, though not, from where we stood, what she was saying. Martha, with an astonished look, repeated her former action, and softly led me up the stairs, and then, by a little back door, which seemed to have no lock, and which she pushed open with a touch, into a small empty garret with a low sloping roof, little better than a cupboard. Between this and the room she had called hers, there was a small door of communication standing partly open. Here we stopped, breathless with our ascent, and she placed her hand lightly on my lips. I could only see, of the room beyond, that it was pretty large, and that there was a bed in it, and that there were some common pictures of ships upon the walls. I could not see Miss Dartle, or the person whom we had heard her address. Certainly my companion could not, for my position was the best. A dead silence prevailed for some moments. Martha kept one hand on my lips, and raised the other in a listening attitude. "'It matters little to me her not being at home,' said Rosa Dartle haughtily. "'I know nothing of her. It is you I come to see.' "'Me?' replied a soft voice. At the sound of it a thrill went through my frame, for it was Emily's. "'Yes,' returned Miss Dartle. "'I have come to look at you. What? You are not ashamed of the face that has done so much?' The resolute and unrelenting hatred of her tone, its cold stern sharpness, and its mastered rage, presented her before me as if I had seen her standing in the light. I saw the flashing black eyes and the passion-wasted figure, and I saw the scar with its white track cutting through her lips, quivering and throbbing as she spoke. "'I have come to see,' she said, "'James Steerforth's fancy, the girl who ran away with him, and is the town talk of the commonest people of her native place, the bold, flaunting, practised companion of persons like James Steerforth. I want to know what such a thing is like. There was a rustle as if the unhappy girl on whom she heaped these taunts ran towards the door, and the speaker swiftly interposed herself before it. It was succeeded by a moment's pause. When Miss Dartle spoke again, it was through her set teeth and with a stamp upon the ground. "'Stay there,' she said, "'or I'll proclaim you to the house and the whole street. "'If you try to evade me, I'll stop you if it's by the hair "'and raise the very stones against you.' "'A frightened murmur was the only reply that reached my ears. "'A silence succeeded. "'I did not know what to do. "'Much as I desired to put an end to the interview, "'I felt that I had no right to present myself, "'that it was for Mr. Peggotty alone to see her and recover her. "'Would he never come?' I thought impatiently. "'So,' said Rosa Dartle, with a contemptuous laugh, "'I see her at last. "'Why, he was a poor creature to be taken by that delicate mock modesty "'and that hanging head.' "'Oh, for heaven's sake, spare me!' exclaimed Emily. "'Whoever you are, you know my pitiable story, "'and for heaven's sake, spare me, if you would be spared yourself.' "'If I would be spared,' returned the other fiercely, "'what is there in common between us, do you think?' "'Nothing but our sex.' said Emily, with a burst of tears. "'And that,' said Rosa Dartle, "'is so strong a claim preferred by one so infamous "'that if I had any feelings in my breast "'but scorn and abhorrence of you, it would freeze up. "'Our sex! You are an honor to our sex!' "'I have deserved this,' said Emily, "'but it's dreadful. "'Dear, dear lady, think what I have suffered "'and how I am fallen. "'Oh, Martha, come back. "'Oh, home, home!' Miss Dartle placed herself in a chair within view of the door, and looked downward as if Emily were crouching on the floor before her. Being now between me and the light, I could see her curled lip and her cruel eyes intently fixed on one place with a greedy triumph. "'Listen to what I say,' she said, "'and reserve your false arts for your dupes. Do you hope to move me by your tears? No more than you could charm me by your smiles, you purchased slave.' "'Oh, have some mercy on me!' cried Emily. "'Show me some compassion, or I shall die mad.' "'It would be no great penance,' said Rosa Dartle, "'for your crimes. "'Do you know what you have done? "'Do you ever think of the home you have laid waste?' "'Oh, is there ever night and day when I don't think of it?' cried Emily. "'And now I could just see her on her knees, "'with her head thrown back, 
her pale face looking upward, her hands wildly clasped and held out, and her hair streaming about her. "'Has there ever been a single moment, waking or sleeping, when it hasn't been before me, just as it used to be in the lost days, when I turned my back upon it for ever and ever? Oh, home, home! Oh, dear, dear uncle, if you ever could have known the agony your love would cause me when I fell away from good, you would never have shown it to me so constant, much as you felt it. But you would have been angry with me, at least once in my life, that I might have had some comfort. I have none, none, no comfort upon earth, for all of them were always fond of me. She dropped on her face before the imperious figure in the chair, with an imploring effort to clasp the skirt of her dress. Rosa Dartle sat looking down upon her, as inflexible as a figure of brass. Her lips were tightly compressed, as if she knew that she must keep a strong constraint upon herself. I write what I sincerely believe, or she would be tempted to strike the beautiful form with her foot. I saw her distinctly, and the whole power of her face and character seemed forced into that expression. Would he never come? The miserable vanity of these earthworms, she said, when she had so far controlled the angry heavings of her breast that she could trust herself to speak. Your home! Do you imagine that I bestow a thought upon it, or suppose you could do any harm to that low place, which money would not pay for, and handsomely? Your home! You were a part of the trade of your home, and you were bought and sold like any other vendable thing that people dealt in. "'Oh, not that!' cried Emily. "'Say anything of me, but don't visit my disgrace and shame more than I have done on folks who are as honourable as you. Have some respect for them, as you are a lady if you have no mercy for me.' "'I speak,' she said, not deigning to take any heed of this appeal, and drawing away her dress from the contamination of Emily's touch. "'I speak of his home, where I live. Here,' she said, stretching out her hand, with her contemptuous laugh, and looking down upon the prostrate girl, is a worthy cause of division between lady mother and gentleman's son, of grief in a house where she wouldn't have been admitted as a kitchen girl, of anger and repining and reproach. This piece of pollution, picked up from the waterside, to be made much of for an hour, and then tossed back to her original place. "'No, no,' cried Emily, clasping her hands together, "'when he first came into my way, that the day had never dawned upon me, "'and he had met me being carried to my grave. "'I had been brought up as virtuous as you or any other lady, "'and was going to be the wife of as good a man as you or any lady in the world can ever marry. "'If you live in his home and know him, "'you know, perhaps, what his power with a weak being girl might be. "'I don't defend myself, but I know well, and he knows well, or he will know well when he comes to die, and his mind is troubled with it, that he used all his power to deceive me, and that I believed him, trusted him, and loved him. Rosa Dartle sprang up from her seat, recoiled, and in recoiling struck at her with a face of such malignity, so darkened and disfigured by passion, that I had almost thrown myself between them. The blow, which had no aim, fell upon the air. As she now stood panting, looking at her with the utmost detestation that she was capable of expressing, and trembling from head to foot with rage and scorn, I thought I had never seen such a sight, and never could see such another. "'You love him? You?' she cried with a clenched hand, quivering, as if she only wanted a weapon to stab the object of her wrath. Emily had shrunk out of my view. There was no reply. "'And tell that to me,' she added, "'with your shameful lips?' Why don't they whip these creatures? If I could order it to be done, I would have this girl whipped to death. And so she would. I have no doubt. I would not have trusted her with the rack itself while that furious look lasted. She slowly, very slowly, broke into a laugh and pointed at Emily with her hand, as if it were a sight of shame for gods and men. She, love, she said, that carrion? and he ever cared for her, she'd tell me. Ha, ha! The liars that these traitors are! Her mockery was worse than her undisguised rage. Of the two, I would have much preferred to be the object of the latter. But when she suffered it to break loose, it was only for a moment. She had chained it up again, and however it might tear within her, she subdued it to herself. I came here, you pure fountain of love, she said, to see, as I began by telling you, what such a thing as you was like. 
I was curious. I am satisfied. Also to tell you that you had best seek that home of yours with all speed and hide your head among those excellent people who are expecting you and whom your money will console. When it's all gone, you can believe and trust and love again, you know. I thought you a broken toy that had lasted its time, a worthless spangle that was tarnished and thrown away. But finding you true gold, a very lady, and an ill-used innocent, with a fresh heart full of love and trustfulness, which you look like, and is quite consistent with your story, I have something more to say. Attend to it, for what I say I'll do. Do you hear me, you fairy spirit? What I say, I mean to do. Her rage got the better of her again for a moment, but it passed over her face like a spasm and left her smiling. Hide yourself, she pursued, if not at home, somewhere. Let it be somewhere beyond reach, in some obscure life, or better still, in some obscure death. I wonder, if your loving heart will not break, you have found no way of helping it to be still. I have heard of such means sometimes. I believe they may be easily found. A low crying on the part of Emily interrupted her here. She stopped and listened to it as if it were music. I am of a strange nature, perhaps, Mosa Dartle went on, but I can't breathe freely in the air you breathe. I find it sickly. Therefore, I will have it cleared. I will have it purified of you. If you live here tomorrow, I'll have your story and your character proclaimed on the common stair. There are decent women in the house, I am told, and it is a pity such a light as you should be among them, and concealed. If, leaving here, you seek any refuge in this town in any character but your true one, which you are welcome to bear without molestation from me, the same service shall be done you, if I hear of your retreat. Being assisted by a gentleman who not long ago aspired to the favor of your hand, I am sanguine as to that. Would he never, never come? How long was I to bear this? How long could I bear it? Oh, me, oh, me, exclaimed the wretched Emily, in a tone that might have touched the hardest heart I should have thought. But there was no relenting in Rosa Dartle's smile. What, what shall I do? Do, returned the other. Live happy in your own reflections. Consecrate your existence to the recollection of James Steerforth's tenderness. He would have made you his serving man's wife, would he not? Or to feeling grateful to the upright and deserving creature who would have taken you as his gift. Or if these proud remembrances, and the consciousness of your own virtues, and the honorable position to which they have raised you, in the eyes of everything that wears the human shape, will not sustain you, marry that good man, and be happy in his condescension. If this will not do either, die. There are doorways and dust heaps for such deaths and such despair. Find one, and take your flight to heaven. I heard a distant foot upon the stairs. I knew it. I was certain. It was his, thank God. She moved slowly from before the door when she said this, and passed out of my sight. But mark, she added slowly and sternly, opening the other door to go away, I am resolved, for reasons that I have and hatreds that I entertain, to cast you out, unless you withdraw from my reach altogether, or drop your pretty mask. This is what I had to say, and what I say I mean to do. The foot upon the stairs came nearer, nearer, and passed her as she went down, rushed into the room. "'Uncle!' a fearful cry followed the word. I paused a moment, and looked in, saw him supporting her insensible figure in his arms. He gazed for a few seconds in the face, then stooped to kiss it, oh, how tenderly, and drew a handkerchief before it. "'Master Davy,' he said, in a low, tremulous voice, when it was covered, "'I thank my Heavenly Father, as my dreams come true.' I thank him heartily for having guided me in his own ways to my darling. With those words he took her up in his arms, and with the veiled face lying on his bosom, and addressed toward his own, carried her motionless and unconscious down the stairs. End of chapter 50 Recorded by Philip David in Canyon Country, California, Fall 2007